Bullets ricochet off the wall. Explosions fill the streets. A soldier is pinned down by the enemy. This could be the end for him. Luckily, he has his Kumlauf attachment allowing him to fire around any corner, but the weapon jams. Next, he pulls out his heat ray to fry the enemy, but with a little sunscreen, it's rendered ineffective. It's time to get the hell out of Dodge. The soldier hops in his rota buggy, hits the accelerator, and switches on the propeller system to fly off into the sunset. But like all those other weird weapons in his arsenal, this one fails as well. It's fair to say he's having a bad day. These weapons sound like something out of a bad spy movie, but each one was constructed and tested for combat. However, due to design flaws, none of them are still in use. Let's find out which weird weapon was the worst of the worst. Since humans could walk, there's been conflict. In the early days of war, elephants were the tanks of the army. These massive creatures posed a huge problem for generals that needed to be overcome, so in the 2nd century BC, the Romans came up with what they thought was an ingenious plan to stop enemy elephants in their tracks. In order to do this, they did something really awful to a bunch of pigs. The Romans knew that the elephants didn't like hawks. For whatever reason, the fast-moving, squealing animals frightened the large elephants, causing them to rear up and throw their handlers off their backs. But the Romans wanted to take things up a notch. They would cover their pigs in tar and light them on fire. The pigs would then become a primitive form of an anti-tank missile. However, these biological flaming missiles ended up being a terrible idea. The pig couldn't be aimed, and it didn't last very long before it died. This meant that when the pigs were released, they ended up running away from the battle and dying in a smoldering heap without so much as passing by the enemy. There were even cases where the flaming pigs backfired by running through the ranks of the Roman soldiers and setting them on fire instead of the enemy. All in all, the flaming pig missiles were an epic fail. The next weapon didn't go up in smoke like the pigs, but froze to death instead. Project Habakkuk seemed like such a terrible idea, it's amazing how far it actually got. The Habakkuk was conceived of by a British engineer named Geoffrey Pike during World War II. His idea was to build an entire aircraft carrier out of pikecrete, a mixture of ice and wood pulp. That's right, Mr. Pike wanted to construct a naval ship out of ice. It isn't hard to guess what problems led to the failure of that vessel. The Habakkuk was supposed to be a way to launch aircraft from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to combat German U-boats. One of the reasons aircraft carriers were rare during the war was because they required a massive amount of resources. Steel and other metals were necessary to build tanks, guns, and aircraft, so using them to build giant ships was not always cost-effective. Pike proposed making whole ships out of ice to combat the supply chain problem. The pikecrete mixture was around 86% water and 14% wood pulp, both of which were plentiful at the time. However, constructing an entire aircraft carrier out of mostly ice had its problems. A 1,000-ton model was constructed in Canada to show that the ice ship was a viable option, but they ran into some issues. The most prominent was that the entire hull began to melt. The pike crete needed to be kept around 0 degrees Fahrenheit, which was much more easily said than done. The air temperature rarely was that low, and the water temperature was never that cold. This meant the engineers needed to develop a way to install air conditioning systems across the ship. Clearly, this wouldn't be cost-effective and also led to hundreds of other problems, it became clear that an aircraft carrier made out of ice would not be the future of the Royal Navy. The entire project was deemed a failure and the British continued to build steel ships the old-fashioned way. But the Habakkuk was not the only embarrassing failed ship in military history. Russia also created a strange-looking vessel that was a complete disaster. The Novgorod was a circular ship that looked like a giant floating dinner plate. The Russians thought it was a brilliant design, but they would soon come to find it was a big round mistake. The hull was just over 100 feet in diameter and was mounted with large guns that could be used to defend the ship or fire onto land. A few years after its completion, the Novgorod was put to test during the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 and 1878. The Novgorod was sent down the Danube River to aid in battle. However, when it unleashed its cannons, something embarrassing happened. The turrets on the vessel were placed on turntables so they could be adjusted to aim at different targets. However, due to loose locks, when the cannon fired, they spun around on their turntables and the crew would need to wait for them to stop spinning before reorienting them and firing again. This would later be fixed by reinforcing the locking mechanism, but it was enough to create a persistent myth about how the entire ship would rotate whenever fired. Its circular shape also made the Novgorod bulky and extremely hard to maneuver. This meant it needed to move slowly, and by the time it was positioned correctly, the battle would already be over. The Russians got so fed up with the failings of the Novgorod that they decided to tie it up at the dock and just leave it. 
the circular ship seemed to be more amusing to watch than helpful during a fight. After the war, the Novgorod was retired. One of the biggest fears for a soldier is being out in the open during combat. This next failed military device literally put the soldier in the worst position of all. The VZ-1 Pawnee was a flying platform that would carry a soldier up into the sky using a helicopter-like propeller system. The idea seems pretty cool, as the soldier would be able to hover in mid-air. But when you think about it, all the flying platform did was make that soldier an easy target. The device was developed in the 1950s by Hiller Helicopters. It had two rotors contained within the platform that allowed it to fly and hover where a soldier stood on top of the contraption. There were no wings, and the rotor was fixed, meaning the only way for the soldier to move the VZ-1 Pawnee was by shifting his body weight from side to side. This could put him in a precarious position as he tried to return fire at the enemy while controlling the platform. It also didn't help that it would only take one or two direct hits from enemy bullets to damage the device and send the soldier plummeting to his death. The VZ-1 Pawnee was cool to look at and must have been fun in testing, but it just didn't make any sense in combat. This led to the whole thing being scrapped before anyone was sent flying into battle on them. The VZ-1 was not the only failed flying contraption of the time, however. In fact, during World War II, the British tried to make a flying car, but the whole thing ended in disaster. There were no bad ideas when it came to machines that could defeat the Nazis. However, the designers of the Hafner Rota Buggy might have taken the sentiment a little too far. The Hafner Rota Buggy was supposed to be a flying jeep, which allowed soldiers to cross over rivers, minefields, and enemy positions with the flick of a switch. The jeep was equipped with a rotor and tail fins, giving it some maneuverability but not much. The whole thing weighed a ton, meaning the fuel tank would drain almost instantly, resulting in the craft crashing to the ground. Also, a jeep is not the most aerodynamic vehicle, which made controlling it in flight rather tricky. The whole project was eventually scrapped and the British decided to use a plane towed glider to deliver land vehicles instead. Ready for a dad joke about weird failed weapons? The active denial system was such a horrible idea that the military is in denial that they ever tried it. The active denial system was basically a heat gun used to give enemy soldiers and unruly crowds intense burns. The weapon was built to look similar to a satellite dish and would focus radiation towards someone as a deterrent. This would make them incredibly uncomfortable and could cause entire crowds to disperse. The thought was that the high frequency waves hitting the person would make them feel like they're in a microwave causing burns, nausea, and extreme discomfort. The active denial system was built in 2010 and had a price tag of around $40 million. It lasted about a month in the field and was quickly recalled. The reason why made the R&D team shake their heads in shame. Instead of causing massive discomfort to whoever it was aimed at, the heat gun just gave them a slight sunburn. This might have been beneficial for breaking up crowds of people, but the heat gun would have had very little effect if you shot it at enemy in battle. In fact, anyone wearing sunscreen would have barely noticed the heat gun at all, as it would have protected them from the high-frequency waves. Just as a reminder, the active denial system was a weapon designed by the US military, meaning this failed weapon was your tax dollars at work. But this was nothing compared to the next failed weapon. It could literally blow off the user's head. Albert Bacon Pratt received patent number 1183492 for a miniature cannon that was mounted onto a helmet. It seemed like a great idea to Pratt, and he even managed to get others on board. But in hindsight, the idea of mounting a gun to someone's head is full of problems. The firing mechanism was ingenious and weird at the same time. In order for the wearer to fire the weapon, all they needed to do was blow into a tube. The reason Pratt was so gung-ho about the idea was it allowed the wearer to subconsciously aim at their target just by looking at them. All the soldier needed to do was turn his head and blow. The real strange thing was that Pratt saw multiple applications for his helmet gun. He claimed it could be used in the kitchen. The whole contraption doubled as a cooking pot, with the barrel of the gun being used as a handle. Regardless of how many uses Pratt's helmet gun had, there were too many drawbacks to make the gun a feasible option. Pratt claimed the strong spring that loaded the next round into the barrel counteracted the recoil of the bullet being fired. However, this might have been over-exaggerated, as some claimed the recoil was strong enough to snap the head of its wearer. Also, there was that problem of jamming. The only way to fix the problem was by taking the entire helmet off your head and then taking it apart and heaven forbid the round exploded in the chamber. This scenario would have quickly ended the user's life. During World War II, the Allies would try anything that they thought might help defeat Hitler, even if it was as crazy as strapping rockets to the wheels of a giant bomb delivery system. As the Allies prepared to launch an offensive off the coast of France to reclaim mainland Europe from the Axis powers, 
The scientists at Britain's Directorate of Miscellaneous Weapon Development came up with a crazy idea. They would break down Hitler's walls and defenses by ramming 4,000 pounds of explosives connected to two 10-foot-tall metal wheels. This weapon would be called the Great Panjandrum. The wildest part about the whole thing is how the wheels would move. In order to get the 4,000 pounds of explosives moving fast enough to ensure it would reach the wall before being intercepted, the British scientists attached rockets to the wheels. These rockets would allow the Great Panjandrum to move at 60 miles an hour. The main problem with this weapon was that if just one of the rockets failed, the Great Panjandrum would start spinning in circles or go wildly off course. As the test runs continued, the engineers believed they could solve the accuracy problem by adding more rockets to compensate for any that failed. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the rockets started ripping themselves off the wheels and shooting across the testing field. This happened multiple times, almost killing the observers of the tests. It was decided the Great Panjandrum would be too much of a liability in the field of battle and was discarded. Throughout the history of warfare, there have been a series of delivery methods for dropping bombs. However, there are a few that you probably never knew existed. In World War II, a surgeon named Lytle Adams came up with the odd idea of attaching bombs to animals. His plan was to fasten little bombs to bats and have them infiltrate enemy bases. The bats would then roost in the buildings and the timed bombs would go off, bringing the structure's roof crumbling down. Bats seemed like the perfect delivery method since they can carry more than their body weight in cargo, they're plentiful, and they can be relatively cheap to breed if more are needed. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was so intrigued by the idea that he gave it the go-ahead, and the bat bombs were tested. The military collected hundreds of Mexican free-tailed bats and recruited Louis Pfizer, the inventor of napalm, to design the detonation packs that would be secured to the creatures. As the war progressed, United States Command realized that the bat bombs would work exceptionally well in Japanese cities where many of the structures were made out of wood, cloth, and paper. This meant that once the bat bomb detonated, it would not just destroy the structure itself, but could cause a fire to sweep through an entire neighborhood. Luckily for the bats, this project was never implemented. During a test in Carlsbad, New Mexico, one of the bat bombs got loose and sought shelter under a fuel tank at the military base. Later that day, the bomb went off, blowing up the bat and everything else in the vicinity of the fuel tanker. After several failed training exercises and the deployment of the atomic bombs in Japan, the bats were retired from military service as they were no longer needed. The Japanese had their own bomb deployment system, and that was as big of a failure as Adams's bat bombs. However, it did lead to the only deaths in the continent U.S. as a result of an enemy weapon. In 1944, the Japanese deployed 9,000 fugos, or fire balloons, over the Pacific Ocean. Attached to each balloon were a 35-pound high explosive and eight firebombs. The Japanese military planned for the balloons to float along the jet stream until they reached the coast of the United States, where they would descend and detonate. The ideal situation for the Japanese would have been the fugo creating massive wildfires, sending the west coast into chaos. The crazy thing is that around 389 balloons made it to the United States, which is a small number compared to the amount launched, but still not insignificant. When the balloons landed, almost all of them failed to detonate or cause any damage. In fact, two of the Fugos actually floated back to Japan and fell on their own island. Sadly, one Fugo did find its way to Oregon, where it fell to the forest floor. Five kids and a pregnant Sunday school teacher came across the Japanese bombs right as they went off. Everyone in the group was killed, making it the only place on the American continent where death resulted from enemy action in World War II. However, killing five kids in a Sunday school teacher and her unborn baby was not the outcome that the Japanese had hoped for with their 9,000 fire balloons. They were quickly retired as failed weapons, and a year later, Japan surrendered, ending World War II. The weird Nazi weapon called the Windkanona literally blew so bad that it was deemed an utter failure. Windkanona translates to wind cannon in English and wasn't one of the Nazis' brightest ideas. The way the cannon was supposed to work was rather simple. The 35-foot-long metal tube would be filled with a mixture of hydrogen and ammonium and ignited. This would build up immense pressure inside of the tube that, when released, would send a shockwave of air up into the sky. The hope for the Nazis was that the shockwave would hit Allied planes overhead and knock them out of the sky. In trials, the Windkanona seemed promising as it could snap wooden planks from 650 feet away. However, when aimed at airplanes moving hundreds of miles per hour in the sky, the wind cannon quickly became less effective. Even though on bombing runs planes dipped as low as 500 feet, the wind cannon shockwave would barely register as more than a slight turbulence to the pilots. The compressed air didn't seem to bother the metal airplanes that were built to withstand different pressures and choppy air when flying. 
Because of this failure, the Nazis decided to repurpose the wind cannon and use it on the ground to push away ground forces, but this too ended in disaster. The weapon was so large it was easily spotted from the air. This made it a perfect target for bombing runs or artillery strikes, which would have devastating consequences. The wind cannona was such a failure that the Allies didn't even know what the contraption was supposed to be used for until they stumbled across one at a Nazi training facility in 1945. It was there that the Allies' intelligence got a close look at the wind cannona and finally realized what the purpose of the failed weapon was. The Germans also developed a weapon with an easily identifiable purpose. The Krumlauf was a machine gun with a slight twist. That twist just happened to be in the barrel. The Krumlauf was a barrel attachment to the Sturmgewehr 44 machine gun. It was supposed to allow a soldier to shoot around corners without exposing himself to enemy fire. The Krumlauf was also designed to be used by soldiers in tanks. They could stick their Krumlauf out the small holes and fire their gun to fend off enemies placing mines in their path or armed with anti tank weapons. This might have seemed like a good idea, but the weapon came with all sorts of problems. It should come as no surprise that the barrel did not last long, as every time the gun was shot it had to take the full force of a bullet and change its trajectory. This put enormous amounts of strain on the Krumlauf and even caused bullets to shatter on their way out of the muzzle. The shattered bullet would send tiny shards of shrapnel in all directions, making the gun inaccurate and dangerous to friendly soldiers standing nearby. The Krumlauf did not see much combat and was melted down to be repurposed into more useful weapons. And speaking of dangerous projectiles, one United States company manufactured a rifle called the Gyrojet that fired many missiles. In 1960, a company called the MBA Associates developed a Gyrojet to help soldiers hit targets from long distances. The plan was to use projectiles equipped with tiny rockets and a gyroscope to help them maintain their trajectory and course. Once fired, the miniature missile's microjets would kick on, allowing it to accelerate and adjust for wind and gravity. It seemed like a great idea that would make snipers' lives much easier, but the weapon ran into all sorts of problems. Since the projectile's rockets only kicked in once it left the gun, the gyrojet was pretty useless at close range unless it was used as a club. The intricacies that allowed the gun to fire without blowing up required a lot of moving parts. That jammed frequently. This meant the gyrojet was incredibly unreliable, which is not what a soldier wants in their weapons. In the 1950s, the US military thought they were onto something special when they developed a plane that took off straight up into the air like a helicopter the tail sitter would be a failure, but would pave the way for other successful aircraft like the Harrier jet in the future. The tail sitter was designed in the 1950s by the Navy to fix the problem of airplanes taking off and landing without much runway to work with. They did the best they could with the technology available to them. The tail sitter was a tiny plane with a complex propeller on the front, which allowed it to take off and land vertically, thus eliminating the need for a runway. However, these planes ran into all sorts of problems. Even the most skilled pilots found landing incredibly difficult, taking off and then then moving the aircraft into a horizontal position wasn't quite as bad, but when it came time to put the tail sitter back down on the landing platform, the plane would often tip over. Other times, the pilot would not be able to slow down fast enough, and the back of the aircraft became damaged as it impacted the ground. The military eventually gave up on the tail sitter, and it was deemed a failure. To be fair, the idea for vertical takeoff never totally disappeared, and although the tail sitter never made it to the front lines, many other aircraft based on the same premise have. One Cold War weapon was not only a bad idea but had a terrible name as well. The United States military came up with a satellite that would shoot enemy missiles out of the sky by launching bowling ball sized pieces of tungsten at them. The unfortunate name given to this weapon was Brilliant Pebbles. It seemed like the Strategic Defense Initiative could have come up with something slightly better or a little more ominous than Brilliant Pebbles for their space based weapon, but that's what they went with. Brilliant Pebbles was supposed to work by launching a series of satellites into space with several projectiles aboard each. These projectiles could then be shot out of the satellite to intercept enemy missiles flying through the atmosphere. It is unclear what made the researchers think this was a good idea, or that it would even work, but they continued to roll with it. In order for Brilliant Pebbles to have any chance of succeeding, there needed to be at least 4,000 of them in orbit. This would cost astronomical amounts of money for weapons that would most likely miss their targets almost every time. After a good long look at the program, the US military scrapped the idea. It's hard to tell if they were more embarrassed by the weapon's failure or its name. A more recent failed weapon was a type of laser, but this was not just any laser. It was planned to be used while flying through the sky like an X-wing. 
The flying laser cannon, also known as the YAL-1 airborne laser, was mounted on the nose of a plane. It made the aircraft look a little like a dolphin, but that wasn't the worst part about this failed weapon. Its primary purpose was to shoot a high-powered beam out of its laser cannon to destroy any missiles or aircraft in the vicinity. The main problem with the laser was that it required a massive amount of energy to work. All of this power needed to be produced by chemical oxygen iodine laser modules, which are incredibly heavy. The power supply weighed down the entire plane, causing its fuel efficiency and top speed to plummet. In the end, the flying laser cannon was more trouble than it was worth, and the military decided to retire the weapon before it could even be used for its intended purpose of blowing things out of the sky. Today we'll talk about a prototype tank never before seen on the battlefield, a mysterious drone of unknown origin that could have done damage to all the wrong people. And we'll discuss a problem the USA needs to get a handle on right now regarding Russian weapons. Before we get into some highly controversial and possibly illegal stuff, let's have a look at something the US called an intelligence bonanza. Number 7. This was a short-range ballistic missile found near Kramatorsk, Ukraine early in 2022. When this unidentified missile was discovered, it did indeed stump the experts, which is why the Collective Awareness to Unexploded Ordnance or CAT UXO people got together. This organization is all about explosive ordnance disposal, and there's a large community, so when photographs like this one we just showed you appeared online, they put their heads together to try to explain what the object is. One of the most obvious things that could be clearly seen were the numbers and letters on the side of the missile, 9B899. Other than that, there were no markings. It was figured out soon enough, though. The 16-inch item was said to be a transponder, a device that picks up radio signals then automatically transmits a different signal. In other words, a decoy. It was said that they were released from the Russian Iskander M short-range ballistic missiles, which were located near the border. The New York Times soon picked up the story and explained, each is packed with electronics and produces radio signals to jam or spoof enemy radars attempting to locate the Iskander M, and contains a heat source to attract incoming missiles. The mobile launchers can fire two Iskanders at once, with each missile capable of hitting a target some 200 miles away. The decoys, which during the Cold War were called penetration aids, produced radio signals, and they also emit heat, which can make interceptions hard. The US called the discovery of these munitions an intelligence bonanza, since they explained some of Russia's ballistic countermeasures. According to one expert, the Russians were obviously being super cautious given that Iskander missiles were already formidable weapons. It was a huge find since NATO air defenses could then be programmed to get past the Iskander's countermeasures. This next one is controversial and will likely be controversial for many years to come, so we did a lot of digging. Number 6. September 2022. A Ukrainian husband and wife in Izum heard a strange popping or booming noise in the sky above their house. They both waited indoors, feeling slightly on edge. The wife really needed to pee, though, and was unable to hold it in, so she went outside to the outdoor toilet. Little did she know she was surrounded by something innocent-looking but very, very dangerous. She later told human rights investigators, I didn't have a flashlight on because it was past curfew when I went to the toilet. Suddenly, there was an explosion and I was without a leg. She shouted to her husband, don't come outside, it's mine. Her leg was literally hanging off. Tough, tough woman. He went outside anyway to find his dear wife struggling on the ground and blood everywhere, her hands trying to keep bits of herself together. A Russian soldier gave him a tourniquet and they drove to the hospital, but the hospital told the husband there were no free beds. She had to be airlifted out of town. Thankfully, she's presently on the mend in Germany. Her husband went back home finding more of those horrible things scattered all around his house. This is a true story, but what are we talking about exactly? We're referencing one of the strangest and most controversial weapons in this war, one with the not-so-nice sounding name of Kid Killer. It's not the technical name, of course, they usually go by the PFM-1 mine. These tiny high-explosive anti-personnel landmines can be thrown from helicopters or launched into the sky, and they fall scattered around on the ground, sometimes called butterfly mines because of the wings on each side, which almost makes them look like children's toys. That's why kids in the past have seen them and then picked them up, which has ended in disaster. They certainly pack a punch for such a small explosive. It should be said, then, it's widely agreed they weren't designed with children in mind. They probably won't kill someone outright, but they might maim you and definitely make a mess of your body. They're also super sensitive, and since they're made out of plastic, can't be found with metal detectors. They hide under leaves, they look like bits of trash, you'll see one and you'll kick it and then you'll have no foot. 
Russia made them famous when the Soviet Union started dropping swarms of them after it invaded Afghanistan in the 1980s. The Soviet Union invented these things, although the US has had similar mines in the Vietnam War when it was dropping millions of mines on Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia that would be taking off limbs for decades to come. This led to laws being put in place around such mines. Countries that use such weapons are majorly frowned upon, so it's strange and disheartening to hear that we've seen them in Ukraine. They became a huge talking point, and as usual each side put the blame on the other. To some extent, the days of these mines are over since 164 countries have signed and ratified the Ottawa Treaty, which is an agreement to outlaw the use of anti-personnel mines such as the butterflies we're talking about today. Ukraine has signed it, Russia and the US have not. This is problematic, no one wants future generations of Ukrainian kids looking like the aforementioned victims in Afghanistan and Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, it's already happening and will likely keep happening, and in the future, there's going to be a hell of a lot of media space about this grim topic. But right now, things are quiet, especially where Ukrainian use of mines is concerned. The question everyone's been asking is, who is using them? In 2022, there were many reports about Russia using butterfly mines in Ukraine, which were then shared on Twitter, sometimes by Ukrainian officials. It was a bad look for Russia. We should explain that Ukraine, having signed the Ottawa Treaty, told the EU in 2012 it would destroy all its butterfly mines. It did destroy hundreds of thousands of them, but failed to meet the destruction quota after the EU handed over 3 million euros for the job. In 2020, Ukraine said it would not destroy any more and was keeping its stockpile of 3,363,828. This is where the story gets murky, because Russia has said Ukraine has been using them, and Ukraine has said Russia has been using them. What is certain is someone has been using them. One of the stories widely shared in the West by Ukrainian officials included the words, in the Kharkiv region, the Russian invaders are using internationally banned butterfly mines. In recent conflicts, children are known to pick them up. Many of these stories used the same photo, but none of the stories actually explained that the photo was six years old. Other stories said Russia had used these butterfly mines in Sumy and Mariupol, which was reported in some Western media. The Daily Mail reported, Putin's forces are laying indiscriminate butterfly landmines that children could confuse for toys in eastern Ukraine. Again, there was no actual evidence in the article, but talk about limbless children caused volcanic outrage. In a 19-page report written prior to these news stories, Human Rights Watch showed ample evidence that Russia had used seven types of anti-personnel mines, but didn't mention the butterfly mines nor did it talk about injuries. Russia was rightly condemned for the ones it did use. Human Rights Watch said Russia had used the POM-3 anti-personnel mine, aka the medallion, not a mine that looks like a toy, but an illegal, terrifying, destructive mine nonetheless. These mines were fired by the ISDM Zimladela-1 mine-laying rocket launcher, which can send mines up to 10 miles away. Again, we cannot stress enough how much of the world is really against such weapons, so their use by Russia in Ukraine was not always expected. The medallions have a sensitive seismic fuse, which means they can go off even when someone is approaching them. They also sometimes explode all by themselves. Human Rights Watch wrote, Russian forces have repeatedly used anti-personnel mines and committed atrocities across the country, but this doesn't justify Ukrainian use of these prohibited weapons. The story now was saying both countries had breached international humanitarian law. It should also be said that Russia used similar mines between 2014 and 2015 in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, and there were no reports of Ukraine using them. But in 2022, video showed how Ukraine had used them in Donetsk. They were all over the place in some of these videos. HRW said in January 2023, Ukraine should investigate its military's apparent use of thousands of rocket-fired anti-personnel landmines in and around the eastern city of Izium when Russian forces occupied the area. It added that Ukrainian forces had been firing butterfly mines or pedal mines in large numbers over Russian military facilities. Pictures were taken this time stating each mine was filled with 37 grams of liquid explosive. NPR later wrote, Many mines reportedly ended up in private vegetable gardens, near sidewalks, and on residential roofs. The cities Ukrainian medical workers worked in reported they had to amputate limbs from almost as many as 50 people, including five children, as a result of mine injuries. A 77-year-old man was killed after stepping on one, and according to Human Rights Watch, four lost their foot or lower leg. It added that a healthcare worker at Izum Central Hospital reported medical staff had amputated 20 to 30 lower limbs as a result of injuries caused by these mines. The number rose to 50, with most cases resulting in traumatic amputation. In one case, a bunch of them were found near a kindergarten. 
In another case, they suddenly landed near a hospital. A worker there said, in the morning there were no petals, then we went out at midday and they were all over. They were dark green. One of the victims of these mines was the well-known promulgator of outright lies and half-truths named Semyon Pegov, a Russian propagandist that calls himself War Gonzo. Various news reports said in October 2022 he was seriously injured after stepping on a butterfly mine and lost a foot in the ordeal, exactly what happened to the Ukrainian woman in the intro. These mines do not discriminate. The next question is, how did Ukraine secretly scatter the earth with these things? This brings us to the next weapon. Number 5. There are many ways to launch butterfly mines, but according to Human Rights Watch, in the case of the Izum mines, what was used were 220mm 9M27K3 Yurigan mine-laying rockets. Many can be fired at once in a matter of seconds and reach a target about 20 miles away. These were fired and then, mid-flight, something called the KPFM-1SSK cassettes were released with an explosive charge. 312 butterfly mines can be dropped from one rocket, which shows you that while efficient, they can hurt the wrong people, since there are just so many of them. Witnesses in Izum said they heard a bang coming from the sky and then the sound of the mines hitting the ground or roofs. One of them said, I heard the sound of the rocket, then a pow. Not a big sound, then the butterfly mines fell. Others said they heard this a lot during the Russian occupation. The Russians tried to clear them and posted flyers around warning the residents of them, but that wasn't good enough. One Ukrainian man explained to the HRW investigator, I heard a slam in the sky. Previously, I knew that if a cluster munition explodes above our heads, the submunition would go over us because of inertia. Because of where they were, I understood they would fall on us, so I told my wife and we went to hide in the basement. His neighbor later came out and tried to remove one of the mines with a shovel, only for him to get injured. He ran back inside, his clothes all ripped. Other people also described hearing loud booms and then later, they went outside and saw little green butterflies lying around. A husband and wife said, then the neighbors were yelling that these mines appeared. The missile exploded over our house, but most fell over the north of here. They were informed by the Russians that they might explode 72 hours after they fell and to wait for someone to come and clear them. One man heard the bang and just decided to run. He later explained what happened next, saying, and then, at that exact moment, I was on the ground on my back, I felt a pain in my back, I looked at my leg, and it looked like an open rose. The mines were everywhere when the Ukrainians liberated the town in September and proceeded to help demine the areas that had been hit. One Ukrainian deminer said he'd stopped keeping count after finding about 3,000 of them. He told investigators it would take decades to clear the area of unexploded ordnance. While the investigators at Human Rights Watch didn't find the evidence of the Russians using butterfly mines, they did find repeated use of similar mines, such as OZM-72 bounding fragmentation mines. They also found booby traps with tripwires connected to F1, RGD-5, and RGN-type grenades. Now for a mystery we'd love for you to solve. Number 4. On March 10, 2022, something very strange happened not in Ukraine but in Croatia although the occurrence was no doubt related to the Ukraine war. We just can't figure out yet why it happened. Maybe you can help. What happened is a Tupolev Tu-141 reconnaissance unmanned aerial vehicle crashed into a park in the capital city of Zagreb. It was a good thing kids weren't playing. These drones weigh about six tons. People in the vicinity heard an unholy blast. This was a very built-up area. Some went out to see what had happened, and sure enough, what they saw was a crater. It was scary, to say the least, and the Croatian public was rightly concerned, this was obviously an act of war, but for what? Less than a month before it happened, the Croatian government had adopted a declaration which stated, Croatia sharply condemns unprovoked Russian aggression on sovereignty, territorial integrity, and independence of Ukraine. Still, opinions were mixed. Another politician said Russia and the US were involved in an imperialist war in Ukraine at the expense of poor Ukrainians. A poll revealed 58% of the public blamed Russia for the war, 26% blamed Russia and the US, and 8% just blamed the US. The war in Ukraine has been a divisive debate in Croatia, just as it has been everywhere, so some people weren't happy about the 16.5 million euros Croatia donated to Ukraine at the beginning of March. We also know now from photographs that some of the weapons that Ukraine has been using are of Croatian origin. Could this have merited a Russian attack? Highly unlikely. So what happened? How did a drone get past Hungary and Romania and land in Croatia? The preceding investigation revealed that the drone hit Romanian airspace at 2323. The Romanian Air Force could observe it for three minutes, and after the Hungarian Air Force observed it, it flew at an altitude of 3,300 feet for around 40 minutes, and when it reached Croatian airspace, it was flying at an altitude of 4,300 feet. 
traveling at approximately 430 miles per hour. Then it crashed into the Jarun neighborhood of Zagreb, not far from a student residence hall home to 4,500 students. The bang woke many of them up and damaged 96 cars. It hit with some serious force, leading to the Seismological Service of Croatia recording seismic waves. It could have caused some serious damage, even though both Russia and Ukraine have used these drones in the past, Russia said it hadn't flown one since 1991. The Ukrainian government also denied it had launched the drone, although reports said Ukraine does currently operate them. It used them in 2014 and it's used them in the current war. Still, there's no reason why Russia couldn't have pulled some out of storage. Reports said the aircraft had a red star on its tail, similar to one found in Crimea not long back, so that points to Russia. Still, opinions were mixed. Neither Ukraine nor Russia could be discounted. That annoyed the living hell out of Croatians. They wanted answers. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said, The indications we have so far on the drone that crashed in Croatia outside of Zagreb is that it was not an armed attack, not an armed drone. It's true that these drones were designed for reconnaissance, but Stoltenberg might have been wrong. These drones can usually travel about 620 miles. Since they're reusable, they complete their mission and then land with parachutes. Parachutes were found in some of the trees near the crash site, but so was something else. The drone was carrying a bomb. Croatian officials were not too pleased. Reports said the bomb might have weighed 120 kilos, and these things flew over two NATO countries without the slightest warning to Croatia. Had this drone landed 50 meters down the street and that bomb exploded, the next few days would have consisted of scooping body parts of political science majors. It was then said the bomb was an OFAB 100-120. Croatia's prime minister was fuming. He told the press, This is a real threat. NATO and the EU were supposed to react. We will not tolerate such a situation. We were very lucky. There were so many questions. Why weren't Ukraine or Russia admitting they'd done this? Why did some media play down the incident, saying it happened in a quiet suburb when it actually happened in a very densely populated area in the middle of the capital city? That one made the mayor pretty angry. But what made him angrier was the fact that NATO had not told them or scrambled aircraft. Croatia had the weapons to bring such a target down, but that was impossible since not Hungary, Romania, nor NATO had informed them. The rest of Europe was not too pleased either, with some people commenting that it looks as though Russia or Ukraine can now launch aircraft over other countries armed with powerful explosives without anyone saying anything. Surely it's not supposed to work like that? Isn't it NATO's job to be on top of that kind of thing? It also had to be said this big lump of aircraft is about as stealthy as an Airbus A380. The big question is, why Croatia? If Ukraine launched it, well, it should have been going in the opposite direction. If Russia launched it, then it was absolutely nowhere near its target. Some people speculated that the drone had been programmed to fly to the Yarun area of Ukraine, which sounds like Yarun, but that seems like grasping at straws. Still, someone joked on Twitter, people in Odessa, Texas, get ready. Now for something that apparently puzzled everyone. Number 3. This one was quite defined, what the media are calling a treasure trove of Russian intelligence. It was a ground-based electronic warfare system called the Krasuka 4. It was found in a forest near Kiev in March 2022, partly damaged but still intact. Such units are used to jam radar reconnaissance satellites and drones. They can track airborne targets and control aircraft, which reports say were very useful for Russia in its war against Syria when the units messed with the control signals to the TB-2 Bayraktar drones and made them crash. A big deal, since those drones could destroy tanks and other armored vehicles. Seems Russia left this thing behind in a hurry, barely able to cover it up with branches. But what secrets did it contain, if any? That wasn't made public. But we do know that Western intelligence agencies were puzzled that Russia would leave something so pivotal to its war effort behind. This next one was even more unexpected. Number 2. This was called a one-of-a-kind find. It was a piece of machinery extolled as a super tank with outstanding power. It was a Russian ace in the hole, which nonetheless seemed to have experienced setbacks because of funding issues. It never got off the ground. We're talking about the Black Eagle T-80 UM-2. This was developed in the late 90s and was similar to the T-80, but importantly, one of the differences was where the ammunition was stored. This factor alone could have saved a lot of lives in Ukraine since reports from the battlefield explained that the design in Russian tanks had led to what was called a jack-in-the-box effect. This flaw has been known in the West for decades and it was taken advantage of in Ukraine. Basically, because the ammunition is kept at the base of the turret, even a minor hit on some other part of the tank can cause the shells to explode and off pops the turret. The three men inside the tank have the very worst day in their lives. Plenty of Russian tanks have been found in this state, 
At the end of April 2022, the British estimated something like 15,000 Russian tank crew had been killed, although it's not certain how many were the victims of the jack-in-the-box effect, but presumably it was a fair few. It's one reason such tanks have been called mobile coffins. Of course, there were advantages to this design, but Russia did develop the Black Eagle T-80UM2 as part to counteract this flaw. The program just never got going, and as far as analysts know, only one, the prototype, was made, and that one got blown up on March 17, 2022. This next one will surprise some of you, but we're sure it won't be news to a lot of people. Number 1. Such is the weird nature of global warfare that you can end up fighting against weapons made by the side that supports you. This has been happening, and in effect, the US, Ukraine's main ally, has in some way been helping Russia, as have other allies. Let's explain. After Ukraine started dismantling Russian weapons, American-made microchips were found all over the place, and we mean everywhere. One report said they were found in a radar-equipped Air Defense Command Post vehicle, as well as a KA-52 Alligator attack helicopter, a Pantsir air defense system, and to top it all off, a KH-101 AS-23A Kodiak cruise missile. But that was just the start. It's perhaps shocking, but highly understandable. The arms industry is not known for its ethics. Reuters said halfway through 2022 that it wasn't just made-in-America tools found in Russian weapons. The report explained that 450 foreign-made components were pulled out of Russian weapons in Ukraine. It said this provided evidence that Moscow acquired critical technology from companies in the United States, Europe, and Asia. In fact, reports stated that when Ukraine looked at cruise missiles and air defense systems and other battlefield items, they ran predominantly on Western components, two-thirds of which were American-made, with the other countries being the UK, Japan, South Korea, Germany, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. Another report said that RUSI, a UK defense and security think tank, discovered at least 450 different kinds of unique foreign-made components across these 27 systems the majority of which were manufactured by U.S. companies with a long-standing reputation for designing and building sophisticated microelectronics for the U.S. military. As we say, this won't come as a surprise to many people, but it might have bugged certain Ukrainians when they pulled apart those KH-101 cruise missiles, weapons that had already caused untold damage. The missiles were packed with 31 foreign components, 28 of which were fired in an attack on one day, March 9, 2023, but they've been used throughout the entire war. Some people later pointed out that the Russians had evidently been quite reliant on foreign powers' business. Others said the discoveries certainly do raise serious questions about Russia's ability to produce weapons by itself and how much it needs countries like the US in this regard. One analyst said it showed a total dependence on Western technology for Russia and a total breakdown of controls that is supposed to stop this from happening. The sad fact is, weapons from this war and the components inside them will be traveling far and wide for years to come. Some reports say Javelin and Stinger missile systems have ended up on the black market. Some have gone to Africa, according to the Nigerian president. CNN reported that Russia had captured some US-made weapons and sent them to Iran. None of this is totally clear, and you have to be careful walking through the minefield of misinformation on both sides. But it's absolutely certain that some of these weapons will end up on the black market in the hands of nasty people. There are reports of Western weapons being sold on the dark web, although some people suggest this might be Russian propaganda. Nonetheless, Interpol's chief in Europe said it's inevitable criminals will get their hands on these Western weapons and flood the international market. He added, we should be alarmed, and we have to expect these weapons to be trafficked not only to neighboring countries, but to other continents. This is one of the consequences of war. In 5 or 10 or 20 years, you won't know whose weapons are being fired at you. For now, it seems Russian claims of Western weapons flooding the black market are exaggerated and a part of a disinformation campaign to worry the West. However, if the past is anything to go by, this is a story we'll be coming back to for years to come. With massive numbers of personnel on both sides, both Russia and Ukraine are using a wide variety of weapons to arm their troops. While we have extensively covered World War II-era weapons in Ukraine in our other videos, there's more than just vintage gear making appearances on the battlefield today. Let's take a look at some of the weird weapons being used in Ukraine. Number 1. The RPG-30 While many people might not think an RPG is that weird, after all, it appears as the weapon of choice among bad guys in every video game and movie, you would be mistaken. The RPG-30, known as the Kairuk or Hook in Russian, is the latest and greatest version of its cousin that came into service decades before. What makes the RPG-30 so unique is its ability to defeat active protection systems on tanks. 
Active Protection Systems, or APS, is the general term used to describe an advanced armor system where a combination of radars, fire control computers, and many rockets are used to shoot down incoming ordnance against a tank. APS is one of the newest developments in armor technology, and countries have been looking for meaningful ways to defeat it for years. In 2008, the Russian government found its solution in the RPG-30, firing just a fraction of a second before the main rocket. The decoy rocket is launched from a side tube below the main 105mm rocket. Once fired, operators can then discard the tube. Because it's fired just a fraction of a second faster, the system's goal is to get the tank to waste a rocket on the decoy, allowing the main rocket to hit the tank. Thinking the threat is destroyed, the tank will not re-engage for another split second. That slight delay is all it takes for the almost 23-pound grenade to slam into the target. Allegedly, the RPG-30 can take out up to 650 millimeters of sloped armor. While this claim has not yet been confirmed, it's confirmed that these have been used on the battlefield. Thankfully for Ukrainian troops, there are systems like the trench coat system, designed by Israel, that can defeat such weapons by launching a bunch more missiles each time the APS detects a threat. However, it's unknown if Ukrainian tanks are equipped with such a system. Number 2. RPOA Schmel Designed at the very end of the Cold War, the Schmel was made to be a manned portable fire support system that could supply drastic firepower in situations where artillery or air support was unavailable or impossible to use. Weighing in at just over 22 pounds, the Schmel was a reusable rocket system that gave the operator several warheads to choose from. The primary warhead was a thermobaric warhead. Thermobaric weapons are very deadly in urban environments and do not kill like normal high explosives. Instead of causing damage from normal high explosives, thermobaric weapons or vacuum bombs do their damage by sucking all the available oxygen in the area. The resulting explosion and pressure change can cause catastrophic damage even to people behind cover, in buildings, bunkers, or trenches. Because of its ability to destroy personnel an operator cannot directly see, it's a sort of wonder weapon for an infantry squad. But thermobaric munitions are not the only type of ammo it can shoot. Besides shooting smoke rounds, the Schmel can also shoot incendiary rounds. These contain 20 pellets inside the warhead, and the pellets can ignite as soon as the warhead leaves the tube. Using a substance called pyrogel, the flames can burn at an impressive 800 to 1000 degrees Celsius for 5 to 7 minutes on their own before hitting a target. The Russians even beefed up the Schmel in 2003 when they released a lighter version with better thermobaric munitions. Number 3. M14 Rifles Surplus World War II weapons aren't the only surplus rifles making a comeback in Ukraine. Some Cold War era stock is making its way into the front line also. The M14 enters service in the US military as its standard battle rifle in 1959. However, its heavy weight, large caliber, and unwieldy full auto fire did not win it many favors among its troops in Vietnam. Because of this, the US military started transitioning the force to the M16 within six years of its entering service, and by the end of the war, these battle rifles were primarily relegated to snipers and designated marksmen. After Vietnam, the US had over a million of these rifles with little use for them. Because of this, they started selling them off whenever they could. When the Baltic countries of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia joined NATO between 1991 and 2004, the US sold these countries tens of thousands of M14 rifles. Like their American counterparts, the Baltic countries relegated these rifles to a sniper role where they saw action in Iraq and Afghanistan. In a deal to send better sniper rifles to those countries, the Baltics donated between 5,000 to 7,000 M14 rifles to Ukraine. From photo and video evidence, Ukrainian troops are also using the rifle in a sniper capacity. Number 4. The TOS-1 The TOS-1 sounds like the Schmel, but on steroids. First developed for use during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, the TOS-1 is a formidable weapon system, firing two dozen 220mm rockets in a matter of seconds. The TOS-1 can make quick work of any fortified structure or armored vehicle, giving the weapon system even more incredible firepower is their thermobaric or incendiary warheads. Because of this, some claim that the TOS-1 is the strongest non-nuclear weapon Russia can employ on the battlefield. Powering this beast is the chassis of a T-72 tank. The Soviets choose to do this because of the rocket's limited range. The first models had just a 3km effective range, and upgrades to the munitions over the years have only pushed this out to 10km. Additionally, there are very few of these in Russian service, though Russia has exported dozens of those to Iraq, Syria, and Azerbaijan, seeing combat in all three places. The Russian military retains very few of these in inventory. At about 16 units before the war started, these saw extensive uses in the battle for Kharkiv and the Donbass. 
Photographic evidence shows at least several were destroyed or captured by Ukraine. Though these have not been seen too much, it appears they are making a comeback, with Russian media reporting the military received new shipments of around a dozen units in September and December 2022. Number 5. The T-14 Armada Tank The T-14 Armada has been a buzz for years among military circles as this supposed super tank. Allegedly, the Armada is the most advanced tank in the world, at least according to the Russians, with new and improved fire control systems that allow it to fire more accurately on the move and a supercharged new engine, the Armada can supposedly outgun any NATO tank. The Russians also claim the tank has the best armor in the world, with armor capsules surrounding the crew, engine, and auto turret, so a penetrating hit will not cause a catastrophic explosion like legacy Soviet tanks are known to suffer. This catastrophic explosion is evidenced by the turret flying off the tank due to the ammunition in the autoloader exploding too. Another supposedly great feature is the active self-protection system on board. Composed of one of the most advanced radars that operate in multiple frequency bands, the tank can, on paper, engage dozens of aerial and ground targets at once. Whether it's a speeding projectile or an incoming missile, the Afghanit protection system as it's known is intended to keep the crew safe. Envisioned to eventually become the primary main battle tank in service, the Armada program has been bogged down for years due to funding issues. With only around 20 known Armadas produced by 2022, the tank operating in Ukraine has been subject to debate for months. Recent video evidence in Ukraine shows that as of the end of 2022, the first four Armadas appeared to be crossing the border into Ukraine and entering combat there. However, the Russian Ministry of Defense still needs to confirm their use in Ukraine. Additionally, all the Russian claims about the Armada remain doubtful, since no one outside of Russia has tested the vehicle, and it's highly likely its combat power is overstated. Number 6. Armored Trains No, this isn't a particular video game developer taking artistic liberties with World War I. This is a real weapon used first by the Soviets and now by the Russian army. Russia is the largest country in the world but has historically had very poor highways. As a result, their military logistics have relied heavily on rail transportation to get around. Starting out in the Russian Civil War as a way of providing mobile firepower, the armored trains used by the Red Army morphed into an armored convoy to protect logistics routes. The Red Army's armored trains were equipped with various anti-aircraft and heavy machine guns. The Russians abandoned the idea of armored trains by the early 2000s and then decommissioned them. However, it appears that Russian fears of their inability to supply Crimea after its annexation made them bring them back into service in 2016. As of today, the Russian army is confirmed to have four of these trains. Two of them, Yenisi and Amur, are confirmed by video evidence and Russian government statements to be in combat in Ukraine. According to Amur's conductor, the primary mission is still protecting supply lines. Armed with two auto cannons taken from BMP infantry fighting vehicles and several dozen machine guns, the trains primarily operate in southern Ukraine. This is notable because southern Ukraine has had the most active partisan movements, and the Russians' use of these trains shows they're very concerned about protecting their rear area supply lines. Number 7. The Remote Anti-Armor Mine System The Remote Anti-Armor Mine System, also known as RAMS, is a state-of-the-art anti-armor system deployed, out of all places, out the back of a 155mm artillery shell. How it works is when the shell is fired, the propulsion charge ignites and fires the shell out of the gun. The timer can be preset to a specified time to set off the second charge. The second charge that goes off is the expulsion charge. This small explosion forces nine separate anti-tank mines to leave the back of the shell. Each mine is armed when centrifugal force rotates the mine several times. Upon landing, the mines are armed and ready for an approaching armored vehicle. Besides being launched from an artillery shell, what makes these mines special is the fact that they are tamper-proof and self-destruct if anyone tries to disarm them. Two of the mines in each shell are fitted with what the US Army calls anti-disturbance mechanisms to discourage enemy troops from clearing the mines. That probably means several mines will be set off with any pressure and not the usual weight of a tank. But if the mines don't find a target within 24 hours, they will self-destruct due to an electrical circuit inside the mines closing. Number 8. Defend Tech's D-40 Drones The US is not the only country supplying Ukraine with kamikaze drones, so is Australia. In Australia, their drones are known as the Defend Tech's D-40 Loitering Munitions. Weighing less than a pound, these munitions can be deployed singularly or as a swarm. Their stopping power is debatable, but they would definitely be effective against dug-in positions, light-armored vehicles, and personnel out in the open. 
These drones can be deployed either by a single soldier throwing it or launching it out of a special 40mm grenade launcher, after which they have a range of around 20 kilometers. In August, the Australian government promised to send 300 drones to Ukraine. Within the past several months, the first units have arrived in Poland, and Ukrainian troops are receiving training on how to use them properly. As of December 2022, we still don't know if these drones have seen any combat use yet. Ever burning fire? Armed icebergs? Laser guns? These may sound like imaginary weapons straight out of the pages of a comic book or a sci-fi novel, but these are all examples of very real and very weird weapons from the past and the present. History is full of examples of surreal weapons that actually existed, not to mention all the examples of weird weapon failures. What are the weirdest historical weapons that we know of? What weird weapons are we using today? What weirdness awaits us in the future? Imagine yourself as an ancient Roman sailor preparing to launch a fierce naval attack on your arch-rivals, the Greeks. As your ship approaches the city walls, you watch closely for any signs of movement. The Greeks are well known for their unique defense strategies, including the much-feared Greek fire, an incendiary compound that the Greeks have been known to throw at invaders in clay pots or even through tubes, creating an ancient flamethrower. The actual ingredients in Greek fire are a well-guarded secret even in modern times. No one knows exactly what this sticky compound was made of. But you do know that this ancient version of napalm can stick to anything and burn for an incredible amount of time, and that not even water can extinguish it. Yes, Greek fire is definitely on your mind as your ship gets closer and closer to the city walls. This time, though, there's something new in store for you. Towering over the wall is a huge catapult-like structure with a complicated series of pulleys. Before you can figure out what it is, a rope thrown from the top of the wall lands on the deck of the ship next to you. The hook on the end digs firmly into the ship's rail, and you hear a loud groan as the monstrous structure comes to life. Before your eyes, the ship next to you is raised up out of the water, men and supplies sliding along the deck and falling overboard. Then, with a crash, the ship falls back into the water, founders and sinks. The claw of Archimedes claims its first victim, and the rest of your fleet scrambles to escape its reach. If ancient sea battles sound terrifying, you're not gonna like this. If you were a warrior in medieval Europe preparing to do battle for your liege lord, you'd have your own problems to deal with. Hand-to-hand -hand combat is brutal, bloody business, and as a foot soldier you only have your sword and shield to protect you in a melee. If you were very lucky, you might have an extra secret weapon in your arsenal. A sword breaker was shaped like a dagger, but its blade was full of deadly teeth that could hook onto your enemy's sword and break the blade clean in half with one quick motion, leaving him defenseless. Not many medieval warriors could afford the luxury of an extra weapon like a sword breaker, so many may do with a homemade pair of leather gloves reinforced with iron rings or even spikes. That's right, we're talking about medieval brass knuckles. You may associate them with gangster movies and rap videos, but these types of fighting gloves have actually been around since ancient times. If you were a gladiator in ancient Rome facing an opponent in the ring, you might have nothing to defend yourself but with a cestus, a series of thin leather thongs wrapped around your hands with small bits of iron or lead attached. Ancient Japanese warriors had their own version of ancient brass knuckles called a teko. As a knight on horseback, you're a bit better off than your foot soldier friends, but you're far from safe. For your higher vantage point, you'd be keeping a close eye out for any enemies carrying a man catcher. This device featured a spiked collar on a long wooden pole and would be used to pull you off your horse by the neck and drag you into the bloodbath below. Warfare changed with the advent of guns. Soon every soldier was equipped with firepower, but there were still plenty of weird weapons to be found. An early 18th century weapon called a puckle gun was unique because there were two different designs, one that was capable of shooting typical round bullets as well as one that could fire square ones. If you were tasked with operating the puckle gun, you would use the square bullet variety against your Muslim enemies, since it was thought that square bullets would hurt more and would therefore convince the infidel Turks of the superiority of Christianity. The more civilized round bullet gun would be saved for use against your fellow Christians. The 20th century witnessed two unprecedented world wars, and these brutal wars spawned countless new and weird weapons. Picture yourself as an artilleryman in the German army during World War I. Your unit is posted deep in the western front near Paris. You've been hearing a lot of rumors about a new cannon that's on its way to the front lines. It's said to be the biggest gun in history, capable of launching shells into the stratosphere. It's called the Paris Gun because it will apparently be able to hit Paris from your position, an astonishing 80 miles away. 
When the Paris gun arrives a few days later, you can see that the rumors are true. It's so big that it's brought in on train on a specially made rail car. Its barrel measures almost 70 feet, and each shell weighs more than 200 pounds. When the orders come down from your superiors, you're excited and nervous to learn that you'll be a part of the crew that will be the first to fire the Paris gun. You're still recovering from the deafening sound of the massive gun firing when you get the confirmation that the shell has landed near your target in Paris. It took a full three minutes for the shell to travel the 80 miles to Paris. It reached heights of 25 miles at its peak trajectory. As impressive as the Paris gun looks, though, you're dismayed to find out that it's wildly inaccurate. It's almost impossible to accurately aim such a big gun, but it certainly has an impact on the morale of your enemies, so it's not a total waste. In the wake of these world wars, with mistrust between countries at its peak, militaries around the world are ramping up their espionage activities. As a covert operator trying to infiltrate an enemy regime, you have weapons that wouldn't seem out of place in a modern James Bond movie. You might be issued a small caliber mini pistol, cleverly designed as a flashlight, a tube of lipstick, or even a ring. As inventive as these hidden guns are, it may be hard to imagine them as anything other than spy movie fodder, but they could be all too effective. In London in 1978, a KGB agent successfully used an umbrella gun that shot poisoned pellets to assassinate a target. As a modern-day soldier, no doubt that you're grateful you don't have to participate in hand-to-hand -hand combat or trench warfare or face any of the weird historical weapons we've covered so far, but modern soldiers have weird modern weapons to deal with. Today's technology advances have led to the creation of some truly weird and futuristic weapons. Put yourself in the shoes of a modern soldier for a moment. You're just as likely to be deployed against your own rioting countrymen than against foreign enemies, and even soldiers stationed overseas will interact with civilians more than armed combatants. That's why modern weapons are designed to be non-lethal. More often than not, you're aiming to incapacitate, not to kill. We are familiar with the taser stun guns favored by police officers and suspicious mothers everywhere. As a modern soldier called in to control a large-scale riot, you might use a taser shockwave to keep that angry mob in check. Essentially a wall of taser stun guns, the shockwave is capable of protecting a 20-degree arc with six tasers. Each shockwave has a 25-foot range, and they can be combined to cover a larger area. If somehow the shockwave isn't effective in dispersing the crowd, you also have the active denial system at your disposal, also known as the pain ray. This futuristic weapon works on the same principles as a microwave oven. It emits a type of electromagnetic radiation that creates a brief but intense burning sensation when it comes into contact with human skin. This weapon is powerful enough to stop the angriest mob, but it's non-lethal and was designed for crowd control, not combat. As a modern soldier, you're getting to live out every sci-fi nerd's fantasy. Laser technology is no longer science fiction but science fact. Laser weapons work by harnessing and focusing light rays to incapacitate enemies and disable electronic systems. The LAWS ship-mounted cannon is powerful enough to scramble electronic systems, blind enemies, and even damage boats, aircraft, and drones. There's even a laser rifle, the phaser stun gun, that lets you dazzle and confuse your enemies, but more testing is needed before the gun is widely used and lasers replace bullets completely. When modern weapons seem like something straight out of a sci-fi movie, it begs the question, what weird weapons will the soldiers of the future be using? Maybe more importantly, what futuristic weapons might the Zeti Reticuli aliens be developing to use against us in their quest to harvest our brains? If the idea of being a soldier in the future scares you, this might ease your mind a bit. It sounds like something straight out of a Harry Potter movie, but scientists are actually working on developing an invisibility cloak. They think they've almost got it figured out. Our vision works by detecting light bouncing off an object and a special coating under development could make it possible to absorb or redirect these light waves, making you invisible to your enemies. Of course, not all brilliant ideas turn out to be a brilliant success. Although plenty of weird weapons exist now and in the past, there are even more examples of weird weapon failures. There is a long and frankly unsettling history of militaries attempting to weaponize animals. During the 1960s, the CIA had the brilliant idea of turning cats into covert listening devices. The idea was that the cats would be able to get close to foreign adversaries without being detected, so scientists implanted radio transmitters, microphones, and batteries inside the cats' bodies to gather top-secret intel. Needless to say, it didn't go well. Not only were there countless issues with the technology and the implantation process, but anyone who has ever had a cat can tell you just how impossible it is to train them to do what you want. During World War II, the Soviet military strapped explosives to dogs who had been starved and trained to search for food underneath tanks. The idea was that the dogs would see the enemy tanks and, expecting a tasty meal, dive under the tanks where the bombs would detonate. 
However, the dogs had not been trained with live tanks and were not used to the chaos and noise of battle. If you were a Soviet soldier, you would have been dismayed to see that the dogs, understandably terrified, ignored the tanks and ran straight back to your lines with their deadly payload. A much more humane version of animal weaponry was the robot dog named Big Dog. Built by Boston Dynamics in 2005, it looked like this was the next big thing in military supply transport. But after initial testing showed that its gas engines and hydraulics were way too loud, Big Dog was put into storage and Boston Dynamics was sold to Google. During World War II, Britain was desperate for a solution to the problem of German U-boats, which were sinking military and even civilian ships at an alarming rate. Enter Project Habakkuk. Eccentric inventor Jeffrey Pike's plan to construct a massive aircraft carrier out of a new material he called Pikecrete. Pikecrete was a mixture of ice reinforced with wood pulp, and this new material was lightweight and very strong allowing for a much larger ship with thicker walls that could withstand U-boat attacks. The war ended before Pike gained any real support for his design, so we'll never know if Pike Crete would have lived up to its claims. As weird as some of these failed weapons sound, humans have clearly been trying out crazy weapons for centuries, and things are only gonna get weirder in the future. There was once a war so lame that even its combatants forgot it was happening. Or what about the embarrassing declaration of war that pitched an army of thousands against an army of eight. And the miniature American Civil War where the only casualties were the homes of a few innocent honeybees. While we typically associate war with violence and bloodshed, in the history of recorded human conflict there have actually been a handful of battles that have been resolved without a single casualty. This is the bizarre and fascinating world of bloodless wars, and we're going to tell you about all the craziest examples, from their earliest days to the most shockingly recent. It began all the way back on March 30th, 1651, or did it? The strangest thing about this first war is that even though we know for a fact it ended, we are not technically sure if it ever actually began. We're of course talking about the 335 year war, which might have been fought between the Netherlands and the Isles of Scilly. But historians are split on whether this alleged multi-century conflict was a bona fide war or a kind of incredibly elaborate running gag with one hell of a lead up to its punchline. We know for a fact that this possibly fake bloodless war was started by a very real and very bloody one that resulted in the king of one of the most powerful nations in the world being deposed and executed. This was the English Civil War, which was fought between the Royalists supporting the rule of King Charles I and the Parliamentarians led by Oliver Cromwell. Over 200,000 soldiers and civilians were killed from 1642 to 1651, and as the war drew to a close, the battered remnants of the Royalist Navy led by John Granville took refuge on the Isles of Scilly, off the coast of the British mainland. By 1651, the United Provinces of the Netherlands still had a bone to pick with the Royalists running the show on the Isles of Scilly. Because the Dutch had aligned with the Parliamentarians during the Civil War, the Royalist Navy had previously done a fair bit of damage to their forces, and Lieutenant Admiral Martin Harpert zoon Tromp, who was Dutch in case the aggressively Dutch-sounding name didn't give it away, wanted some reparations. However, when he traveled to the Isles of Scilly to ask for these reparations, he was rebuffed by the Royalists. This is where things get a little sticky. According to the account of English parliamentarian Sir Bulstrode Whitlock, man, these names are something else, Tromp came to the Pendennis and related that he had been to Scilly to demand reparation for the Dutch ships and goods taken by them, and receiving no satisfactory answer, he had, according to his commission, declared war on them. But there was a complication. Not long after this contested declaration of war, the Royalists officially surrendered to the Parliamentarians, and the English Civil War came to an end. The Dutch Navy left for home, having never signed an official peace treaty with the Isles of Scilly, and it remained this way for 335 years. Over the centuries, it became a kind of tongue-in-cheek local joke on the Isles that they were still at war with the Dutch, even though, technically speaking, Lieutenant Admiral Tromp had never actually had the authority to declare war on behalf of his nation. But even if the war never really started, it did actually end in 1986, when Salonian historian and councilman Roy Duncan realized that a peace treaty still hadn't been signed between Scilly and the Netherlands. He invited the Dutch ambassador Jonkier Rijn Heidekoper to visit the Isles and bring their conflicts to an end. In April that year, Heidekoper took Duncan up on the offer, visiting him as an unofficial peace convoy and declaring a permanent ceasefire between the two nations, which is strange given that the firing never actually started. Heidekoper joked that it must have been horrible for the Scillonians 
to live in fear all this time, knowing the Dutch fleet could have attacked them at any moment over the last 335 years. The Dutch had a strange habit of getting into bloodless wars. Just over a century after the start of the 335-year war in 1784, the Dutch went to war with the Holy Roman Empire in the River Scheldt. This conflict would later become known as the Kettle War, for a beautifully stupid reason you'll find out about very soon. So what context brought these two heavy hitters into a weird little conflict where nobody died? The Spanish Netherlands was backed by the Holy Roman Empire, and the Southern Netherlands, then known as the Republic of the Seven Netherlands, didn't get along great with them. An important point of contention among them was the aforementioned River Schelt, an important trade route that the Dutch provinces had barred the Spanish Netherlands from accessing, leading to a resentment that bubbled over for centuries. In 1648, the Spanish Habsburgs, well-known money and inbreeding enthusiasts, tried to secure the River Schelt as part of the Treaty of Westphalia and failed. Later on, in 1714, after the War of the Spanish Succession, the Austrian branch of the Habsburg family tried to get access to the River Scheldt, but the war had been expensive and after their requests were denied, they didn't have much economic leverage to force the Dutch's hands. So after all this frustration, in 1784, Emperor Joseph II tried to do what none of his forebears had ever done, charge in and take the River Scheldt by force. He sent his flagship Le Louis and two others into the Scheldt as an act of provocation against the Dutch foes. And the response was seemingly underwhelming. A single Dutch ship, De Dolphin. The outcome of the battle seemed obvious. De Dolphin was outmanned and outgunned compared to Le Louis and her support ships. But what happened next shocked everyone involved. De Dolphin fired a single shot at Le Louis, not even injuring or killing anyone on board, and Le Louis immediately surrendered. We're not kidding. Nobody really knows why the surrender was so quick, given that on paper the Holy Roman Empire had a clear advantage here. But in any case, the battle was over before it even began, and the Holy Roman Empire was humiliated. The fighting, or lack thereof, would come to an end, officially a year later, in 1785, with the Treaty of Fontainebleau, which left the contested river closed to shipping in exchange for compensation. So, why was this conflict called the Kettle War? Because the one casualty of the conflict was a kettle on board the Leloui that was destroyed by De Dolphin's single non-lethal shot. The horror! Let's fast forward from one period of bloodless combat to another from 1784 to 1809. This is the Huescar Danish War. And you might be thinking, I've never heard of the nation of Huescar, and that's because Huescar is not a nation. It's a relatively small municipality in the province of Granada, Spain. So, how did this place end up saber-rattling with the Danes in the early 1800s, you ask? It started as the Napoleonic Wars were coming to a close in 1809. After Napoleon's defeat, stability was returning to Western Europe. Ferdinand VIII had taken the throne, and a peace treaty was signed between Spain and Denmark, except for, of course, the municipality of Huescar, which decided that maybe it would be the force to bring the country that gave us the Vikings to its knees. They may not have had the forces, specifically the municipality had only eight guards to its name, but they had the fighting spirit to bring home the victory for the king and country. Except there was never actually any fighting. The war was not lost on the battlefield, but in the pages of history itself. This went on for 172 years, until an employee of Granada's regional government found the dusty old declaration of war. They got into contact with the Danish government and began brokering another tongue-in-cheek peace deal in 1981. But both the people of Huescar and the Danes had some fun with this one. Danish ambassador Mons van der Petersen traveled to Huescar on April 11th of that year with a delegation of friends dressed as Vikings, carrying shields with the words Danish Hispanic friends written on them. But the citizens of Huescar gave it as good as they got it putting up large posters in the city limits that jokingly warned their Viking visitors that they were now entering enemy territory. It was a whole event, with everyone being given the day off in Huescar to take part in the merriment. During the party, the Danes and the people of Huescar traded regional food and drink, and once the festivities were over, Ambassador Van del Petersen and the mayor of Huescar, Osos José Pablo Serrano, signed a peace treaty. It was probably the chillest war of all time, even by standards of unusually gentlemanly bloodless wars. But our next war is the sweetest on name alone, and we're traveling stateside to take a look at the Honey War. We're kidding about that sweet part, by the way. This one's actually really strange. 
The aborted skirmish took place between the state militias of Iowa and Missouri back in 1839 over a series of confusions and disputes about the border between the two states. Due to unclear wording in a few land treaties made with the indigenous people in the area and sloppy surveying work of one John C. Sullivan in 1816, ambiguity about the exact nature of the border was created. In 1837, this left the door open for Missouri to sponsor a new survey of the border, which would allow them to essentially take almost 3,000 miles of land from Iowa. The federal government tried to step in and mediate the dispute as the tensions began to rise, but Missouri wasn't happy. The arrangement for the new border that the government proposed still benefited Iowa at their expense. Much like Le Louis barging into the River Scout to flex its power, Missouri retaliated against what they perceived as unfair treatment by sending a tax collector into disputed territory to collect taxes from the residents. And seeing as nobody is ever grateful to see a tax collector roll up to their door, this marked an escalation in tensions. The tax collector in question, Missouri Sheriff Uriah Gregory, was told to leave or the Iowans would use force. In retaliation, Missourians cut down four trees used by local bee colonies to store honey, hence the conflict's name, the Honey War. The next time Sheriff Gregory entered the disputed area, the Iowans had him arrested. When the news spread of the sheriff's incarceration, Missouri's governor sent out a militia to reclaim him. Meanwhile, when they heard that the Missouri militia was on its way, Iowa created its own impromptu militia, armed with rusty revolutionary weapons and old farm tools. The governor of Iowa donated five barrels of beer to the troops, which would surely improve their military focus and coordination. To underscore just how middle school this entire conflict was, the Iowan militia marched under the rallying cry of death to the invading pukes. But despite all these forces being marshaled, an actual battle never took place. This is because the invading Missouri militia got tired of being expected to risk their lives in a battle with the Iowans without promise of pay. So they shot a deer and ripped the carcass in half, then tied up the two halves of the carcass to trees, claiming that they represented the Missouri and Iowa governors. Then they proceeded to shoot at the two carcass halves before burying them with military honors and gun salutes. Yeah, we don't know why they thought that would help either, but strangely it did. The governors realized how weird things were getting and decided to call off the battle, agreeing to mediate the border with the federal government until the dispute was eventually settled by the Supreme Court. Not a single human life was taken, just a deer, some trees, and some bees. Speaking of animals in bloodless war, well, not so bloodless for the animals in question at least, probably one of the most famous of all is the Pig War, which took place on San Juan Island in 1859. The island, famed for its fertile soil and bountiful natural resources, became contested by the United States and the Hudson's Bay Company, a proxy for British interests. The British considered the Americans on the island to be squatters, whereas the Americans expected the US government to back up their own claim. The powder keg was formed, and a pig would be the lit match. On June 15, 1859, American Lyman Cutler set everything off by shooting a company pig that wandered onto his land and allegedly ate his potatoes. The death of this poor sign Archduke Ferdinand could have resulted in a major conflict, as Cutler sought the defense of anti-British American Brigadier General William S. Harney. Both parties sent forces to the island to support their claims, stoking fear that this whole thing would end in bloodshed. As the saber-rattling escalated and more troops occupied San Juan Island, President Buchanan became concerned and dispatched General Winfield Scott to stop the conflict from escalating into violence. Joint military occupation was proposed as a stopgap until a proper arrangement could be reached, and it remained that way for 12 entire years until the signing of the Treaty of Washington. Kaiser Wilhelm I of Germany acted as the mediator over the issue of San Juan Island, deciding to give it to the United States. This marked the last border divide between the US and Canada. But the Pig War is still only second to the strangest bloodless wars of all time, the Lobster War which took place between France and Brazil between 1961 and 1963, and is also, in our opinion, one of the most strangely pedantic wars of all time. It started with a group of French fishermen trawling for lobster across the coast of Africa. After a disappointing take, they decided to push west until they reached the warm waters of South America. They happened upon a huge population of spiny lobsters, which they started fishing in massive quantities. Naturally, the local fishermen didn't take kindly to this, and soon enough, the Brazilian navy was descending upon the fishermen to intimidate them out of the waters. 
The sailors argued that because the lobsters were moving on the floor of the South American coast, the lobsters were Brazilian by right. The fishermen argued that because the lobsters could swim from place to place, they were open for international fishing. This argument was unconvincing, so the Brazilians called in the rest of their fleet. France's president Charles de Gaulle took this as an insult and sent in a destroyer from the French fleet, which was repelled by the Brazilian navy. The French were given 48 hours to withdraw, but those 48 hours stretched into a three-year lobster-inspired Cold War. In the end, the issue needed to be settled in the international courts, and a group of scientists worked to litigate whether lobsters walked along the ground or swam through the sea. In the end, the conflict was settled, and the scientists found that the lobsters walked, not swam. If there was some kind of award for the dumbest ways a war could ever conclude, we definitely think that's in the running. Silent Night, Holy Night December 1944, Germany's on the back foot, caught in a vice by Allied forces on the west and the vengeful Soviet army on the east. Hitler and his leadership is no longer looking for victory against the Allied powers, they merely want to bring an end to the hostilities in the west and concentrate their forces on Germany's eastern border to repel the Soviet invasion. Given the numerous massacres Germany's carried out on Soviet soil, they are rightfully terrified of the vengeance the Red Army is waiting to unleash on its citizens. Hitler has long assumed direct command of the German army, and he believes he can drive the Western Allies to the negotiating table if he can inflict a massive setback on their forces. The port of Antwerp has become of critical importance to the Allied push toward Germany, shortening supply lines by hundreds of miles. If the port is neutralized, it'll slow down resupply by a week or more, seriously degrading the Allies' ability to conduct a massive offensive. But merely slowing down the offensive is not enough. Hitler needs to inflict a catastrophic loss on the Allies so he can weaken their appetite for a continued war against Germany. In exchange, Germany will return to its old borders, which will free up German units to defend the East. A stalemate and a return to the status quo is the best the German Third Reich can hope for anymore. To blunt the Allies' appetite for war, Hitler plans on conducting an attack with two critical goals. First, he'll direct a force into Antwerp and take the strategically important port. This will be achieved via a thrust through the dense Ardennes forest, which will also split the Allied lines in half. Having penetrated to the enemy's rear, German forces will then pivot north and south, attacking the Allies at their weakly defended flanks and rounding them, inflicting devastating losses. It won't be enough to militarily defeat any of the Allies, but it will be a catastrophic tactical loss for them, and hopefully good enough to convince them to make peace and free up German forces in the West. On the morning of December 16th, Germany began what would become known as the Battle of the Bulge. The attack makes use of inclement weather, allowing German units to maneuver when they would normally be vulnerable to Allied power. The Luftwaffe simply can't compete with Allied air forces any longer. Due to serious overconfidence and a belief that Germany was all but defeated militarily, the attack is a complete surprise, with Germany smashing straight into American defensive lines. They've chosen the location well, as this is where the US forces are weakest and the defenders are routed and thrown into retreat. But the Americans are quick to recognize Germany's goals, and US forces along the Elsenborn Ridge and Bastogne put up a bitter defense. The American units here are the only forces keeping Germany off the road network that the Wehrmacht desperately needs to move their forces quickly and efficiently. Instead, stubborn American resistance breaks the German assault, bunching up its forces and causing significant delays as tanks and infantry are stuck in miles-long traffic jams. In the midst of the fighting, a small squad of US soldiers finds themselves stuck behind enemy lines in the Hurtgen Forest. The three American soldiers had been trying to get back to friendly lines while avoiding German troops for three days, and one of their squad mates was seriously injured. The other two, however, refused to leave him behind. Amongst the snow-covered forest, Elizabeth Vinken and her 12-year-old son Fritz were waiting for dad to come home. The family had moved to the hunting cabin when their home was bombed by Allied planes. Fritz's father still worked in the nearby Aachen, where the family had once lived, and this Christmas Eve he was running late. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. Elizabeth opened it and was shocked to discover two American soldiers standing on her porch, with a third lying in the snow. The Americans were armed but polite, and something stirred in Elizabeth's heart when she realized they barely looked out of their teens. Despite this being the enemy, Elizabeth had a Christian duty to aid those in need. She quickly invited them inside and ordered Fritz to fetch potatoes and the rooster she was planning on butchering for dinner. The Americans didn't speak German and Elizabeth didn't speak English, but the two sides were able to communicate through broken French. Elizabeth did what she could for the wounded American and made the others comfortable. A little while later, though, there was a second knock at the door. 
Elizabeth figured it was probably more lost Americans, and she and Fritz quickly answered the door. However, standing outside her cabin was a squad of four German soldiers, one corporal and three young soldiers still in their teens. The men wished her a Merry Christmas and told her they were lost and hungry. Elizabeth knew the penalty for harboring the enemy was death, but she informed the corporal that there were three others inside they wouldn't consider friends. The corporal immediately asked if they were Americans inside. Elizabeth stood her ground, confirming his suspicion and telling the corporal that one was badly injured. Perhaps unsure of what to do, perhaps exhausted in the fighting, the corporal hesitated until Elizabeth put her foot down and said, it is the holy night and there will be no shooting here. Inside, the two Americans had guns at the ready. They were outnumbered and their injured comrade would be helpless, but they were prepared to fight to the death. Finally, the corporal relented and Elizabeth demanded that if they wanted food and shelter, they had to leave their weapons outside. One by one, the Germans agreed and handed over their rifles. Then Elizabeth went inside and demanded the same of the Americans, taking their rifles. She stacked them outside next to the Germans. Inside the cabin, Elizabeth cooked while the Germans and Americans eyed each other warily. However, as the aroma of cooking food filled the air, the two sides began to relax. In an act of compassion, one of the German soldiers, who had been a medical student before being drafted, asked to inspect the wounded American soldier. Eyeing him carefully, he informed his comrades that he was in serious danger of infection, and only the cold had prevented one from setting in. The man had lost significant amount of blood and badly needed to eat and rest. Finally, the food was ready, roasted chicken and potatoes. As the oddball group sat together at the table, Elizabeth led them in saying grace. Perhaps it was exhaustion, homesickness on Christmas Eve, or a realization of the futility of war, but tears soon welled up in the eyes of both sides as the Germans and the Americans broke bread together. The next morning, the German corporal inspected the Americans' map and gave them directions to get back to their lines, leading them away from the route they planned on taking, knowing that the German forces had captured that town already. To help them find their way to safety, he gave them his compass, and then with a handshake, the two sides grabbed their weapons and left in opposite directions. Decades later, Fritz was running a bakery in Kapalama, Hawaii. For years, he tried to find any information about the American or German soldiers his mother had taken in that night, but had no success. President Reagan himself had even come to hear the story and in a 1985 speech referenced the event to highlight reconciliation between former enemies during a stop in Germany. Fritz continued his search yet remained unable to find any information on either the American or German soldiers. Finally, in 1995, the show Unsolved Mysteries aired an episode on the strange Christmas truce. The show's researchers discovered that a man living in a nursing home in Frederick, Maryland had been telling a very similar story for years. Upon finding out, Fritz immediately flew to Maryland and met with Ralph Blank, who still had the compass the German soldier had given him. In tears, Ralph told Fritz, your mother saved my life. Later, Fritz would eventually be able to contact the other American soldier involved in the incident, but sadly, he was never able to find any of the German soldiers. This small Christmas truce would be an insignificant event in the greater scope of the Second World War, but a powerful reminder that war and hatred is not the natural state of man. Sadly, it's often only the veterans of combat who recognize that fact. But this was hardly the strangest truce of World War II. In 1940, Germany had a big problem. It needed to secure the supply of Swedish iron to continue building up its military. However, doing so meant keeping sea lanes open between itself and neutral Norway, a difficult task given the Royal Navy's superiority. Of specific importance was the Norwegian port of Narvik. As this allowed iron ore to continue to flow to Germany when the Baltic Sea would freeze in the winter. Norway soon mobilized its military as its neutrality was being seriously infringed on by both the Allies and the Germans, who were eager to weaken each other. Inevitably though, Norway found itself on the side of the Allies, as the Germans, feeling they had no other choice, invaded Norway in order to secure the all-important flow of ore. During an air battle between the Royal Air Force and the Luftwaffe over Norway, a German bomber was downed by a British fighter. The planes crashed, immediately killing the tail gunner, but the three remaining crew members managed to survive. Even more incredibly, not too far away, the very same British fighter that had shot them down had crash-landed itself after experiencing engine troubles. Both crews were now stuck in the middle of nowhere in freezing temperatures. The British pilot had spotted an old cabin while he tried to set his plane down, and the two survivors immediately set out for it. However, upon arriving, they found the waiting German bomber crew armed with pistols and knives. Wisely thinking it'd be best that these Germans didn't know they were the fighter crew who had brought them down, the pilot assured them they were themselves survivors of a downed bomber. The British crew convinced the Germans to stay in the cabin while they seeked another place for shelter, agreeing the two enemies departed amicably, with the British eventually stumbling across the Grotli Hotel. 
Unfortunately, the place was closed for the winter, but it did provide shelter from the bitter cold winter night. The next morning, the German crew came across the hotel and the two parties shared a breakfast together. Later in the day, the English pilot and one of the German bomber crew left the hotel together to try to find help. If they couldn't find anyone in this hostile wilderness, they would all surely die of starvation. The truce would come to an end when the two came across a Norwegian ski patrol looking for downed air crews. The German was shot dead by a Norwegian patrolman when he reached for his pistol, and after the patrol was led to the hotel, the surviving Germans were arrested and eventually sent to a POW camp in Canada. Unsurprisingly, the strangest truce of possibly all time came from World War II and led to Germans and Americans teaming up against… the Nazis? In 1943, Ither Castle in the Austrian Alps was turned into a prison for VIP prisoners from Dachau. The luxury prison housed important political and military prisoners that the Nazis could use to bargain with the Allies, and it included two former Prime Ministers of France and General Charles de Gaulle's older sister Mary Agnes Caillou. Despite being prisoners, life was relatively good at Ither Castle with the Nazis showing unusual courtesy to their prisoners and keeping them well fed. It wouldn't be until the war took a turn against Nazi Germany that things would become more difficult for the VIP prisoners. By May 1945, it was clear that Germany was going to lose the war. The guards at Ider Castle fled, but the prisoners inside were still stuck there as the Gestapo and the dreaded SS roamed the countryside. Two prisoners set out to look for the advancing Americans, running into German Major Joseph Gangels. The Wehrmacht officer had become deeply disillusioned with the Nazi party toward the end of the war, and even joined the Austrian resistance to strike against the SS. With only 20 loyal soldiers though, the Major needed help if he was going to get the VIP prisoners to safety. Advancing into the area was the American 23rd Tank Battalion of the 12th Armored Division. Gangles made contact with the unit commander, Captain Jack Lee, approaching the Americans while waving a white flag. After explaining the situation to the American captain, Lee immediately agreed to send a rescue mission to Castle Ither. Thus, a joint force of Americans and Germans made haste to the castle, parking their accompanying Sherman tank outside the entrance. The prisoners prepared to move, but the rescue force decided it would be safer to spend the night behind the walls of the castle. At dawn, however, the castle came under attack by the fanatical Waffen-SS, who were seeking to kill the VIPs, Americans, and the Germans that they now considered traitors. The SS managed to destroy the tank, leaving the rescue force without heavy vehicle support. However, thanks to the castle's fortifications, the defenders were able to hold off the SS assault. The firefight lasted an entire day, with machine gun fire heard for miles around. Finally, as advancing American forces were nearing, it was clear the SS was defeated. The 100 survivors surrendered and were sent to POW camps. The only casualty for the friendly forces was the man who had engineered the rescue effort and took a chance by asking his enemy for help. Major Joseph Gangel, who was killed by a sniper. The brave effort to protect the French VIPs would end up shaping the very future of France, as many of those rescued would go on to directly affect French post-war policies. These are the greatest victories by vastly outnumbered armies in history. English Battle of Agincourt For most of their histories as nation-states, England and France have enjoyed the shared popular pastime of murdering each other. But back in the 15th century, things were really heated between the two over the issues of legitimacy to the French crown and rule over French territories. Part of the Hundred Years' War, the Battle of Agincourt would prove to be decisive, and the odds were not looking good for the vastly outnumbered English. In August of 1415, the French told England's King Henry V to stuff his territorial demands, naturally prompting the enraged ruler to invade Normandy with a force of 12,000 men. He laid siege to the city of Harfleur, which would end up capitulating in six weeks. The siege, however, had been costly for Henry's army, knocking out about half of his army due to casualty and illness. Nevertheless, Henry pressed the offensive but was unable to cross the Somme due to considerable French defenses. Forced to detour further upstream, the delay allowed the French to rally a massive army to counterattack the English. Near the village of Agincourt, Henry's remaining 6,000 soldiers faced a force of between 20,000 and 30,000 French, although some estimates place them at only 12,000. A bloodbath was in order, but not quite the bloodbath the French had expected. Henry's forces were seriously weakened at this point. Not only had they lost half their strength, but the men were exhausted after a 200-mile march. To add to their misery, most of the men were suffering from dysentery, prompting a persisting myth that the English fought with their pants off so they could relieve themselves mid-battle. Henry's forces were also strategically disadvantaged. He had only 1,000 knights remaining to protect a force of 5,000 archers. 
Henry's forces might have been disadvantaged by comparison, but the French made the blunder of allowing the enemy to pick the field of battle. Henry chose to make a stand at the end of a freshly plowed field. The field was extremely muddy after a week of rain, and the forest on either side of the field made it impossible for the French cavalry to maneuver for a flanking attack on the lightly armored archers. Further, the field narrowed considerably toward Henry's position, having the effect of funneling the French into a relatively small front that Henry's vastly outnumbered men-at-arms could easily defend. At about 11 am, the battle began, and it was an immediate bloodbath. The French assault was spearheaded by the heavy cavalry followed by knights on foot. The freshly plowed field, however, proved to be difficult for the horses to navigate and build up speed on, taking much of the momentum out of the assault. Slowed down by extremely muddy ground, the cavalry was immediately under withering fire from the English longbowmen, only to run straight into a wall of sharpened stakes that the English had placed before their front line. The English longbow was a terrifying weapon, and under these specific conditions turned what would normally be a major strategic vulnerability in force composition to a deadly advantage. With a range of nearly 300 yards, the longbow could deliver an arrow at a great distance with enough force to punch through plate armor. It was such an instrumental English weapon of war that for a while every Every Englishman was required by law to train in its use. With the cavalry mired down in heavy mud and unable to charge through the palisade of sharpened stakes, fighting devolved into hand-to-hand -in -hand combat with the front line of longbowmen discarding their bows for melee weapons. Faster on foot in the thick mud than the armored cavalry, the French suffered immediate and heavy casualties. All meanwhile, a second line of longbowmen poured withering fire upon more advancing French forces. The third line of French infantry advanced to the front, but was similarly mired down by the muddy field, made even worse now by the trampling of horses and the hundreds of corpses strewn about. Trapped in thick mud, the French offensive was easy pickings for the English longbowmen. The defeat effectively broke the French army, with casualty estimates of about 400 for the English and 6,000 for the French. Perhaps the most devastating for the French, though, was the loss of many influential noblemen. The resulting loss and bickering amongst French nobles would lead to the English taking Normandy and the French ending the war by marrying off a princess to the English king. Our next incredible victory involved six men taking a whole city. Nazis take Belgrade with only six men. In 1941, Nazi Germany was driving deep into Yugoslavia and immediately regretting it. The narrow mountain passes choked up units and the melting snows made travel a nightmare for mechanized forces. While local forces were no match for the advancing German army, the operation to secure Belgrade was eating up more time and resources than Hitler and his high command had planned for. With the bulk of friendly forces miles behind him, Captain Fritz Klingenberg was tasked with reconnoitering a path for advancing panzers. Enemy forces had sabotaged nearly every bridge and the bad weather had made roads difficult to traverse. Thus, Klingenberg's intelligence was crucial for the advancing armored thrust. Belgrade had been softened up by over 500 bombing sorties, inflicting an estimated 17,500 casualties on Yugoslavian forces and civilians. The Yugoslav army was on the verge of collapse, and yet, German forces were so caught up in the narrow mountain passes and fighting off guerrilla-style attacks that they were unable to move fast enough to seize the mostly undefended city. Klingenberg was due to send back a report on the defenses of Belgrade within a day, and on April 11th he saw a chance to get a closer look at the outskirts of the city when one of his men discovered a boat. The Danube River was in a dangerous state at the moment due to snow runoff from the mountains, but Klingenberg and five other men navigated the treacherous river to get to the other side. The two boat handlers were ordered to return and ferry the rest of the men, but the boat struck a submerged obstacle and quickly sunk, stranding Klingenberg on the other side with only six men and few supplies. Resigning himself to his fate, Klingenberg decided that if he couldn't return to friendly lines, he'd just have to go ahead and take the entire city himself. The squad moved up and ambushed a group of 20 Yugoslav soldiers holding a German tourist prisoner. The German tourist was thoroughly inebriated and unaware of the fact that he was being held as a spy and would soon be put to death. After sobering up, he thanked his rescuers and worked as their interpreter. Using captured Yugoslav uniforms and his growing number of prisoners, Klingenberg and his men pushed deeper into the city and past security checkpoints. As the city was expecting a lengthy siege, security was lax. Nobody suspected that the Nazis would try to infiltrate the city with such a tiny force. Eventually, the gig was up, and Klingenberg and his men got into a running firefight with vehicles they had stolen. Fending off their attackers, they made their way to the city center, where the civilian population was largely going about its business as usual. Marching up to the flagpost flying the Yugoslavian national flag, Klingenberg ordered it taken down and the German flag hoisted. He then ordered his six men to begin strutting around on patrol of the local area. Incredibly, the Belgrade mayor and city officials came to meet Klingenberg and inquire about terms of surrender. Bluffing, Klingenberg informed the mayor that he was the point for several armored divisions and that he was expected to radio back a report on the city's surrender within hours. 
force, otherwise the Luftwaffe would level the city and German infantry would kill every man, woman, and child left inside. Klingenberg's men tried their best to hide their shock. Their radio had been damaged and could only receive messages, not send any. With Klingenberg giving his word that no further harm would befall the city, the mayor accepted Klingenberg's offer of surrender and ordered all Yugoslav forces to stack their weapons in the city square and billet themselves in four of the city's hotels. Klingenberg then posted a single guard at each hotel. As other Yugoslav forces arrived at the city, the mayor ordered them also to surrender their weapons and billet themselves in the hotels, holding the other surrendered Yugoslavian soldiers. With six men, Klingenberg captured over 1,300 troops and 200 thousand civilians. Two days later, the main German army arrived, expecting a fierce battle, only to be greeted with a fully pacified city. Our next greatest victory over a superior foe could have been avoided if ancient Chinese emperor had thought twice about arming a hundred thousand slaves to fight for their oppressors. Battle of Mu Yi In the 12th century BC, the Shang Dynasty controlled most of what would become China. However, the Wei River Valley was occupied by various clans known as the Zhou. Rather than wage a costly war, King Di Jin of the Shang instead made the Zhou his vassals, appointing King Wen of the Zhou as Count of the West. This status quo remained until Di Jin feared that Wen's power was growing. Fearful of revolt, he imprisoned Wen, though later released him. Relations between the two, however, quickly soured. Wen immediately raised an army and began conquering other Shang vassal states, weakening the Shang. Di Jin, however, seemed almost uncaring about the threat to his kingdom, and legend has it because he became completely engrossed with his beautiful consort Da Ji. Wen would die before attacking the Shang directly, but his plans were picked up by his son, King Wu. Wu's open revolt soon threatened the Shang capital itself. With a force of about 50,000, Wu moved against a defending force of 530,000, though modern estimates question the veracity of those numbers. Di Shen further strengthened his defenses by arming 170,000 slaves, whom promptly defected en masse to the Zhou army. This was a crushing blow to the morale of the Shang army, and as the Zhou advanced, entire units of Shang soldiers met the Zhou with spears held upside down, a sign of surrender. Di Shen had by all accounts been a good ruler, but in his latter years became corrupt and oppressive. Not wishing to fight for a corrupt dynasty, many of the Shang defended the Zhou. This still left a significant number of defenders, though, and one of the bloodiest battles in Chinese history ensued. The Zhou, however, were better equipped and trained and enjoyed greater morale, ensuring their victory. After the battle, Di Shen adorned himself with precious jewels and then burned himself alive in a great bonfire. His consort was killed by Wu, though he spared many Shang officials and civilians not involved in the battle. Many of those officials in turn worked for his regime as he declared himself the head of the new Zhou dynasty. Wu also immediately opened up the royal storehouses releasing food to the starving population. For his mercy and kindness, King Wu would be proclaimed father of the people. Our next stunning victory would prove that numbers are no match for superior equipment, training, and a desire for freedom. This is Spar- I mean, Marathon. In 490 BC, Persia was on the warpath. The massive Persian Empire had already pushed into Europe, but the Greek city-states were proving troublesome. The Greek had directly supported rebellion in Ioana, and King Darius I could no longer stomach the thorn in his side the Greek had become. Vastly superior in numbers and wealth, he sent envoys in 491 BC to secure Greek surrender to Persian rule. The Greeks responded by killing every last envoy. Outraged at the murder of his envoys, Darius sent a force of 600 ships and 25,000 soldiers to crush the Greeks once and for all. They quickly destroyed the Greek city-state of Eritrea and gained assurances of compliance from other autocratic city-states who hoped to see the democratic state of Athens fall. Athens responded by immediately dispatching its army, reinforced by a small contingent of Plataeans. In total, the Greek numbered at 10,000 versus 25,000 and 30,000 Persians. The Persians favored long-range attack and thus were equipped accordingly. Their soldiers were lightly armored, with a heavy investment in archers who would lay down waves of fire on enemy formations. Thus, Persian infantry was armed with a lightweight wicker shield and short stabbing spear, as well as a light composite bow. Standard procedure was to lay down long-range fire as the enemy closed in, then switch to spears, daggers, and swords to meet in melee. The Persians also brought light cavalry to battle, armed with a bow and two javelins, for throwing and thrusting. The cavalry was too lightly armored to lead charges against enemy formations, and instead was tasked with harassing the enemy's flanks and engaging units which broke formation. Making up the backbone of the Persian army was a force of several 1,000 strong elite Aristibari units, spear bearers with light armor, typically tunics with bronze scales or leather padding. 
the Greeks took a completely different approach to battle than the Persians, and the difference would be decisive. While the Persians favored mobility and long-range fire, the Greeks favored heavy armor and unit cohesion. Their men were armored in bronze breastplates, helmets, and shin guards, with an armored skirt providing protection to the legs while allowing for great mobility. Each Greek soldier also carried a heavy spear and a short stabbing sword or dagger, as well as a massive bronze shield. Trained to fight as a unit, the Greek formed themselves into nearly impenetrable phalanx formations that presented a wall of bronze to the enemy with long stabbing spears decimating enemy infantry from within the protection of the phalanx. As the Persian force landed, the Greeks were split on whether to defend or attack head-on. Some insisted on waiting for the Spartans, who were delayed due to their celebration of the Carnia festival, a theme that would recur with annoying frequency. In the end, a decision was made to attack, so as not to allow the Persians much time to muster themselves after disembarking their ships. The Greek drew up their battle line and advanced on the Persian-held bay. They had purposefully thinned their center to dangerously low levels, advancing with a center only four men deep. This was done to allow the Greek to expand their line to match that of the Persian line, as the Persians enjoyed vast numerical advantage. If the Persian line was allowed to envelop the Greek forces, it would render the phalanx vulnerable and ineffective. However, the Greek reinforced their flanks knowing that the Persians would place their most elite soldiers in the center. The last thing the Persians would expect would be for the Greeks to purposefully thin their center, thus allowing the Greek flanks to overwhelm the Persian flanks and envelop the Persian center. As the battle began, Persian forces launched volley after volley on the advancing Greek. Due to their light bows and heavy Greek armor though, the barrages of arrows were largely ineffective and produced at best only light wounds amongst the Greek. Seeing that their volley fire was having little effect, Persian morale dipped as the Greek line, light glinting off their bronze shield and armor, smashed into the Persian forces. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting ensued, but Greek armor and phalanx tactics proved superior. The Greek center eventually collapsed, but by then the Persian flanks had been decimated, with many fleeing for the ships. As the Greek center retreated, it lured the Persian center forward, allowing the Greek flanks to envelop it. A slaughter ensued, with the Persians breaking and fleeing for the safety of their ships. The Greeks pursued, capturing seven ships and slaughtering thousands of Persians. Strangely, Persian cavalry was absent from the battle, perhaps either because the terrain was unsuitable or because it had been dispatched to try and take Athens while its army was away. Whatever the reason, the surviving Persian forces retreated to sea and immediately set sail for Athens, hoping to take the city while the exhausted army was still miles away. In a feat of incredible endurance, the Athenians and their Plataean armies marched back to Athens, arriving the same night and discouraging another Persian fleet from attack. Losses for the Persians are estimated to number around 6,400 dead, with only 100 192 Greek dead, though that figure is in dispute and believed to have been falsified for propaganda purposes. The victory, however, rallied the Greek people and convinced them that victory against a vastly superior Persian Empire was possible, directly setting the stages for the victories which would end the Persian attempt to conquer Greece. Our next stunning victory is one of the least known but most important battles of the Greco-Persian Wars, the Thermopylae at sea. After the humiliating defeat at Marathon, King Darius I swore to crush the upstart Greek but would end up dying before he could rally the troops and capital for a new invasion. His son Xerxes instead took up the task of crushing Greece into submission once and for all. Once more Persian envoys were sent with many Greek city-states offering submission. Athens and Sparta, however, refused and led a coalition that vowed to resist all Persian attempts to conquer Greece. On land, coalition forces decided to hold off the Persians at the Vale of Tempe, but this decision was soon judged as too easy to outflank. Instead, the Greek moved their defenses to Thermopylae, a narrow strip of land flanked on one side by cliffs and on the other by the sea. Here, the vastly outnumbered Greek forces would be able to hold off against the Persian assault as long as the Persian navy could be prevented from outflanking the forces at Thermopylae. At sea, the situation was equally as grim for the Greek. The Persians had invaded with a force of over 1,200 triremes and an unrecorded number of supply ships. Opposing them was a force of 271 Greek ships, most of them Athenian and led by Themistocles who had been instrumental in constructing the Athenian navy. Internal politics between the city-states saw many of them refuse to join in the effort if an Athenian was placed in charge, and thus the fleet was led by Eurybates, a Spartan. However, it would be Themistocles that would rally the fleet to the hard battles to come. Persian numbers were overwhelming, but immediately acted against them. Unable to find safe harbor for their vast fleet, an estimated 400 triremes were sunk when an unexpected storm rose up overnight. Another 15 ships inadvertently sailed straight into the Greek fleet, which immediately destroyed them. However, the next morning they received 120 reinforcements from Thrace, heading into battle with an estimated force of 920 warships. The next day, the Persians set sail to meet 
meet the Greek fleet. As they neared the southern tip of Magnesia, the Corinthian contingent, about 40 ships, turned tail and ran, abandoning the Greek fleet and reducing its number to 231 ships. The Euboean contingent requested permission to withdraw long enough to evacuate their families, but were declined and bribed into staying put. The Persians sent 200 ships around Euboea to cut off a Greek retreat, reducing their numerical advantage to just over 2 to 1. Informed by a deserter that the Persian fleet was temporarily weakened, the Greeks pushed the attack. The Persians easily enveloped the smaller Greek fleet, which turned their ships to form a ring around which the Persians launched their attack. Once more, better equipment and training proved superior to Persian numbers, and the Persians were forced to retreat. With an unknown number of ships destroyed and 30 of them captured in battle, Greek losses were not recorded. After victory, the Greek made plans to catch up to the Persian contingent meant to cut off their retreat and destroy it before they could rejoin the rest of the fleet. However, another sudden storm forced them to seek shelter, while the Persians were caught at sea, losing most of their numbers. The next day, 53 additional Athenian ships arrived to reinforce the Greeks, bringing them news of the decimated Persian contingent that had been sunk by the storm. That day, the Persians launched an attack, but this was repelled by the heavier and better armed Greek fleet. On the third day, they sought to overwhelm the Greek forces, forcing the Greek fleet to deploy in half-moon formation. Losses were heavy on both sides, and yet the Greek fleet did not break. However, during the day, losses mounted and eventually word from Thermopylae reached the Greek. The defenders had been flanked through a mountain pass and had retreated. Those who remained behind to buy time for the rest of Greece to prepare itself for the invasion had been killed almost to the man. The Greek fleet no longer needed to secure Thermopylae from being flanked, and thus the order to retreat was given. The fleet pulled back to the Straits of Salamis, where narrower waters were once more nullifying the Persian advantage. The Greek, however, were easily boxed in by the numerically superior Persians, who sent contingents to block off the strait from the Greek rear. The Greeks feigned to retreat to shore and lured the Persians in by the charge of a single Greek trireme. Lured to the narrower part of the straits, the Persian numerical advantage was completely nullified and the heavier Greek triremes inflicted devastating losses on the Persian ships. In fierce ship-to-ship -ship fighting, the Greek marines also managed to kill numerous senior Persian leaders and officials, throwing the bulk of the surviving fleet into disarray. With losses mounting and morale breaking, the Persian fleet retreated, earning the Greek a decisive victory. Fearful of his ground forces being outflanked at sea, Xerxes ordered a retreat from his conquest of southern Greece as he himself departed for Persia. The Greek naval victory ensured that Greece would stand and eventually defeat the Persian invasion once and for all. It's 1943, and Germany believes its dams, critically important for the war effort, are invulnerable to British bombs. Then, a single Lancaster bomber drops to 60 feet and unleashes a strange tumbling barrel out of its bomb bay. In astonishment, German soldiers watch this barrel bounce right over the torpedo nets protecting one of the biggest dams in Germany, then run up the side of the dam before falling back down. The explosion is tremendous, and British dam busters are about to turn the tide of the war with the weirdest weapon in World War II. Thanks to the entry of the United States into the war, the British Army had backup, but breaking through the German defenses was proving challenging. The Nazis were relying heavily on the Ruhr Valley, a heavily industrialized region where the waters were kept in check by a series of dams. These dams not only kept the area safe from flooding, but they were also key sources of hydroelectric power for the region and provided drinking water. They were also key to the canals running through the region. And any failure in the dams could be devastating. And that's exactly what the British were counting on. Even before the war, the British had set their sights on the Ruhr Valley as a potential target in the event of a conflict. Now, with the Nazis threatening to conquer the British Isles, they knew that this might be the way to turn the tides. There was just one problem. They didn't have a weapon that was capable of breaking through the defenses. The dams were heavily fortified, too strong to be attacked from the air. Their only vulnerable spots were their base, but the Germans knew that. The dams were protected by underwater torpedo nets that would stop the bombs short of their target. This would be one of the trickiest missions of the war, and it would require a new type of weapon. The beginnings of Operation Chastity were found in the notes of Barnes Wallace, a weapons designer at the British engineering firm Vickers. He had designed some of the Royal Air Force's most powerful bombers and was working on anti-ship weapons when he was called back into service to figure out how to destroy the dams. His first idea? A much bigger bomb, one of the most powerful conventional weapons ever created. If it hit its target, it would break through the fortifications and shatter the dam. There was just one problem with his plan. The British 
British had some big bombers, but none were equipped to carry a bomb of that size. Also, their planes weren't designed to fly at the altitude needed to deliver the weapon, nicknamed an earthquake bomb, because of its high speed, high altitude delivery. He proposed a bigger bomber, but the time and money needed were unacceptable, so the plan was scrapped and Wallace started to focus on the dam's weak point. Getting to it from the top was impractical, but if he could figure out a way around the torpedo nets, it would be easy to cause massive damage. It was a new kind of war, and it was time to throw out all previous thinking about bombs. Wallace's next design took everyone by surprise. It was almost a third of the size of the previous model, only about 9,000 pounds, but it actually wasn't a bomb at all. It was a mine shaped like a cylinder that would work like a depth charge. Instead of being dropped from a high height, it only needed to be launched 60 feet above the water. Sent flying toward the target at 240 miles an hour, it would speed toward the target and skip across the water. The backspin would cause the bomb to run across the side of the dam before hitting the base, detonating with a massive impact. And it looked more like an oil drum than a high-tech bomb, but it packed a punch. Now it was time to test this new concept. The first task was blowing up a scale model dam. After this pass with flying colors, the British military tested it on an abandoned dam in Wales and determined that it needed a charge of 7,500 pounds to breach the dam. This brought the bomb within the levels that could be carried by the popular Avro Lancaster airplane. As the military conducted airdrop trials and the airplanes were adapted to carry the massive bomb, a new stumbling block emerged in the mission. It was the worst nightmare of designers everywhere. Bureaucracy. Air Vice Marshal Francis Linnell of the Ministry of Aircraft Production was not pleased. He wanted Wallace focusing on developing new aircraft, but Wallace was pressured to resign after the head of Bomber Command denied the allocation of the bombers. The whole project was in danger until the chief of the air staff heard about the project. The higher-ups were convinced of the mission's necessity. Wallace got his bombers, and the design of what would be known as the Upkeep Mines continued. The mission was scheduled for May of 1943, when the high waters would make it easier to deliver the payload underwater. It was eight weeks to the mission, and there was a lot of work to be done. The modifications to the Lancaster still needed to be completed, and the mine had to be perfected. But there was one other piece to the mission. Someone needed to take on the incredibly dangerous mission into enemy territory. They'd be delivering a payload to one of the most closely guarded locations in the Nazi regime, at serious risk of capture or death, and they had to pull off a military maneuver never before attempted in combat. The wrong team being selected could turn the tide of the war against the British, and it all fell on number 5 Group RAF. This elite unit was one of Britain's best, but it wasn't only British. It contained Allied soldiers from Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. They were briefed on their mission and would target a pair of dams, the Mone and the Sorpa, both upstream from the Ruhr industrial area. They had a secondary target, the Eder Dam if things went south. The goal? To deliver a devastating blow to German infrastructure, cut off their hydroelectric power, and disrupt the flow of water to factory cities and canals. The hit could also cause major flooding if the damage was serious enough. The entire war could hinge on this one bombing raid. The mission would take place at night for the maximum chance of success, and the team quickly began training in low light and low altitude flying. The technical advisors struggled to solve issues such as the visibility of the target and determining the aircraft's altitude. Every little detail of the mission could be the difference between success and failure, and some spotlights attached to the plane promised to solve the altitude problem. But the mission would also need brains in the cockpit, and the Royal Air Force chose one of their best men to lead the charge, and he was only 25 years old. Guy Penrose Gibson was already one of the best pilots in the Royal Air Force, and they trusted him with maybe their most critical mission yet. Security was tight on the mission, and early on, only Wallace and Gibson knew the details of the mission. They briefed other soldiers down the line as needed, and on May 13, 1943, they received the bombs. Three days later, they would take flight, divided into three formations that would each hit one target, either the primary ones or falling back to hit the secondary ones. They ran into a last-second disruption. Two crew members were sick and scrapped from the mission, but nothing would stop up Operation Chastity from taking aim. The routes to the targets were well scouted and the planes avoided the areas with known anti-aircraft guns. One bomber was late due to a coolant leak, but two and a half hours before midnight they started taking off. Soon all three formations were in the air, flying low to avoid German radar. One radio operator tracking them observed a plane and was shocked by what he saw. One of the pilots was flying so low he was actually below tree level, but it wouldn't be long before the planes hit rough waters. Formation number two was the first to hit trouble. Some bombers were were damaged and lost their radio or bombs, while others crashed or were forced to bail out. But formation number one fared differently. 
and soon the Mona Dam was in sight. They took heavy anti-aircraft fire but ultimately delivered a devastating hit to the Mona, and the massive structure was breached. But the Allies weren't done yet. Next up was the Eater Dam, and the pilots soon realized there would be trouble. The valley was extremely foggy, but this actually turned into an advantage. The geography in the fog made it harder to defend the dam with anti-aircraft guns, and they didn't take as many hits as they did in the first strike. But that didn't mean it wouldn't be challenging. It took one plane six tries to find the target, and another bomb struck the top of the dam and damaged the aircraft. Ultimately, the final bomb of the formation hit its target and shattered the dam's defenses. The next test would be the hardest yet. The Sorpe Dam was the mission's reach goal. It was much hardier than the other two, made of earthen material rather than concrete and steel. By the time the squadron was ready to attack it, only two planes remained. A close call with a church steeple in the region nearly took out one plane, and there was no time for a bomb aimer to get a perfect shot. It took nine failed bombing runs before the bomb was finally dropped, and it hit Hit, but not perfectly. The top of the dam was damaged, but the core structure was intact. Now there was just one challenge left, get home. Two more planes were lost on the way back, but back at the base in Scampton, the mission commanders waited anxiously to see who would return. Ultimately, 11 bombers returned, with mission commander Guy Gibson returning over an hour after the first survivor. The last survivors of this extremely dangerous mission arrived two hours later. In total, eight of the 19 planes that took off to deliver a devastating blow to the German war machine were lost, but the punch they delivered to the enemy was far more devastating. The bomber command had put a lot into the mission, and the cost and human life were harsh, but the results were worth it. Two massive dams had been breached, and soon afterward, huge floods laid waste to the region. A pilot that scouted the area observed that he could only see treetops and church steeples poking above the floodwaters. It took a long time for the full damage to be assessed, but now it's believed that around 1,600 people in the region died in the floods, and the financial cost was incalculable. The unit's bravery and Barnes Wallace's ingenuity had paid off. 80 of the 153 dam busters survived the mission, and they were all highly honored for their service. Guy Gibson in particular became the most decorated soldier in British history at the time before returning to war. But as time went on, a debate began. It was a highly effective mission, maybe too effective. In harnessing the forces of nature to devastate a German region, the British unleashed mass casualties. Most of the victims of the flood were civilians, many of them foreign workers and prisoners of war, to honor the heroes or mourn the victims. The question would be debated for decades. The war was eventually won, and the story of the dam busters passed into history. It wouldn't be long before the silver screen came calling, and in 1955, a movie was made based on a series of books about the raid. Not only was it the most popular film of the year in Britain, but its depiction of the pinpoint strike against a massive structure's most vulnerable point reportedly inspired the iconic strike on the Death Star in Star Wars. But it would have a different impact on the future of war. In 1977, an amendment to the Geneva Convention outlawed attacking dams if it could cause severe losses among civilian population. An exception was made for if the dam was critical to military operations and there's no other way to neutralize it, but the shock and awe of Operation Chastity had horrified enough people that they wanted to make sure it would never happen again. Again. One figure of the strike, though, couldn't be reached for comment. Like so many other war heroes, Guy Gibson returned to combat after his most heroic mission. He took tours of Canada and the US first, but eventually returned to service. Over a year after the Dam Busters mission, he would be involved in an attack on Bremen where his plane crashed for unknown reasons, and he became one of the many fallen of World War II. A tumbleweed tank? A gun that shoots tornadoes? Airborne mines? Here are 10 more of the most bizarre weapons of World War II you've never heard of. Number 10. The V3 Cannon Hitler liked few things more than shock and awe, and what would be more shocking and awesome than a gun that fired multiple times? The V3 Cannon was designed to be the most advanced and powerful cannon in Germany's arsenal, and it would increase the power of its ammo by hitting it with multiple extra boosts of propellant. As the projectile passed different points in the long barrel, its heat would trigger solid fuel rocket boosters that would increase the projectile's power. It passed initial tests, and German designers thought it could be used to bombard London into submission. Then it all went wrong. The prototype seemed promising, and a model was placed in northern France where the projectiles could span the English Channel. But as early tests at the site fell short, funds were running short, and the project was cut back. Allied bombing raids destroyed much of the site, and soon the plan was abandoned. However, similar weapons were used later to bombard Luxembourg in the last year of the war. But as the Nazi war machine came to a crash, 
crashing halt in 1945, the ultimate fate of the V3 cannon was to be a curiosity of strange weaponry. But it was more intimidating than this next weapon. Number 9. The Bob Semple Tank As World War II raged on, the southern nations of Australia and New Zealand worried that Japan would invade and overwhelm them. While both were involved in the war, their home front defenses were lacking and they had no homegrown fighting vehicles. New Zealand's Minister of Works, Bob Semple, wanted to change that. They would have to work with what they had, and what New Zealand mostly had were hardy old farming vehicles. And so began the greatest makeover in World War II. Can a tractor truly be transformed into a top-of-the-line fighting tank? Magic 8-Ball says, Outlook Cloudy. The Bob Simple tank was built on a standard Caterpillar D8 crawler tractor, easy to get in New Zealand, and equipped with armor and machine guns. However, the tank was small and hard to use. One gunner had to be lying down on a mattress to use his gun, and the tank was armored with corrugated plating rather than full armor. In early tests, the armor didn't hold up, and the heavy vehicles were hard to maneuver. In the end, the tanks were scrapped before even making it to combat, probably for the best. But they did have a strange place in New Zealand's heart as a symbol of wartime ingenuity. But some oddball weapons weapons are successes, smashing successes. Number 6. Bouncing Bomb It doesn't look like much, a large rolling cylinder that resembles an oil drum. In decades to come, video game players would watch a plumber jump over barrels that look a lot like it. But the Bouncing Bomb packed a powerful punch, and it might have helped turn the tide of war for the Allies. When the British Royal Air Force was looking to destroy some key German dams, they ran into a problem. The dams were protected at the base by anti-torpedo nets, and damaging the tops wouldn't destroy them. They needed a new type of bomb, and British engineer Barnes Wallace delivered. The bombs, codenamed Upkeep, were designed to be fired at a lower height than typical bombs and weighed much less than conventional bombs that could destroy the dam. In the famous Operation Chastity, a team of soldiers known as the Dam Busters engaged in a risky mission to deliver the payload. The bombs could be dropped at just 60 feet, bounce across the water, then sink under and explode, cracking the base of the dams and causing massive floods in the region. It wasn't even technically a bomb, it functioned more like a massive depth charge, but it was as effective as the test showed although the use was extremely specific, but not every inventive weapon design works out. Number 7. Unrotated Projectile One of the biggest challenges for the UK in World War II was stemming the massive bombardment coming from Nazi-occupied Europe. That created a lot of unique anti-aircraft weapons, some more effective than others. The UP projector sounded like a great concept, a rocket system that would launch without being spin-stabilized. Instead, it would launch a rocket that would release a mine attached to three parachutes. The wires attached to the parachute would snag the enemy planes, pulling the mine into them. As soon as the mine hit the enemy, kablam! One less plane that could bombard London. But what works on paper doesn't always work in practice. The system had many flaws. First, it was slow to load and the crews responsible were often vulnerable to enemy fire while working on it. Second, it was a low-tech solution in an increasingly high-tech war, and the maneuverable German planes might be able to dodge the wires. But when Winston Churchill intended a test, a bigger flaw became clear. If the winds were too strong, the bombs could actually be blown back onto the ship and blow them up. The dummy rounds caused no real damage, but in war this could be a disaster, so the unrotated projectile was consigned to the storage locker before long. But the Allies weren't the only ones creating bizarre weapons. Number 6. Windkanone Hitler was a big fan of big ideas, and there was no bigger idea than the one that his army could literally harness the forces of nature against the enemy. The Nazis created many large weapons, but this one, with a distinctive upward-pointing snout, intended to create a synthetic tornado. A large pipe would be filled with explosive gas, a turbine would spin it, and it would be released into the atmosphere through a rotating nozzle. Air would be drawn into the spiral and create a vortex that could down enemy aircraft as they approach without ever firing a shot. But if it sounds too too good to be true, it probably is. The Windkanone did actually work, creating tornadoes that could destroy wooden sheds over 300 feet from the gun. But when it came to shooting them up in the air, it was a different story. The gun only created tornadoes around 900 feet above the ground, and aircraft on bombing raids are usually high above that level. So the Windkanone was a scientific breakthrough, but there's a big difference between that and actually being a useful weapon in combat. Hey, at least everyone on the test got one heck of a show. Other weapons of the war were a lot smaller. Number 5. The William Tell The Office of Strategic Services played a key role in winning the war, sending American spies around the globe, and effective spycraft required stealth, which meant OSS members wouldn't be able to carry standard noisy handguns. Many strange weapons were created, often with mixed results, and one found its origins hundreds of years ago in the Middle Ages. The William Tell was believed to be the
the quietest weapon in the OSS arsenal, and it combined the accuracy of a crossbow with the power of a slingshot. But how did it handle in combat? While it worked like a slingshot, it used a rubber harness instead of a traditional bill that made it a lot more compact and muffled the telltale snap of the slingshot. It could launch a deadly projectile at close range, but the problem was arrows rarely kill silently. The enemy is hit, and even if it's a fatal blow, the odds are they're going to stay conscious long enough to let everyone know they've been shot and there's an enemy afoot. So the OSS kept looking for the perfect stealth weapons that would help them win the war. Another attempt was more successful and stranger. Number 4. Sedgley OSS-38 The Sedgley OSS-38 was a simple device. It was a single-shot pistol that was ideal for covert operations and assassinations. Geared toward the Pacific Theater, it was meant to make it easier for the assassin to cover their tracks. To cover up an assassination, hitmen would often wear gloves to keep themselves from being identified. This cut out the middleman by attaching the pistol to the back of a simple cowhide glove, making it a portable weapon that the users could wear and disguise in the sleeve of a long coat. So how did the glove pistol actually work? Instead of having a standard trigger, the pistol was armed with a bar extending beyond the barrel. Triggering it was as simple as loading and cocking the pistol safely, then making a fist and pressing the trigger next to the target's body. One shot is fired and the target is fatally shot, without a gun being anywhere in sight. The OSS didn't divulge how many times, if any, this unique weapon was used, but it's believed they manufactured as many as 200 guns for use on top secret missions. Other unique World War II weapons were a lot bigger. Number 3. The X-Class Submarine When you think about submarines, you usually think about massive vessels streaming through the waters, but during World War II, the British were looking for stealth. That's where the X-Class came into play. These miniature submarines were built during the 1940s and needed to be towed to their target by a larger submarine. Once they were unleashed, they could hold a crew and some powerful weapons. They were ideal for sneaking into target areas while being less visible to German sonar. But there were a few difficulties with the X-Class. For one thing, to get the crew from the main submarine to the X-Class meant they needed a third vehicle, a dinghy, to ferry the crew, during which they would be vulnerable. The X-Class was also prone to leaking in the early tests, with several ships being lost. The model was liked by the brass because it made it possible for crews to stay submerged far longer than other small models, but practical issues derailed it quickly, and the X-Class was ultimately scuttled. The small submarine went to a museum, but the Royal Navy built on the design and introduced better, hardier models. But as we head toward number one, things are getting really strange. Number two, Kugelpanzer. Imagine being on the battlefield and suddenly you see what looks like a giant tumbleweed rolling toward you. But it's not a tumbleweed. It's a spherical rolling tank designed by Nazi Germany, and it's going to roll right over you. It's the Kugelpanzer, one of the strangest weapons ever designed for use in World War II. It's a one-man vehicle with thin but durable armor, two rolling treads attached to the sides, and an eye slit for the driver to see through. Only one model was ever found and was captured by the Soviets in Manchuria. But even with it in their custody, there were more questions than answers. The one model found was unfinished and seems to have never been used in combat. It was designed to be used as a light reconnaissance vehicle rather than a combat vehicle because it had no attached weapons, although some could have been added later. The unfinished model is now on display at the Kubinka Tank Museum, and debates continue over what exactly it was supposed to be. The only thing that's certain, whatever it was, it wasn't successful enough for the Nazis to mass produce it. But if you think those are strange, get ready to meet the factory of the strange. Number 1. Hobart's Funnies In the latter days of the Second World War, the British Army was seeking an edge. They created a unit to develop new tanks with enhanced features that would make up for the weaknesses their standard tanks faced during amphibious raids. Some delivered, while others were more curiosities than anything else. The unit commander, Major General Percy Hobart, would enter military history for just how strange his pet vehicles were. How strange? How about a tank with a curtain of mine flails attached to it? Or maybe the double onion? a tank with a massive metal frame holding demolition charges. It would be pressed against the wall and blown via a detonating cable after the tank retreated. Most of these tanks worked, but for only one specific purpose. So after the war, the British had a collection of the oldest, most unique military vehicles ever created. And hey, they won the war, so it's a great conversation piece. Explosive poop bombs? Homemade flamethrowers? World War II weapons straight from Fallout 4? These are the 10 most badass and surprising improvised weapons ever used used in combat. Our first weapon was created due to a combination of necessity and ingenuity. It was the middle of World War II, and Hitler was finding he had made a critical mistake. The Nazi leader had invaded Russia, and the frozen climate was proving to be his undoing. Adding to his woes, the incredibly skilled Russian snipers, who seemed to be picking off his men left and right. But one man, Vasily Zayatsev, was a one-man killing machine. He killed over 400 German soldiers during the war, and he seemed to have a uniquely deadly gun, even taking out German tanks with with frightening accuracy. What was his secret? Zayatsev's gun wasn't a 
a standard sniper rifle, which couldn't pierce tank armor, and it wasn't a standard anti-tank weapon, which would have been impossible to carry as a sniper. He had created his own even deadlier weapon. He took the scope off a sniper rifle and attached it to a PTRS-41 anti-material rifle, thus combining the power of the latter with the accuracy of the former. A simple fix, but one that changed the face of combat in the war. It was one of the many feats that earned him the title Hero of the Soviet Union. But not all improvised weapons of war are so precise. Sometimes you just need an earth-shattering kaboom. It was 1948 and the new state of Israel was fighting a war on multiple fronts. They needed firepower, but with most of the world staying out of the fray, they didn't have anyone who could supply them with weapons. So they made their own, out of humble oil barrels filled with explosive payloads like fertilizer and diesel. They simply loaded onto airplanes and pushed them out, delivering a massive explosion when they hit the ground. But they had to be timed carefully. These low-tech bombs needed to have their fuse lit at the right moment so they didn't explode early. They're powerful, brutal, and controversial. While the the explosion is usually a powerful one, they can be enhanced using shrapnel or chemicals designed to wreak more havoc on the ground. Wartime regulations have since changed to regulate these weapons, but that hasn't stopped them from being used. In fact, they're currently a weapon of choice in the brutal Syrian civil war, where the regime of Bashar al-Assad has faced international condemnation for using massive barrel bombs, often two in the same location, to devastate rebel sites and often kill the people who come to tend to the wounded from the first bomb. Although dispensing justice from the air is always safer, sometimes you need to get up close and personal. The First World War was brutal. Soldiers often found themselves battling for their lives in dirty, gas-filled trenches where there was bad visibility and they only had seconds to defend themselves if they were set upon by enemy soldiers. Guns were useless in this situation, as you'd have just as much chance as hitting one of your fellow soldiers in the crossfire. Supplies were also low, so some French soldiers took to fashioning themselves small, portable stabbing weapons out of converted knives and other tools. And all it took was two simple items. First, you took a steel stake, then you attached a sharp point to it from another weapon, using an open flame to heat the stake until it was able to be bent. Carefully twist the stake until it becomes a makeshift handle that serves as both a weapon and a steel knuckle guard. The weapon was later evolved into more complicated ones that could be easily hidden in a soldier's clothes and pulled out at a second's notice to stab the enemy in the neck. Sometimes a low-tech solution is the best one. This next weapon is a bit less personal, but gives new meaning to the term fire in the hole. Need to deliver an explosive payload but don't have the technology for a rocket launcher? Soldiers have been making improvised mortars since the 16th century, and all it takes is a hole in the ground and some explosive material. You dig a simple pit in the ground, fill it with explosives originally, the simple black powder that was used to load cannons, and whatever payload you want to have sent at the enemy. You then create a fuse or a trigger that can be set off from afar, and there she blows. It's one of the more complicated weapons on the list, but it delivers. Originally, it was lit only with a sausage of cloth covered with a pitch and filled with black powder, but that was unreliable and could go off too early. Soldier Samuel Zimmerman developed the first prototype of this makeshift weapon in 1573. This version made it easier to detonate the explosive packed at the bottom of a hole. The fugas had been used by many desperate soldiers ever since. The ammo was initially rocks designed to serve as a mass catapult, but since then it's been advanced to fire shells and flammable liquid that that can deliver a deadlier payload to the enemy. It remains a popular choice because, hey, all you need to get started is a shovel. Improvised weapons are nothing new, but they've become more inventive. War is hell, something highlighted by the brutality of the Syrian civil war. The conflict between Bashar al-Assad's regime and the collection of rebel forces has been asymmetrical, with the rebels often having to resort to fighting with whatever they can find or make. Desperation breeds ingenuity, but no one could predict that this would manifest itself in the form of a cannon. The Janam, or Hell Cannon, was first sighted in 2012 and was made by the Free Syrian Army from local manufacturing plants. They didn't look like much at first sight, but they packed an explosive payload and they've only been getting better since. The first Hell Cannon was composed with a cannon barrel around 3 feet, mounted on wheels and loaded with a muzzle. This is a low-tech device. Not only does the cannon have to be loaded with explosive powder, like cannons from centuries past, but it has to be towed around like a kid's rocking horse. The projectile is just as low-tech, a gas cylinder loaded with explosives and shrapnel and attached to a metal tube. While it's a simple device made from scrap, it works well enough for several variants to be made, including one that fires four projectiles at the same time. Now let's turn the clock back to World War II when an outgunned army found a similarly low-tech and fiery solution. 
the Nazis had occupied Poland, but the Polish resistance wasn't giving up. In 1944, the Warsaw Uprising saw the Polish Home Army rise to oppose the Nazi occupation and they were packing flamethrowers. The K-pattern flamethrower was a homemade device that required soldiers get up close and personal to deliver some fiery death, with the risk of wearing the explosive device on their backs. It consisted of two connected steel fuel tanks and a compressed air bottle holding a mix of diesel fuel and gasoline. It was attached to a powerful delivery system even if it didn't look like it. The rubber fuel hose attached to the tank led to a fuel gun, which would be connected to a mesh basket wrapped by a flaming rope. When the fuel touched the flame, a powerful blaze would emerge from the gun, and it was hot and strong enough to be used against armored Nazi vehicles. It was one of the most effective do-it-yourself weapons ever used in a war. But it had its weak points. The range got shorter as more bursts were released, and it was decidedly low-tech. When people were done with the weapon, they had to extinguish it manually by pressing a tin can onto the rope. And it wasn't the only time the Polish resistance delivered with limited resources. One of the biggest challenges of the Polish resistance was that the years of Nazi occupation had stripped them of many of their resources, and that left them with few weapons that could keep up with Nazi firepower. This was probably by design, but it didn't stop them from thinking outside the box. In 1942, an engineer named Václav Zavrotny came up with a design for a low-cost machine gun that would allow them to compete with a larger army, one that could be made for cheap in small workshops, staying under the radar of the Nazis. It was successful, more than anyone expected. The design was based on existing submachine guns, but was put together in some unconventional ways. Instead of being bolted and well welded together, it was put together with screws and thread. Despite these flaws, it was reliable and surprisingly hardy, and was designed to use the same bullets as the German MP40, so they could reload by picking up any stray ammunition they found. Suddenly, the Germans were facing guns with the same firepower of their own. The Polish army was so pleased with the design that it became the only home-built weapon to be put into mass production. Now let's turn back the clock to a time when even bolted together submachine guns were too advanced. During the samurai era of Japan, being a warrior came with many privileges. To differentiate the general populace from the warriors, rules were put into place to limit civilian possession of weapons. The traditional weapons of the samurai were illegal for commoners, but that didn't stop them from fighting back. The farmers of Okinawa took the scythes they used to clear their crops and turn them on the oppressive samurai, creating a whole martial arts style based around the use of simple weapons like the scythe or kama. Many samurai didn't know what hit them. It would become a common low-cost weapon, one that stood the test of time. The war scythe would then show up again throughout history as an easy way for people to fight back or take the war to the upper classes. It became commonly known as a peasant weapon, one that became a symbol of the Russian Revolution. But its biggest display of its power was in the Polish January 1863 uprising, when a large group of soldiers named scythemen took to the battlefield armed with sharp reaping blades on poles. These long-range weapons took their enemies by surprise, although the heavy weapons were slow and exhausting to use use. On the opposite end of the spectrum, when the war gets too advanced, what do you do if you lack military hardware? You make it. Tanks are the ultimate weapon of modern warfare, letting armies deliver mighty payloads and a steady stream of gunfire from behind a powerful armored vehicle that can run right over enemy barricades. But what if you're the underdog and you don't have military hardware? This was the case for the rebels in the Syrian civil war, which made it all the more surprising when they showed up with a tank of their own. The Sham II cut an imposing figure, and its turret-mounted machine gun delivered some heavy heavy fire, but behind the tank was a surprising secret. Where did the rebels get the tank? They didn't. They made it by putting the armor plating on top of the chassis of a standard automobile. The machine gun was powerful and controlled from within, but it was hooked up to an unconventional control device, a video game controller. Maybe it's the rebel leader's gamer nephew's chance to shine. While the Sham 2 doesn't have the same power or endurance as a standard tank, it certainly is easier to put together on short notice. But sometimes all it takes for a quantum leap in weapons technology is a little ingenuity and a tin can. It was World War I, and Australian William Charles Scurry was a humble private in the Gallipoli campaign. Things weren't going well, and the decision was made to evacuate the peninsula. The troops had to get out of there safely, but this would make them sitting ducks as soon as the enemy knew they were no longer firing. Scurry and his friend Bunty Lawrence had an idea, a gun that fired itself, but how to make a non-automatic rifle act like one? It was a low-tech solution to a high-tech problem. They took a rifle and attached it to a device made of two corned beef tins. Water would drip from the top tin to the bottom tin, which was attached to the trigger of the rifle. When the tin reached a certain weight, it would pull the trigger and fire a shot. It wasn't an accurate weapon and never hit a target, but what it did do was make the Turkish soldiers think that the area was still defended. Scurry received the Distinguished Conduct Medal for his device and went on to a long career in the military, but he'd always get remembered for his tin can gun. World War I might have signaled the dawn of a true revolution in military hardware, but it was still filled with some of the craziest and weirdest weapons
Americans ever seen on the battlefield, and one American weapon was so terrifying that Germany threatened to execute any POW discovered with it. Tsar Tank Russian Empire Our first weird weapon of World War I never actually made it to the battlefield, but it was so weird and would have been so terrifying that it deserves a mention. In the years before World War I, militaries around the world were starting to put the internal combustion engine to the test in an attempt to develop awesome new weapons of military might. Russian engineer Nikolai Lebedenko, however, might have had the absolute craziest idea of them all. In essence, Lebedenko invented the Ferris wheel from hell, a massive tank far outsizing even the largest tanks of World War II, which instead of using tracks, was driven by two massive wheels, with a third smaller wheel to stabilize it in the rear. The idea first got the attention of the Russian Tsar when Lebedenko made a tiny prototype with a spring motor, which he wound and then let loose in front of several thick books. The tiny tank managed to climb the books with ease, thoroughly impressing the Russian leader. Almost immediately, he authorized the equivalent of tens of millions of dollars for research and development. In theory, the Tsar tank solved the problem of trying to move a vehicle through a battlefield with a brilliantly simple solution. Make wheels big enough that they can climb over any obstacle. Thus, the tank had two massive wheels out in front extending off two separate arms. In the rear, a third arm ended in a much smaller wheel which would help stabilize the vehicle. The body of the tank would be thin and vertical, much unlike anything we might think of as resembling a traditional tank, and would have multiple levels where soldiers could fire cannons and machine guns. With the Tsar's funding, the Russian army built a single prototype in 1914. Two 250 horsepower engines powered each of the massive wheels, but all that power was delivered very inefficiently to the wheels, resulting in a loss of capability. More critically, however, was the miscalculation concerning the rear unpowered wheel. Because of the way weight was distributed on the massive tank, the rear wheel ended up bearing too much of the vehicle's weight, which resulted in it frequently becoming stuck. Even more practical concerns plagued the prototype, though, such as the fact that the tank crew's fields of fire were severely limited by the dual massive wheels out in front of the vehicle, which were themselves extremely vulnerable to being damaged by enemy fire. The prototype saw a single demonstration, during which it became stuck. And just like that, the Russian Ferris wheel from hell was cancelled forever. In our opinion, the Russians should have stuck with it, and instead of arming the thing with machine guns and cannons, they should have just slapped some giant speakers on it and blasted out nightmarish carnival tunes as the massive tanks careened toward enemy soldiers. World War I might have been the only conflict in human history to use weapons and mass that were obsolete for thousands of years, though. Trench Raiding Clubs allies and central powers. Sometimes, progress goes in reverse, and nothing attests to the sheer brutality of World War I than the Trench Club, a weapon borrowed straight from the dawn of warfare. The Trench Club was carried by troops conducting nighttime raids on enemy trenches. Because rifles would cause too much noise, those daring raiders needed weapons that could kill quickly and very, very violently. Enter the Trench Club. Literally just that, a club. Soldiers would use them to bash enemy infantry to bits in daring nighttime raids. The goals of these raids was to destroy enemy weapon and supply depots, take prisoners, and gather intelligence, rather than a serious attempt to actually take and hold territory. Thus, raiders would ditch their traditional rifles and pistols, which would give them away, and opt for a more brutal way of killing up close and personal, but very quietly. Trench clubs varied in design and were largely ad hoc weapons. Like something out of the 1979's The Warriors, these clubs would be outfitted with spikes and nails driven through them to enhance their lethality. Boards wrapped in barbed wire or simply embedded with random bits of sharpened metal also made for effective trench clubs. The sheer variety of trench clubs was staggering, and some soldiers opted to go full-on Dark Souls and even craft homemade flails complete with spiked balls. Clubs were excellent weapons for brutal trench warfare, but one American weapon was so effective that Germany threatened to execute any American POW armed with it, the shotgun. USA Shotguns may seem ubiquitous today, but when Germany came face to face with American troops armed with shotguns, they were so horrified with the results that they'd issued a diplomatic protest against their use. The United States had been using shotguns in combat since 1900, when 200 shotguns were sent to the Philippines to aid U.S. troops in fighting off Moro tribesmen. The Moro warriors would frequently rush American soldiers, forcing them into hand-to-hand -hand combat, where they had the advantage and rifles were largely useless. All that changed with the issuing of the Winchester Model 1897 to U.S. troops. As World War I raged on, American observers kept close tabs on the fighting and quickly learned how brutal trench combat was. They put this knowledge to good use, and when 
When America inevitably joined the fighting, she brought with her soldiers armed with modified Model 1987s, more than ready for savage close quarters combat. These specially modified shotguns had a heat shield that would keep the soldier's hand off the barrel, which would heat up during intense and prolonged firing. An additional modification was to add a bayonet lug on which an M1917 bayonet could be affixed. The barrel was shortened to 20 inches, and soldiers were issued with buckshot ammunition. These trench loads contained nine 00 buckshot pellets, making the Model 1897 a veritable cannon in the tight quarters of European trenches. A modified action which allowed the soldier to keep the trigger depressed while working the action meant that the 1897 could unload its five-round load in rapid succession, which quickly earned it the nickname of the Trench Sweeper. The weapons were so devastatingly effective that Germany soon launched an official diplomatic protest against America, citing the 1907 Hague Convention on Land Warfare, which forbade the use of weapons designed to cause unnecessary suffering. After careful consideration, Judge Advocate General of the Army Secretary of State Robert Lansing decided the law did not apply to American shotguns. The reply enraged the Germans, who threatened to retaliate on any captured American troops found to be wielding shotguns. The U.S. responded by threatening to retaliate in kind against German troops equipped with flamethrowers and serrated bayonets. World War I was largely fought in the trenches, and if you thought trench clubs were insane, wait until you see the next item on our list. Gauntlet Dagger World War I might have been the most peculiar conflict in human history. On one hand, the fruits of the Industrial Revolution had yielded weapons that changed the face of war forever, such as the machine gun and the tank. On the other, the war still often devolved into the most crude and ancient forms of fighting imaginable, and the Gauntlet Dagger is yet another such example. This weapon consisted of a large metal gauntlet that was worn over the wearer's hand and forearm. The sheet metal protected the wielder from enemy knives and bayonets, and inside of the gauntlet itself was a crossbar that the wielder would grip with his hand. A long metal spike protruded from the end of the gauntlet, which would be used to repeatedly stab one's foes. Hooks on the sides of the gauntlet would allow the wearer to lace it up tightly onto their arm, securing it in place even in the heaviest of fighting. While the weapon would prohibit the use of a rifle, it was a devastating close quarters weapon meant to be used in trench raiding. However, if we had our choice of a gauntlet dagger or an American shotgun, we'd gladly take the latter. With the introduction of the airplane, Allied and Central Power Pilots were quick to come up with a very weird but terrifying use for it. Aerial darts, French, Germans, and British. In World War I, the airplane was slowly defining its role on the battlefield. Initially used as an aerial scout, eventually airplanes became armed so they could shoot down other airplanes and enemy airships. Recognizing the potential in a machine that could deliver an explosive payload to the enemy from directly above, airplanes were even fitted with bombs. However, these early airplanes didn't have the power to carry aloft significant loads. The Italians, however, saw a solution to this problem in 1911 and developed the aerial dart, weighing far less than a bomb, an airplane could carry several hundred of these wickedly sharp long metal spikes. Stabilized by everything from small fins to feathers, the darts would be used to saturate an enemy formation. The French were the first to use them in World War I, with canisters full of the darts attached to the underside of an aircraft. The pilot would fly very high over an enemy formation and pull a wire which would open the canister holding the darts. The released darts would then begin to fall from tremendous height, picking up speed and energy as they fell. The result was devastating, as the long thin darts could easily penetrate steel helmets if dropped from high enough, and deliver long, thin wounds that penetrated deep and resulted in severe internal damage. Aerial darts would be equipped by both sides aboard their airplanes and airships, dropped by the thousands over enemy lines. One French pilot alone dropped 18,000 darts in a single day in 1915. However, the darts soon grew out of favor with both the Central and Allied war planners. The biggest problem with the darts was that they were completely unguided, and largely relied on blind luck to actually strike their targets. Because pilots would have to fly at great heights to ensure the darts gained enough speed to become lethal, their accuracy was greatly diminished. Even when used against enemy airships, the darts simply proved ineffective. Their greatest flaw, however, was the fact that the darts needed to score a direct hit to be lethal, as the darts fell with such speed that they'd embed themselves harmlessly into the soil if they missed. Eventually, the darts were phased out, though they were still in limited use in 1917. Necessity is the mother of invention, and the need to not get one's head blown off led to the invention of the weirdest rifles in history. Paris scope rifle, central and allied powers. When World War I began, Germany assumed it would be a brief, bloody conflict. However, both the central and allied powers seriously misunderstood how the machine gun had completely changed the face of war forever. With the ability to put out hundreds of rounds of ammunition a minute, these early machine guns may not have been terribly accurate, but they rarely ever needed to be. Mass infantry charges would be absolutely decimated by machine gun fire, with men cut down in the dozens. Trench warfare was the inevitable result, as the machine
machine gun ground the conflict to all but a complete halt. Troops became stuck in their trenches, unable to undertake any sort of offensive action without overwhelming numbers. The trench war had become so deadly that even lifting one's head up and out of the trench for a quick look could be a good way to get your ticket punched. Both sides employed snipers whose sole job was to demoralize the enemy by taking out any soldier unwary or foolish enough to expose themselves. The periscope rifle was thus quickly developed by inventors on both sides as a way of allowing friendly forces the ability to fire on the enemy without exposing the soldier doing the firing. The rifles varied in design but had very common elements. The rifles would be fitted to a frame of some sort which could be used to prop the weapon up and over the trench. A periscope consisting of a reflective mirror would allow a soldier to look down the weapon's sights even from several feet below. The great weight of the frame also helped to stabilize the weapon, and most rifles would be fitted with specially modified magazines, holding many times more rounds than normal. The weapons were surprisingly effective, and despite their clumsy appearance, could be accurate upwards of a few hundred yards, though modern recreations make it probable that the weapon was only truly accurate up to 100 yards. The weapon was so effective though that during the Gallipoli campaign, British forces completely abandoned the use of traditional rifles during the daytime. The inventor of one of the first periscope rifles used by the British was even awarded 100 pounds, about $4,000 in today's currency, after the war by the British War Office for his great contribution to the war effort. The periscope rifle design became so popular that eventually machine guns were modified to operate in a similar manner. Incredibly, even pistols received a trench upgrade, which makes more sense than it might seem at first, considering that sometimes opposing trenches were as close as five yards apart. John Wilkes Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald, Charles Guiteau, and Leon Chogos. Their names went down in infamy as the men who killed presidents, but other would-be assassins faded into history because their targets survived. These are the 10 failed assassinations that didn't quite hit their target. Number 10. Canadian Prime Minister's Close Call Jean Chrétien was the Prime Minister of Canada for 10 years, a well-regarded Liberal Party mainstay. He didn't have many enemies that people knew of, but one young man from Quebec was developing a disturbing obsession. André Dallaire was a a paranoid schizophrenic who had quit his job after stealing from the grocery store and soon disappeared off the map. When he next serviced, he arrived at 24 Sussex Drive, the home of the Canadian Prime Minister, holding a pocket knife, and quickly broke in while Chrétien and his wife were sleeping. They seemed like sitting ducks, but Dallier made one miscalculation. The would-be assassin hadn't planned out his kill too well. With only one small weapon, he was surprised when Aline Chrétien spotted him, woke her husband, and locked them both in the bedroom. She called the police and tried to convince the groggy Prime Minister that she wasn't dreaming about the the intruder. Dallier never tried to break down the door and was wandering around the house when the police arrived. He was found not guilty due to reason of insanity and committed to a mental asylum before being released to a group home. The Chrétiens were unharmed, but the incident led to many people arguing that Canada's PM needed better security. But this next assassination attempt was much more high-tech. Number 9. Khalid Michel's Bad Earache Khalid Michel had made himself no shortage of enemies by 1997. The leader of the Palestinian militant group Hamas, he was seen as an avowed enemy of Israel and a thorn in the side of Jordan, where he lived since fleeing Israel after the Six-Day War. He organized frequent terror attacks against Israel from the safety of Jordan, culminating in the bombing of Jerusalem Market that killed 16. Israel's security forces quickly responded, sending Mossad agents into Jordan to assassinate Michel, their weapon of choice, an aerosol poison that they sprayed into his ear. The only problem? Getting back out. The poison worked and Michel quickly became very sick. It looked like the Mossad operation would be successful, but the agents had been captured by Michel's bodyguards, and so began a tense negotiation between Israel and Jordan. King Hussein of Jordan demanded Israel turn over the antidote, while Israel demanded the release of their agents. It took the intervention of US President Bill Clinton to convince Israel's Prime Minister to turn over the antidote before the recent peace deal between the two countries fell apart, and Michel lived, only to be expelled from Jordan several years later by Hussein's successor. Almost 20 years earlier, the United States was nearly upended by a movie fan? Number 8. Ronald Reagan's Cliffhanger When Ronald Reagan swept into office in a 1980 landslide, he was already controversial as one of the most conservative presidents in modern history. But his closest call with death didn't come from a political enemy. It came from a deranged man named John Hinckley, who was obsessed with teen movie star Jodie Foster. He wanted to be noticed by her, so he decided to become famous in 1981 by stalking President Reagan and ambushing him after a speech, shooting him along with his press secretary, a policeman, and a Secret Service agent. It was a tragically familiar scenario, but with an unexpected outcome. It had only been 18 years since the last presidential assassination, but medical science had advanced a lot. Lot. Reagan's injuries were serious, including a punctured lung and internal bleeding, but surgeons were able to save his life and he left the hospital two weeks later. Ultimately, none of the four victims died, but the controversy over this incident was far from over. Hinckley would later be found not guilty by reason of insanity and would spend the next 36 years in a mental hospital before being declared rehabilitated. But several 
100 years earlier, a much larger assassination plot was hatched. Number 7. Of Gunpowder, Treason, and Plot It was 1605 and King James I sat on the throne of England with no small amount of controversy. The country's Roman Catholics had been repressed ever since the ascent of the Church of England, and a militant group sought to overthrow the king and replace him with his nine-year-old daughter as a Catholic queen. While the plot was led by Robert Catsby, it would be more associated with one radical member, the veteran and explosives expert Guy Fox. The target of their plot? The entire structure of government, by blowing up the House of Lords at the ceremonial opening of Parliament. But sometimes the biggest plot can be undone by a single spanner in the works. It was October 26, 1605, when William Parker, the fourth Baron of Monteagle, received an anonymous letter explaining the entire plot. Was it a conspirator with second thoughts, or a loyalist who stumbled upon the plot? It's never been discovered, but when the House of Lords was searched, they found Fox guarding 36 barrels of gunpowder, more than enough to obliterate the entire building. While the conspirators attempted to flee London, several were shot and killed by pursuing officers, and the others, including the notorious Fox, were executed for treason. And even 500 years later, the anniversary of the foiling of the plot has become a popular British festival. The next assassination was foiled by an unfortunate fact of nature. Number 6. FDR's Short Shot Franklin Delano Roosevelt had just been elected in a landslide, and many feared he would be a radical left-wing president. Rumors abounded of a planned coup by bankers and businessmen, but only one assassination plot actually emerged, and it was anything but a well-organized plot. Giuseppe Zangara was a struggling Italian immigrant who suffered from chronic pain and couldn't keep a job. The exact nature of his grudge against Roosevelt is unknown, but 17 days before the president elects inauguration, he attended a speech of his in Miami while carrying a revolver with the intent to kill. But he needed an accessory, and that would be his undoing. Zangara was a short man, only 5 feet tall, and he needed a clear shot at Roosevelt, so he pulled out an old metal folding chair and stood on top of it to get a clean shot. As soon as he fired his first shot, bystanders grabbed him and yanked him down. Zangara fired wildly into the crowd, hitting five people, none of them the president-elect Roosevelt. The one fatality? The mayor of Chicago, Anton Cernak. While Zangara hadn't killed the president, he did kill a prominent politician, and that was enough to send him to the electric chair after only 10 days on death row. But FDR wasn't the only Roosevelt to have a close call with death. Number 5. The Longest Speech of Theodore Roosevelt It was 1912, and a former president, Theodore Roosevelt, was attempting a comeback. Always controversial, Roosevelt had made many new enemies with his decision to leave the Republicans and start his own Bull Moose Party. But his deadliest enemy wouldn't be a political enemy, but a former saloon keeper named John Schrank. Schrank had hallucinated the late President William McKinley in a dream who supposedly told him to avenge his assassination by going after Roosevelt, who ascended to the presidency after McKinley's death. And so Schrank stalked Roosevelt to the Gilpatrick Hotel, where Roosevelt was having dinner before speech. As Roosevelt waved to the crowd, Schrank took aim and fired, but he underestimated the grit of Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt was hit, with the bullet passing through his eyeglass case and lodging in his chest, but not deep enough to penetrate any vital organs. Bleeding but still conscious, Roosevelt kept the crowd from lynching Schrank, then assured his bodyguards that he was fine and asked to be driven to his speech. He spoke for 90 minutes before agreeing to receive medical attention, including the famous line, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you fully understand that I have just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Interviews with Schrank after the assassination attempt indicated that he had delusions of grandeur and he was declared to be unfit to stand trial and institutionalized until his death in 1943. But one would-be assassin had a much more destructive plan. Number 4. Terror from the Air Samuel Bick was an unlikely choice for a would-be presidential assassin. A former army veteran who was honorably discharged and a father of four children, he seemed like a stable man, but after a divorce and financial troubles, he spiraled into depression. He became obsessed with the Nixon administration and blamed them for his financial woes, even sending them threatening letters over being denied for a loan. But the Secret Service considered him harmless and dismissed the case. He turned out to be anything but harmless in 1974. Bick planned to assassinate Nixon, but he didn't want to just be another gunman. He decided to hijack a plane and crash it into the White House. He stole a revolver from a friend, built a homemade bomb, and made several audio tapes full of rambling justifications for his attack. At the Baltimore-Washington International Airport, he shot and killed a policeman before boarding the Delta flight to Atlanta. He would then shoot the pilots when they told him he couldn't take off yet, and then ordered a passenger to fly the plane. Before he could take off, he was surrounded by police. Police shot and wounded him, and Bick shot himself before they could arrest him. In the end, one of America's most ambitious would-be assassins was undone by one simple problem. It's not that easy to steal a plane, but sometimes a much smaller problem can derail an assassination. Number 3. The Double Unlucky Assassin It was 1835, and the relatively new United States had not seen an assassination attempt. That was about the change with the ascent of a controversial populist Andrew Jackson to the presidency. Richard Lawrence was a simple house painter, but over the years, his behavior changed to become more violent and erratic. Many speculate that the chemicals in the paint might have contributed to his mental illness, and he became convinced that he was owed money from the 
US government. He blamed Andrew Jackson's opposition to a national bank, but in reality, it was more likely because he wasn't actually an English king who died centuries ago, as he believed. But these delusions grew more severe, as he started stalking Jackson until he planned to ambush him at a congressman's funeral with two pistols. But he was about to become very famous for a different reason. In 1835, presidential security was rudimentary, and Lawrence was easily able to get close to Jackson. He stepped out, aimed his pistol, and fired at the president, and the gun misfired. He quickly drew a second pistol, only for it to misfire as well. Old guns were vulnerable to moisture, and the weather that day was damp. But Lawrence had no chance to fix the problem, because President Jackson began beating him with his cane. The crowd eventually intervened, but it's not clear whose life they were saving. At his trial, Lawrence was obviously not well, still insisting he was Richard III, and quickly sent to an insane asylum for the rest of his life. This next assassination attempt was right out of an action movie. Number 2. The Wild Ride of Charles de Gaulle Charles de Gaulle had a long and storied career in French politics, which was approaching its last act in the 1960s. But he made some powerful enemies when he decided to accept Algeria's declaration of independence and end its status as a French colony. The OAS, or Organisation de l'Armée Secrète, was a far-right parliamentary group formed during the Algerian War, and they saw de Gaulle as a traitor. They made several attempts on de Gaulle's life, but it was the third that would become the most famous. Led by a prominent French veteran and engineer, Jean-Bastien Thierry, who served as lookout, three shooters armed with machine guns followed de Gaulle's entourage and opened fire. What happened next was one of the craziest escapes from an assassination in history. High-powered automatic weapons strafed de Gaulle's car with bullets, along with countless nearby shops. But de Gaulle, his wife, and his entire entourage escaped unharmed, despite 14 bullet holes being found in the car. De Gaulle would credit his tough-as-nail Citroën DS car. But whether it was the car or just good luck, he would serve several more years as France's president. Bastien Thierry, meanwhile, would go on before a military tribunal and ultimately become the final French convict to face a firing squad. Many failed assassinations spared a prominent leader, but this final one had the chance to end a world war. Number 1. The July 20th Plot It was 1944, and it was becoming clear that Nazi Germany was losing the war. The German war machine put the blame squarely in one direction, the absolute dictator of Germany, Adolf Hitler. Some of his top military men believed Hitler's crimes against humanity were a disgrace to the country, and they wished to restore the country's First World War prestige. The plot had been building when it was joined by Lieutenant Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, a wounded veteran and arch conservative who would ultimately lead the assassination attempt. But it was about to go terribly wrong. The plan had many layers. First, von Stauffenberg would assassinate Hitler with a planted bomb. The many members of the German military leadership would quickly spread the word that Hitler was dead and use that opportunity to install a new government led by aristocrats and military leaders that would be able to win the war. But after von Stauffenberg planted the bomb, a colonel accidentally moved it, shielding Hitler and leading him to only be injured. The coup failed as soon as word got out that Hitler was still alive. The conspirators were arrested and almost 5,000 were executed including von Stauffenberg and many political enemies of Hitler, as the mad dictator's regime would continue for another 10 months. It's the world's most technologically advanced military. It's also home to equipment almost 100 years old. These are some of the oldest weapons still in operation in the US military. M2 Browning 50 caliber machine gun been the United States' premier heavy machine gun for a whopping 89 years, and it's not looking to retire anytime soon. Designed in 1918 and adopted by the US military in 1933, the M2 packs a formidable 50 caliber bullet fired at a muzzle velocity of 890 meters per second. It has a maximum range of 7,400 meters and an effective range of 1,800 meters. This machine gun is powerful enough to punch through even some armored vehicles, and that's exactly what it was originally meant to do. At the end of World War I, more heavily armored planes were being put into the air, with the German Junkers J.I. sporting an armor that made traditional aircraft machine guns largely ineffective. General John J. Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Force, requested the Army Ordnance Department develop a heavier machine gun capable of punching through improved aircraft armor. His request was for a machine gun capable of firing a minimum 50 caliber round at a minimum muzzle velocity of 820 meters per second. John M. Browning began redesigning his 30-06 M 1917 machine gun to be capable of firing a heavier round requested by General Pershing. On October 15, 1918, Browning's first prototype was tested. Though it achieved a less than stellar performance with a firing rate of less than 500 rounds a minute and a muzzle velocity of only 700 meters per second. To make matters worse, the weapon was very heavy compared to lower caliber models, was difficult to control when firing fully automatic, and was too weak to punch through armor while firing too slowly to be effective against enemy infantry. Browning got unexpected aid when a shipment of German T. Gewehr 1918 anti-tank rifles and their ammunition were seized by American forces. The German rounds had an 800 grain bullet with a muzzle velocity of 820 meters a second and could penetrate one inch of armor at 230 meters. Using the German rounds as inspiration, Winchester worked on improving the 50 calibers cartridge, eventually 
eventually leading to an effective round that achieved most of what the Army had requested of it. From 1921 to 1937, American aircraft were equipped with an experimental water-cooled version of the machine gun. These trials helped to refine the various versions of what would become the M2, formerly adopted by the United States before World War II. By the time the war broke out, the machine gun was standard on nearly every American aircraft and was used in everything from anti-material to infantry support and even air defense roles. Today, the 50 caliber enjoys service alongside American troops in every theater of operations and has been involved in every American conflict since World War II. Modern 50 calibers can be equipped with several different types of ammunition, including M33 ball rounds for personal and light material targets, M17 tracer, M8 armor penetrating incendiary, M20 armor penetrating incendiary tracers, and newer sabotaged light armor penetrator rounds capable of punching through 1.34 inches of steel armor at 500 meters. The M2, nicknamed the 50 or Mod Deuce, is such a good weapon it outperformed an intended replacement in the 60s, and a current modern replacement for the weapon was canceled. This means the US military will continue carrying the fearsome M2 into battle for decades more to come. Our next weapon system is not as old as the M2, but current plans are to keep it in operation for almost an entire century. CH-47 Chinook It was a helicopter born of necessity. Caught up in a war waged across inhospitable jungles with few roads, the US Army desperately needed a way to quickly supply firebases spread across Vietnam. Most importantly, though, it needed to be able to supply those far-flung firebases with heavy equipment such as artillery. But cutting a road through the thick jungle would take years, and even then, the unpredictable weather and enemy ambushes could make such a journey impossible. The United States invented air assault operations during Vietnam with its extensive fleet of helicopters and quickly stopped to do the same with logistical concerns. However, current helicopters in the US inventory were simply not powerful enough to carry heavy howitzers. Fortuitously, though, a twin-rotor transport helicopter had already been in development since 1957 to replace the Sikorsky CH-37 Mojave. The resulting V-107 was deemed too heavy for assault operations but too light for transport missions. Thus, work was undertaken to develop a larger, beefier helicopter capable of heavy transport duty. In 1962, the CH-47 Chinook officially joined the inventory of the US Army armed forces. Despite its massive size, the Chinook has an impressive speed of 200 miles per hour and at the time was faster than any other utility or even attack helicopter. Today, the Chinook keeps that speed record, making it one of the fastest helicopters in the US inventory. Throughout its lifetime, the airframe has received numerous upgrades to keep it up to date with new technology, but the core design remains largely unchanged. With two powerful rotors, the Chinook can carry up to 55 fully equipped combat troops or as much as 10 tons of cargo either inside or slung underneath it on cargo hooks. The helicopter would prove its worth through every US conflict since Vietnam, but really shown during the war in Afghanistan. With its difficult and mountainous terrain, Afghanistan proved to be a challenge for the US Army carrying out resupply and mobility operations, but the Chinook was easily able to navigate even the extreme heights of Afghanistan's mountains with ease. The Chinook continues going strong 60 years after being adopted into the US inventory. The Army's future vertical lift program will eventually deliver a replacement for the Chinook, but will focus first on a replacement for the UH-60 Blackhawk. In the meantime, future upgrades will keep the Chinook in operation for a predicted 99 years. Our next weapon is not just old, but proved to be so good at its job that its use was even expanded within the US military. Carl Gustav Recoilless Rifle In service since 1946, the Carl Gustav 8.4cm recoilless rifle is perhaps the most successful anti-tank weapon ever made, and the US military plans on continuing to use it for a long time. The Carl Gustav M1 was developed in 1946 by Hugo Abramson and Harold Jeans at the Royal Swedish Arms Administration. The weapon was developed with the help of knowledge gained from the operation of American bazookas, British Piats, and German Panzerschreck during the war, building on the strengths of each while making its own innovations. The greatest of these innovations was the use of a rifle barrel to spin-stabilize an explosive round, negating the need for a projectile to be outfitted with fins and thus reduce reducing weight and improving performance. Another improvement over the Allied and German World War II anti-tank weapons came in the form of developing the weapon as a recoilless system. A recoilless weapon ejects countermass from the rear of the weapon to negate the effect of recoil when firing. This allows the weapon to be much more accurate and to fire a larger projectile, while making the firing unit lighter and easier to use. Today, the Carl Gustav is an extremely economical solution for the anti-tank and anti-material needs of any infantry unit, with a unit cost of just $20,000 and an ammo cost that ranges from 500 to 3,000 depending on the round, the weapon can fire up to 6 rounds a minute with a 
crew of two, though it can be operated by just one soldier at a reduced rate of fire. It's also capable of accurately hitting moving vehicles at a range of up to 400 meters, stationary targets up to 500 meters, and can use high explosive rounds with a range of 1,000 meters, or rocket-boosted laser-guided ammunition at a range of up to a whopping 2,000 meters. The US military initially only issued the weapon to special operations forces, but it was so good at its job, it expanded the use of the Carl Gustav to regular forces as well. With US forces being engaged by RPGs at ranges up to 900 meters, no light weapon in the inventory of US infantry could effectively counter this threat. Thus, the M3 multi-role anti-armor anti-tank weapon system variant of the Carl Gustav quickly came into wide adoption. Along with wider adoption came an increased variety in ammunition, which quickly made the M3 a favorite of US infantry. Today, the Carl Gustav can fire high-explosive rounds, high-explosive anti-tank rounds, high-explosive anti-tank rocket-assisted rounds for increased range, high-explosive dual-purpose rounds for engaging enemy vehicles and structures, area defense rounds for engaging large numbers of enemy troops, anti-structure rounds for destroying enemy buildings, smoke rounds for creating a thick smoke screen, and illumination rounds for lighting up large swaths of grounds at night. The Carl Gustav is so good at its job there is no planned replacement in the pipeline, and instead it continues to be upgraded with even more modern projectiles and electronics. Our next aircraft has been the workhorse of the American Air Force for 65 years and looks to continue that role for another 30, the C-130 Hercules. During the Cold War, the United States knew it could be forced to fight in the most destructive conflict mankind could ever wage. Given the unprecedented destruction of even a non-nuclear conflict between itself and the Soviet Union, the US needed to ensure it could still resupply forces across a devastated Europe. To that end, it called upon the C-130 Hercules, possibly the world's most rugged and versatile cargo aircraft. Its primary selling point was its ability to operate out of makeshift airfields, a key concern for a US military facing a very real probability of having Allied airfields knocked out of commission by Soviet forces. Its requirements, however, were set in the years after the Korean War, when the US realized it needed it needed dedicated military cargo aircraft and not models adapted from civilian use. The C-130 would be specifically designed to be a modern military cargo plane with a capacity of 92 passengers or 72 combat troops. Alternatively, it could fit 64 paratroopers and all of the equipment they need instead. The use of four turboprop engines gave the aircraft greater range and gas mileage than a turbojet variant and explains why it remains in use throughout the modern age. With few core design changes, the C-130 remains in service with various configurations, including the vaunted AC-130 gunship, the modern C-130J Super Hercules, featuring improved avionics, new engines, new composite propellers, and other modern updates, ski-equipped variants for ice operations, and the tactical airlift and aerial refueling variant in use by the US Marine Corps. Maritime patrol versions are in service with the US Coast Guard, and a ruggedized version of the Hercules is used in the deployment and retrieval of special operations forces. The C-130 remains in service not just in the US military, but in militaries around the world, and looks set to continue serving with its home nation until the US Air Force completes its CX Next Generation Airlifter program. Our next entry in this list is not just one of the oldest serving weapons in the US inventory, but is scheduled to have a lifetime in excess of 100 years. The B-52 Stratofortress Strategic Bomber it can level a small town all on its own, and it can fly a whopping one-third of the way around the Earth without refueling to do so. It's the United States' big stick, the B-52 Stratofortress. Its origins herald back to 1945, just two months after the end of World War II. The United States was already looking ahead to the next conflict. The Air Material Command put out requests to aircraft manufacturers for what would become the heavy bomber of the future. This aircraft would need to carry out missions far from home and operate without the aid of advanced bases in other countries. In other words, this big bomber needed to have a great enough range that it could strike anywhere in the world without worrying about securing ground bases in other countries to do so. It was to have a crew of at least five turret gunners to defend the aircraft and a six-man relief crew for long-range and long-duration missions. The aircraft would need to cruise at a minimum of 300 miles per hour at a height of 40 3,000 feet and be capable of hitting targets 5,000 miles away. For defense, it would carry 20mm cannons, and on the offense, it would drop 10,000 pounds high explosives. For the next several years, Boeing and the US military would go back and forth on design changes, finally landing on the B-52 we recognize today in 1952. The aircraft would go on to break many records, shockingly even speed records, setting a world speed record of 560.705 miles per hour in 1958, only to be broken that same day by another B-52 flying at 597.675 miles per hour. That speedy bomber would eventually be outrun by a smaller jet aircraft, but the big plane continued to set and break records in endurance with a whopping 12,532-mile unrefueled flight in 1962. With the support of aerial tankers, though, B-52s were able to circle the globe non 
non-stop in just under two days. This incredible reach and endurance quickly earned the planes a nuclear mission, and to this day remains part of the US nuclear triad. However, it's the conventional firepower that makes the B-52 the undisputed kings of the sky. With the ability to drop a whopping 70,000 pounds of explosives on any target around the world, modern upgrades to the fleet include new engines and wing structure replacements, electro-optical sensors, and infrared and advanced targeting pods. B-52s are now capable of such precise strikes that they were used commonly as close air support platforms for coalition forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, delivering overwhelming firepower with pinpoint accuracy. Originally meant to saturate a target with dumb gravity bombs, modern B-52s use a suite of onboard sensors to monitor a battlefield and deliver precision fire exactly where it's needed most. Laser-guided bombs can be guided to a target by a B-52 or allied aircraft, or even by forces on the ground. GPS-guided munitions can be fired and forgotten by a loitering B-52, and the development of long-range standoff attack munitions can give the B-52 an incredible reach even in contested air environments by staying well out of the reach of enemy weapons and sensors. With even more upgrades to come, the American B-52 fleet is set to remain in operation for an estimated additional 50 years, with some estimates placing the B-52 total lifetime at 150 years. That means that by the year 2100, B-52s could still be flying as part of America's arsenal. They were the two largest conflicts in human history, and the weapons used in both conflicts shaped warfare for generations to come. But how do the deadliest weapons of World War I and World War II compare? First, we're starting off with the First World War with an invention that was meant to protect cattle, but was almost immediately adopted for military use – barbed wire. The first patent for a form of barbed wire fencing was issued to Léonce Grassin Baladon in 1860s France, but it was an American and Illinois farmer Joseph F. Gilden who is credited with inventing barbed wire as we know it today. His invention was one of necessity. How do you keep 500-pound cows and bulls from roaming away and escaping or getting themselves into trouble? You could use traditional rock fencing or heavy post fencing, though both were very labor and time intensive to create, not to mention expensive for a poor farmer. Gildan's solution was brilliantly simple. He simply strung up two twisted strands of wire that had evenly spaced sharpened barbs in place. The twisted strands guaranteed that when an animal pushed against the fencing to try to escape, it would be met with many sharp barbs. The pain from the barbs would immediately deter even the angriest bull from trying to break through the fence. The fence could be mass-produced, thus lowering cost, and a small team could install hundreds of yards of fencing in a single day. It was a brilliant solution that almost immediately caught the attention of military commanders around the world. Barbed wire saw use in every major conflict in the turn of the 20th century, though it came to particularly devilish use during the First World War. While the machine gun was responsible for the trench warfare tactics we saw in the conflict and is seen as the most influential weapon of the war, few knew that without barbed wire the machine gun would have been far less effective than it ended up being and it was all in the way that it was deployed. As an offensive weapon, barbed wire is useless, but as a defensive weapon, barbed wire proved to be deadly for both sides of the conflict. A common tactic was to lay down belts of barbed wire in a zigzag pattern that was from 30 feet to 100 feet wide, sometimes even more. This meant that the enemy infantry had to cut through multiple tangles of the stuff just to make any progress, instead of just laying them down as independent strands, which could be cut much easier and faster. While the infantry was busy trying to cut through the barbed wire, the enemy could rain rifle and machine gun fire on them. Just a few strands of barbed wire could effectively bring an assault of thousands to a dead standstill, pun fully intended. However, barbed wire could also be used to funnel enemy soldiers into massive killing fields, and this is where it proved to be at its most deadly. Machine guns and artillery could all be zeroed in on a pre-planned killing field, making them deadly accurate against advancing enemy infantry. An account from the Battle of Soma highlights how deadly barbed wire had become. Those Newfoundlanders who did reach their own wire, four well-laid belts and all, had to follow zigzag lanes between pre-cut gaps which had been exactly pinpointed by German machine gunners. Those who managed to get through those gaps had to cross 500 yards of open ground exposed to German positions. Those Newfoundlanders who had reached the German wire were shot down as they tried to cut their way through it with their wire cutters. Both sides came up with attempts to defeat barbed wire, one of which was to use special mats that one could lay over the obstacle and provide safety for advancing soldiers. However, one misstep would see you tumble into a mass of the stuff, completely entangling you while you also lacerated and mauled your flesh. Hopelessly stuck, your only hope was that your side won the engagement and a rescue party could come later and cut you out. Or you could take your chances simply tearing free of the stuff, an extremely unenviable proposition. 
The Bangalore torpedo was also developed as a way of defeating barbed wire. It consisted of a series of five-foot lengths of pipe which could be screwed together and were filled with explosives. Then the entire assembly was shoved through the wire and the fuse lit. The resulting explosion would clear a five-foot path through the stuff. However, this meant that you would be exposed to enemy fire the entire time you were busy assembling your torpedo and waiting for the fuse to go off. It was the development of one of the deadliest weapons of World War II that led to the end of barbed wire's reign as one of the most feared tools on the battlefield. While barbed wire would continue to be used throughout World War II to protect defensive positions, the tank with its thick armor and wide treads could easily smash through the stuff. Thus, the use of barbed wire dropped steeply after World War I, though it remains in use around the world for its excellent anti-personnel properties. It just isn't as effective as it once was thanks to the proliferation of armored vehicles. Our next deadliest weapon would have its infancy in World War I, but would be responsible for almost knocking an entire country out of the war before it even joined World War II. The Airplane Almost from the advent of powered flight, man saw its potential for war, but it would take a few years for its true potential to be discovered. Before the airplane, armies relied on mounted scouts or even hot air balloons to conduct reconnaissance, but the advent of a fast mobile platform that gave its pilot a bird's eye view of a battlefield proved to be an absolute game changer. Now it was possible to get detailed tactical information not just on an enemy's front lines, but deep behind them. Valuable information that could be passed along to the artillery corps and used to destroy enemy supply depots and command posts, not visible to scouts on the ground or operating from stationary balloons. It was at the First Battle of Marna when the airplane first proved itself an exceptionally valuable tool for any military and prompted the need to defend one's own skies against enemy airplanes. During this battle, Allied reconnaissance planes were able to spot a gap in the German lines that was not visible from the ground. The Allies soon massed an attack against this gap and succeeded in splitting the German line, forcing them to retreat or be overwhelmed. It was clear that the airplane was necessary for modern war and that it was just as necessary to keep the friendly skies clear of them. The first scout planes had no armaments and instead pilots would engage in shootouts with each other using revolvers. With a pressing need to destroy enemy scout aircraft though, engineers on both sides of the lines worked to develop armament that could be fitted on an airplane that had the ability to shoot enemy planes out of the sky. The first such weapons consisted of carefully timed machine guns that were directly linked to the plane's propeller and thus could shoot through the rapidly spinning blades without damaging them. These were known as synchronization gears. The first synchronization gear to enter service was fitted on a German Fokker Eindecker fighter and proved to be mostly reliable. Gradually, the technology improved to the point that fewer and fewer pilots were shooting their own propellers off. It wouldn't be until the 1930s that these types of machine guns would go out of style. Armed with machine guns, planes could now attack and destroy each other effectively, keeping nosy enemy scouts from getting a good fix on your troops down below. However, on top of this, from the onset of powered flight, it also became obvious that the airplane could be an excellent tool for dropping bombs on the enemy with far greater accuracy than artillery. However, this would remain a pipe dream for most of the war due to the technological limitations of early engines. In place of bombs, some planes carried great loads of sharpened wood darts that were light enough to allow a plane to carry hundreds of them at a time. However, the darts were completely unguided and their effectiveness was limited, though they did succeed at causing casualties on the ground and the French used them all the way to the end of the war. Early planes were able to carry some explosives but would need to drop them from low altitudes to have any hope of hitting their targets due to how light the explosives were. This in turn exposed the airplane to withering ground fire. With the development of more powerful engines, planes were able to carry larger loads at higher altitudes and by the end of the war the bomber aircraft began to come into its own. After World War I though, few people saw the potential of the airplane. American General William Lendrum Mitchell, however, had seen how revolutionary air power would quickly become, but his efforts to convince a staunchly traditionalist military would end up costing him his career. Mitchell argued that the airplane would be the most important weapon of any future conflict. Despite the increasing lethality of airplanes in the First World War, many of Mitchell's contemporaries disagreed and believed that traditional artillery and battleships were more important than airplanes. Mitchell would go on to stage a series of demonstrations by sinking decommissioned battleships using bombs, but they proved unconvincing to Army leadership. For his incessant campaigning for an expanded air force, Mitchell would annoy his superiors to the point that they demoted him to colonel. When he accused the Army and Navy leadership of almost treasonable administration of the national defense after investing in battleships instead of aircraft carriers, Mitchell was court-martialed and he resigned shortly after. Mitchell would die in 1936, but the entire world would realize he had been correct all along after his death. When on December 7, 1941, out of the blue, a massive Japanese air attack nearly wiped out the U.S. Pacific Fleet. The U.S. was mostly left with its aircraft carriers in the Pacific for the early years of the war, which it employed to devastating effect against the Japanese. This sealed the fate of the battleship and proved that Mitchell had been correct all along. 
If US military leadership had listened to him in 1925, the US would have crushed Japan years earlier than it did with its massive fleet of aircraft carriers, instead of investing in slow, inaccurate battleships. In Europe, though, Germany also proved how deadly the airplane had become by brilliantly incorporating it into its blitzkrieg strategy. Air attacks would overwhelm enemy defenses with aerial bombardment, and the war even saw the airplane used as direct fire support for troops on the ground. Dive bombers were very effective for destroying enemy tanks with pinpoint accuracy, and few were as feared as the Junkers Ju-87 or Stuka. They even came equipped with an air siren, which would let out a horrifying wail as the plane dove on a target, further demoralizing the men on the ground. Fighters equipped with heavy machine guns and cannons could also strafe enemy positions and destroy armored vehicles with far greater accuracy than artillery fire or offshore fire support. By the end of the war, the airplane had become one of the most important advancements in the history of military technology. Our next most deadly weapon, though, continues to haunt the imaginations of people to this day and led to global action to ban its use in further conflicts. Poison gas Sometimes it was invisible and odorless, other times it came with a distinct sharp smell that preceded a sickly yellowish fog drifting over the landscape toward you. It was indiscriminate, and a change in the wind would end up killing friend and foe alike. Poison gas was without a doubt one of the worst weapons of World War I. France was the first to use gas, with canisters of tear gas lobbed at German positions in hopes of making their positions easier to assault. However, tear gas was at best an irritant that would cause uncontrolled tearing and difficulty breathing with symptoms clearing up within half an hour. This made the gas not particularly effective. Then Germany upped the ante significantly. Rather than use irritant gases, Germany decided that the most humane thing to do was to use deadly gases so as to secure a swift victory, preventing even greater casualties on both sides from prolonged fighting. Thus, in April 1915, Germany debuted the use of chlorine gas against the Allied lines. The gas is denser than air, meaning it would settle in low areas and move along the ground, perfect for infiltrating enemy trenches and killing soldiers within. At low doses, it causes coughing, vomiting, and extreme eye irritation. However, unprotected soldiers could inhale the gas, after which it would react with the water inside their lungs, creating hydrochloric acid. The acid would then just eat away at the lungs, causing suffocation or severe lung scarring for survivors. In just its first use, an estimated 1,100 soldiers were killed. But the gas was so surprisingly effective that the Germans weren't ready to exploit the situation. But chlorine gas had serious problems. For starters, its odor and color made it easy to spot, giving sharp-eyed soldiers a chance to quickly don protective gear. The gas was also water-soluble, so a simple wet rag over the mouth and nose was enough to protect a soldier. Next, the Germans unleashed phosgene gas, which was colorless and nearly undetectable at low concentrations, which was still enough to result in deadly effects. The gas reacted with the proteins in the alveoli of the lungs, disrupting the blood-air barrier and causing suffocation. Highly effective, the gas is thought to be responsible for up to 85% of the 91,000 gas deaths in the conflict, but the gas acted slowly and could take up to two days to cause a death through buildup of fluid in the lungs. For at least one of those days, soldiers could still put up some resistance, making it unsuitable for preparatory bombardments. The most common gas used in World War I was mustard gas, so-called for its mustard color. While in pure form it's colorless, impure forms of the gas were widely used in World War I, giving it a distinct coloring and an odor similar to garlic or horseradish. The gas was not commonly deadly unless someone inhaled large quantities of it, but it was feared because even on contact with unprotected skin, it would cause large blisters which oozed yellowish fluids. These chemical burns made fighting difficult for those injured, and the blisters opened them up to more serious infections in the extremely unsanitary trenches of World War I. Often, other gases would be used, such as chloropicrin, before a second round of gas attacks. These special gases were irritants, posing little threat to life but could bypass gas masks and would often make soldiers remove their gas masks as they suffered coughing or vomiting fits. Then the second deadlier gas could be introduced to unprotected soldiers leading to death. Ironically, gases were banned by the Hague Convention of 1899, though to obvious little effect. While gases proved to be less deadly than their ordinary rifles, accounting for between 1-2% to of casualties in World War I, they were extremely effective terror weapons that severely demoralized the enemy. After the war, they were banned again by the Geneva Protocol of 1925, with countries super pinky promising that this time they were serious and they wouldn't use them in war. In the Second World War, the Western powers did not use gas, though were prepared to do so. 
Japan feared a similar retaliation by Western armies, so used poison gases only against Chinese and other Asian forces who were viewed as inferior and lacked the technological sophistication to create weaponized gases themselves. Thus, the Japanese could launch gas attacks with little fear of their troops being gassed back. Knowing that the Japanese were using gas against other Asian countries, Australia imported poison gas from the UK and stored it in underground bunkers in case of invasion. If the Japanese unleashed poison gas against Australian forces, the Australians were ready to respond in kind. Despite not using it against Western armies, the Japanese did use Western POWs as guinea pigs in several experiments using poison gas. It's long been rumored that due to having been gassed in World War I, Hitler refused to use weapons in the Second World War, but that's not correct. The real reason that Germany did not use gas weapons was because its military lacked the technical capability to mass-produce poison gas for use on a battlefield. The Germans had approximately 45,000 tons of poison gas, but Hitler knew that the Allies had far more in reserve, and he feared an overwhelming retaliation. After their defeat at the Battle of Stalingrad, Hitler was urged to use poison gas in order to slow the advance of the Russians. Once more, Hitler feared an overwhelming retaliatory attack from the Allies. However, Hitler still ordered production of Tabun and sarin gases to be doubled. He ordered that chemical weapon stockpiles not be moved to the Russian front though, fearful that a rogue officer would use them and spark an allied retaliation. After the invasion of Italy, the Germans quickly either moved or destroyed their own and Italy's chemical weapon stockpiles for fear that again a rogue commander would order them used on allied soldiers. Gas could have prevented the Normandy invasion though and turned it into a strategic disaster. When asked why gas wasn't used, Hermann Göring later stated that as the Wehrmacht relied on horse-drawn transportation for resupply of their combat units and they had never been able to design a gas mask that a horse would tolerate and allowed sufficient air to pass for a horse to pull a cart, deploying a gas would harm the war effort more than it aided it. The Germans did use chemical weapons and extermination efforts though, using toxic smoke to force Russian resistance fighters out of their positions in the caverns beneath the city of Sevastopol. They also used asphyxiating gas in the catacombs of Odessa in November 1941 and in late May 1942 during the Battle of the Kirk Peninsula in eastern Crimea. After the battle, around 3,000 Red Army soldiers and civilians were besieged in a series of caves and tunnels in the Adzumushkai Quarry, and after three months of resistance, the Nazis finally released poison gases into the tunnels, killing most of them. Infamously, the Nazis used poison gas during the war, but not against fighting troops, but to murder millions of what they called undesirables. Though the Allies did not use chemical weapons, they were fully prepared to do so. The British created large stockpiles and moved them close to the southern coast in anticipation of German invasion. In case of said invasion, the British were fully prepared to use gas against the amphibious assaults. The Allies also prepared massive quantities of gas to be loaded onto planes to use against German cities if the Germans used their own poison gas, especially during the D-Day landings. Such an attack would have prompted a massive poison gas bombing campaign against German civilians, killing tens of thousands. Churchill was a strong proponent of using poison gas and was restrained only by his military leadership. He wrote a secret memorandum to his military chiefs urging them to strongly consider the use of poison gas against even civilian targets so as to shorten the war, writing, it is absurd to consider morality on this topic when everybody used it in the last war without a word of complaint. The US meanwhile developed deadly blood agents for use with their new bazooka launchers. These agents could penetrate the protective barriers of some gas masks and were seen as especially effective against Japanese troops holding out inside caves and bunkers. However, despite developing large stockpiles of the deadly gas, the US never used it. Our next deadly weapon also had its start in World War I, but while the rest of the world struggled to employ it, Nazi Germany made deadly use of it. Tanks September 1916 was the dawn of tank warfare. On a brisk fall morning, a small group of massive armored behemoths chugged along at 4 miles an hour, picking their way toward the front. Then, to the shock of German onlookers, the massive metal monsters began the long, slow journey across no man's land toward the trenches. Rifle and even machine gun fire proved completely ineffective. Nothing seemed it could stop the massive death machines. As combustion engines became more powerful, they could be used to propel even heavier machines. This led to a rise in armored cars, but cars were useless in trench warfare of World War I as they could only operate on roads. The British began to rethink the entire concept of an armored car and devise a machine that could help them break the deadlock of trench warfare. The result would be called the Tank a code name given to hide the true nature of the top secret British project. Any wayward spy hearing the name would simply think the British were developing new water tanks to rehydrate their troops. In actuality, the British had designed massive monsters of iron and steel. The lumbering beasts had tracks that encircled the entire body and allowed them to simply drive straight over trenches, and instead of turret-mounted weapons like we see today, it had side-mounted cannons and machine guns to fire down into trenches from above. 
The thick armor made the vehicle immune to small arms fire of any kind, though the extremely slow speed of early tanks made them vulnerable to artillery fire. Inside of the cramped quarters was a crew of eight, a tank commander, driver, four gunners, and two men who helped shift gears. At the very height of the machine was a massive engine, which was not properly ventilated, running the risk of suffocating the crew. To make matters even worse, the engine would drive up the temperature inside the tank to unbearable degrees. With no suspension, the big lumbering beast would make for a horribly bumpy ride and be complete hell to operate. Despite this, tanks were quickly employed and made their first appearance on September 15, 1916. The British Army massed 49 tanks for an assault on the German trenches outside the village French of Flair. However, many of the tanks never even made it to their starting positions, breaking down en route. Even after the battle commenced, many of the tanks would break down or just plain get stuck on the many craters of no man's land. Only nine tanks managed to achieve their goals inside enemy lines, but the British were satisfied enough with the results to go all in on tanks. Early tanks experienced frequent breakdowns and the interior conditions were almost as dangerous for the crew as the battlefield outside. As the war progressed, Germany developed armor-piercing ammunition that could pierce the 8mm thick side armor, so the British doubled down and made the armor even thicker. This prompted the development of the first anti-tank rifle, the German TAC 1918. A more practical solution was simply to bundle a few grenades together and hurl them directly at the tank. If exploding close enough to it, the explosion could kill the crew inside through spalding of the metal armor. By the Second World War, though, tanks were an indispensable tool of any modern military, and fierce competition between both sides led to the development of better armed and armored tanks. It was the Germans who employed them the most effectively at the start of the war. Despite their appearance in the First World War, the rest of the world still largely failed to appreciate the true potential of the tank. Thus, it was doctrine in most armies to spread tanks out and use them as infantry support platforms. The Germans instead concentrated their tanks into individual units and used them as a spearhead to break enemy defenses, allowing supporting infantry to exploit the gap created by the armored assault. The tactic was the cornerstone of the German Blitzkrieg and was soon copied by Western powers. The Second World War would see some of the greatest tank battles in history, many of them on the Eastern Front. Even in the Pacific, tanks were employed by both the Japanese and the Americans, though American tanks would prove to be far superior to their Japanese counterparts. By the end of the Second World War, it was official. No army could hope for victory without the copious use of main battle tanks. The villain stares up at the plans for the powerful weapon. This is no ordinary gun or rocket. When complete, it'll harness the power of the sun itself and rain fire and death down on his enemies. A mad scientist looking for revenge on a superhero? No, the villain was Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, and this weapon and many others were really built or planned by his scientists. What was the Wunderwaffe? The secret German program of wonder weapons? It was 1942 and the Nazi war machine was flagging. The United States had entered the war, the United Kingdom was stubbornly refusing to fall, and Hitler had the brilliant idea of invading Russia, which meant the German army now had to fight a war on two fronts. The morale of the military was fading. Hitler was devoting more and more resources toward targeting German citizens, and even many of his own generals were starting to whisper. Was the Fuhrer losing his marbles? Did Germany need a change in leadership? Naturally, that meant there was only one thing to do – turn up the propaganda. Led by Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda ministry started putting out news that would help turn the tide of the war. Because Germany's scientists were on the case and they were designing a whole new crop of Wunderwaffe or wonder weapons that the world had never seen before. These weapons, straight out of science fiction in some cases, were said to pack a power the world has never seen. Three years before the first atomic bombs were perfected, these secret weapons were said to turn the tide of any war and send the enemy running. So, was there any truth to these announcements? As usual, the answer is yes and no. The Germans did in fact have a top secret weapons program and it was led by some of the world's best scientists. Men like Werner von Braun, the aerospace engineer who was later taken out of Germany by the United States and became one of the heads of the space program, regularly presented Hitler with blueprints for wildly ambitious weapons. The only thing standing between Germany and unleashing these beasts on the battlefield was a lack of time and money, and Hitler was more than willing to give both of these to the Wunderwaffe program. And the results were impressive, at least on paper. The Wunderwaffe program went for quantity over quality in many cases, and they delivered designs and prototypes for countless new weapons. Some delivered the foundation of future weapons and innovations that swept the world. Others were created but didn't live up to the initial hype. Still others were designed on paper but the German army ran out of time before they became a reality, and yet others turned into complete and total disasters that we still marvel at today. Let's crack open the secret files of the Wunderwaffe and see which of these innovations succeeded and which terrified even Hitler. 
Germany had an impressive navy, but they were far behind the Allied powers in one area, aircraft carriers. Hitler wanted to expand Germany's naval power far beyond Europe, and to do that, they needed much more capacity. So they commissioned the Graf Zeppelin, a massive carrier that could have carried over 40 fighter planes and dive bombers. And it was one of the earliest Wunderwaffe projects, beginning construction in 1936, and it was still under construction in 1945. With Germany's defeat imminent, the ship was deliberately sunk to avoid it falling into enemy hands. It was later salvaged and used for weapons tests by the Soviets, a far cry from the powerhouse it was intended to be. But it wasn't the most impressive aircraft carrier in the Nazis' plans. The German ocean liner Europa was an impressive ship, one of the largest of the era. After losing a key battleship in 1941, the German Navy needed an aircraft carrier they could use quickly. So they came up with the idea, why not turn the cruise ship into a carrier? The largest of the vessels was chosen for conversion, the Europa was redesigned the German aircraft carrier 1, and big plans were developed to convert it. And that's all they became, plans. Soon after the process began, it became clear there were serious structural weaknesses and the ship wasn't meant to carry airplanes. It wound up carrying troops after it was seized by the United States. If there was one thing the Wunderwaffe program loved, it was large ships. It was called Plan Z, the plan to expand and enhance the German Navy starting in 1939. The plans were always ambitious but never quite panned out, and that included the H-Class battleships. Never heard of the H-Class battleships? That's because they were designed to be by far the largest the German Navy had ever seen, with six ships loaded with massive guns and reinforced deck armor. Ironically, what spelled their end was the very thing they were designed for, World War II. The Navy's focus went to retrofitting existing ships, and the H-Class battleships faded off into the seas of fantasy. But one section of the German Navy got much more attention. The U-Boat was the terror of the seas, as the German submarine sank countless Allied ships. But Hitler wanted them to be faster, stronger, and deadlier. Countless new models were proposed, starting with the rocket U-Boat. Most U-Boats used standard torpedoes, but these blueprints intended to replace that with higher-powered rockets and missiles. This would allow the Germans to not only sink enemy ships more effectively, but potentially launch attacks on Britain and even the United States from the sea. The first tests were promising, but the lack of a guidance system made them ineffective. Ultimately, the rocket U-boat wasn't ready for combat by the time the war ended, but the scientists continued to refine them for other countries. There was a constant quest to upgrade the U-boat, and some got closer than others. The biggest challenge of using submarines in combat was that they weren't meant to stay underwater at length. They had to coast along the surface and could only submerge for short periods at a time. The Type 21 submarines aimed to change that, being the first ships to operate primarily underwater and only need to resurface for charging. The prototypes worked and they were put into production in a hurry. Over a hundred were completed and two were put into service, but at that point the sea war of the European front was all but over. Neither ship saw combat, but the design was impressive enough that both the US and USSR built on it in the future. But the designs that were meant for the surface were no less ambitious or strange. The Kugelblitz might sound like a falling rain of noodle puddings, but the World War II reality was much different. A planned anti-aircraft weapon, it was a self-propelled gun that would be attached to tanks and had the ability to shoot down enemy planes from the ground. It was the first model to have an enclosed rotating turret that would give it far greater maneuverability. The plans were approved to move it to the prototype phase, but that's where the project concluded as the war ended and only a few test vehicles had been completed. The only surviving turret stands on display at a German army museum. But to take down tanks, the German army would need some bigger guns. Literally. A rare example of a Wunderwaffe weapon that actually saw combat, the Sturer Emil anti-tank gun was an impressive beast. A lengthy run mounted on the hull of an armored tank, it could carry 15 rounds and move enough to aim effectively. The tank design was adjusted from standard heavy tanks to balance the huge barrel, and two models were completed and sent into the field. Named after Max and Moritz, a pair of German storybook characters, they both fell in combat, with Max being destroyed and Moritz being captured by the Soviets and placed on display in the Kubinka Tank Museum. And to carry a heavy gun, you need a heavy tank. The German heavy tank programs cranked out powerful weapons, but they wanted to go bigger. The largest tank at the time, the Panzer VII Maus, was under 200 tons. However, the planned Land Cruiser Rata was going to weigh a whopping 1,000 tons. Its armor would be almost 10 inches thick and covered with anti-aircraft guns along with a gun turret harvested from a battleship. Hitler was impressed with the wild ambition of the project and greenlit it, always being a fan of showy weapons. However, 
Minister of Armaments Albert Speer saw it for what it was, a massive money pit, and cancelled the project in 1943 before it was built. Other tanks were less ambitious but no more effective. Although the Land Cruiser Rata was never completed, its smaller cousin, the famous Panzer VIII Mouse, was. The behemoth of a tank still holds the record for the heaviest fully enclosed armored vehicle ever created. Over 30 feet long and almost 12 feet high, weighing in at just under 200 metric tons, it's armed with a powerful anti-tank gun. The problem was, at that size and weight, it took a lot of power to run. It could reach a top speed of up to 14 miles per hour, but it was too heavy to even cross most bridges. The tank had to ford the river using a snorkel. It was designed for power and spectacle, not maneuverability, which no doubt led to its eventual capture by the Soviet forces. But it wasn't the most bizarre tank in the Nazis' plans. You've probably seen a tumbleweed rolling down the plains. What if that tumbleweed was made of metal instead? The Nazis designed a bizarre rolling tank known as the Kugelpanzer as part of the Wunderwaffe program, but the incomplete model recovered from the field left more questions than it answered. It didn't have any weapons attached and it seemed to be more of a mobile bunker than a tank. While it didn't seem to have much combat use, it certainly became a star exhibit in the Kubinka Tank Museum. And their plans for the air were no less ambitious. Military gliders were one of the most important parts of warfare, getting troops and supplies to where they were needed most. The Junkers Ju-332 Mammut was the largest glider the Germans tried to build. And there was a hitch to the plan. It was supposed to be built out of non-strategic material to aid the war effort, so the German Luftwaffe tried to build the entire thing out of wood. It was planned to carry up to 4,400 pounds of cargo. Early tests showed the vehicle was incredibly unstable. It landed well before its planned destination and had to be towed back, its eventual fate being cut up for fuel. One area of the German weapons program got more attention than any other. It was a constant frustration for Hitler. For all the German army's strength, he was sorely lacking in air power. Germany hadn't been involved in long-range wars before the last few decades, and their air force was dwarfed by those of the United States and Japan. They were engaged in aerial combat against Great Britain, but their planes weren't capable of striking further off targets or were getting involved in the Pacific Theater. The Wunderwaffe program was designed to change that, and their program had an in-your-face name, America Bomber. Doesn't leave much doubt what this thing was intended to do, does it? Germany wanted a long-range bomber that would be capable of delivering a Pearl Harbor-like attack against the East Coast American cities, especially New York, which Hitler fantasized about destroying. The German Air Ministry gathered several of the country's best aircraft designers to submit their own candidates for the plane that could deliver a shocking punch to the US on their home front. The results were mixed. Ultimately, two designs stood out from the crowd and were destined for production. The first, the Messerschmitt Me-264, was a long-range strategic bomber for the Luftwaffe. It was an all metal heavy bomber similar in design to the B-52 and had relatively little in the way of armor and guns so it could carry more bombs. Three prototypes were built and overall impressed the brass, but Messerschmitt was already under a lot of demand for their fighter planes and so the project was abandoned and the competitor was chosen. And that competitor packed its own impressive payload. Junkers might have had a flop with its massive wooden glider, but their other models were anything but. The Junkers Ju-390 was the model ultimately chosen for the America Bomber project for one main reason. It could be adapted from some of their existing planes. Extra inner wing segments were added to the classic Junkers Ju-90 and 290 models and they quickly went into testing. But how successful they were is a subject of ongoing debate. Some say the test plane made secret flights to South Africa, Japan, and even New York, but there is no concrete proof of this. What's clear is that work on them continued into 1944 until their contracts were cancelled and the planes were eventually stripped for parts and destroyed. But the Nazis might have been more interested in one specific device. The future of of Warcraft was rockets. Powerful devices that could provide fast launches from the ground and deliver massive payloads, or even take a man to the moon one day. Werner von Braun was known as the master of rockets, and many of his innovations were rocket powered. Hundreds of designs were built for jet fighters, rocket powered planes, bombers, ramming interceptors, and tactical bombers, but the jet fuel needed to power rockets was expensive, and the technology was new, and most of the Nazi rocket projects wound up as little more than expensive proof of concept displays for von Braun's future career. Although Hitler liked rockets, one thing's for sure, he liked heavy artillery more, and the Wunderwaffe program was happy to deliver. Why launch a hundred mortars when you can launch one with ten times the power? That was what Karl Gerat tried to answer. The massive siege mortar fired the largest self-propelled ammunition ever deployed, and six of the massive guns were built. The destination? The Eastern Front, where Russia had a massive terrain and manpower advantage over the invading Germans. The gun was even powerful enough to destroy bridges when deployed, but they were slow-moving and expensive to build. They delivered a powerful punch, but ultimately all but one were destroyed and the remainder found its final destination at, you guessed it, the Kobinka Tank Museum. 
But bigger isn't always better. The Schwerer Gustav was one of the most impressive guns ever built, weighing in almost 1,500 short tons and able to fire shells close to 30 miles. It was less a gun than a massive tank-like railway weapon that turned out to be the largest gun ever fired in combat. The problem is, massive guns don't just wind up where you'd like them to be without help. Getting the Schwerer Gustav to where it was supposed to be took a lot of time and manpower, which gave the enemy a lot of time to surround the German position and attack. It was a powerful weapon but not a practical one and was eventually destroyed to keep it from falling into enemy hands. But there was one gun that would have been even more powerful. Many of the Wunderwaffe projects never left the drawing board due to a lack of money or time, and that was the case for the Land Cruiser P-1500 Monster, a super heavy self-propelled gun that would have roamed the battlefield on a pair of treads. Weighing around 1500 tons, it would allow a massive gun like the Gustav to travel without being assembled by a team of soldiers. The problem was, well, Nazis' tank development wasn't exactly going well. Vehicles like the Maus turned out to be a disaster, so rolling a giant gun around on two of those wasn't likely to go smoothly. It would also be an inviting target for air attacks. The monster was cancelled before it even got off the ground, and little documentation of it exists. Some Wunderwaffe projects were a little more practical. It was the early days of air warfare, and planes were expensive to make, so why not make them harder to shoot down? That was the goal of the Jagdfaust, an experimental anti-bomber rifle that would be equipped for German rocket planes. The Comet, the Luftwaffe's fastest plane, moved so fast that it made typical cannon rounds much harder, making accuracy a real problem for its pilots. The Jagdfaust eliminated that problem by eliminating the recoil and allowing it to be fired much faster. And unlike many German engineering projects, it worked. The gun got its first kill in April 1945. Too little, too late, as the war came to an end. The only thing more valuable than a new weapon was preserving existing ones. Losing expensive hardware was a common problem, especially when it was tanks, which the Nazis were constantly trying to upgrade. The massive weapons were especially vulnerable at night when they could be ambushed from the dark, which was why the German optics company Carl Zeiss AG developed a surprising project for the military in 1941. The FG-1250 was one of the first night vision devices ever built, working through infrared and designed to be mounted on tanks. It was one of the more effective devices, maybe proving that larger isn't always better. For many weapons, the key wasn't going bigger but smarter. It was the precursor in many ways to modern drone warfare, a weapon that wouldn't need to be aimed directly at the target but could be guided to it. The Fritz X was a powerful bomb designed designed to take out heavily armed targets, but what made it unique was that it was the first precision-guided weapon ever used in combat. The bomb would be guided by a radio-controlled link that affected movable parts in the tail fins and was intended to sink ships. It successfully achieved that goal in 1943, but it wouldn't be long before the Allies developed countermeasures that could interfere with the delicate radio link. Some Wunderwaffe projects, though, were distinctly closer to science fiction. It was 1929 when German physicist Hermann Oberth came up with a mad proposal, a massive space station that would use a concave mirror to concentrate sunlight and refract it back at a specific point of the Earth with devastating results. Germany was not at war at this point, so maybe he just wanted to be a supervillain. But during the Second World War, German scientists began to build on the concept. They wanted to design a massive sun gun that would generate an immense amount of energy, enough to destroy a city with a single blast. The only problem was Germany didn't have a space program. No one did. When asked how long it would take to build their sun gun, they estimated between 50 and 100 years. which when you consider Hitler's plans for a thousand-year Reich might have been reasonable. But how bizarre were the projects of the Wunderwaffe truly? What was Die Glocke? The mysterious bell-shaped superweapon was one of the most mysterious supposed projects of the Wunderwaffe. It was exposed by Polish journalist Igor Witkowski in the year 2000, as he claimed he had uncovered a secret device that never saw the light of day. Some claimed the glowing contraption was an anti-gravity device, with some even saying it could be related to time travel. But in reality, all evidence is that Die Glocke was nothing. There's no evidence that Witkowski was exposing a true project instead of creating a clever tale. Other devices never got close to reality. The Wunderwaffe teams repeatedly came back to the idea of a directed energy weapon. Who wouldn't like a gun that never ran out of ammo, just needing to be recharged? That technology for Star Trek phasers wasn't there yet, but that didn't stop them from trying. The first attempt was a sonic cannon that could kill via high-intensity vibrations. It worked, but was too expensive and vulnerable to enemy fire to become a mainstay of combat. Undeterred, Hitler's mad scientists explored X-ray beams that could take down aircraft, but the electron accelerator they built 
as a test was eventually captured by the Americans. But one question has puzzled people for decades. How close did the Wunderwaffe get to the ultimate weapon? Nuclear fission was discovered in 1938, and only four months later Hitler already had scientists working on a short-lived nuclear bomb project. While it was shut down shortly before the Nazi invasion of Poland, a new project would soon begin as the Nazis started producing nuclear reactors, uranium, and heavy water in earnest. The project continued to be funded until the very end of the war, but contrary to popular belief, it was not a tight race for which side got to the finish line first. While the Manhattan Project was full steam ahead, the German nuclear bomb project was understaffed, and many of the scientists left to pursue more short-term war projects. It didn't help that many of Germany's top scientists had fled the Nazi regime. In the end, the Nazi nuclear bomb project met the fate of many other superweapons, being harvested for parts by the Allies as they took over after the war. So what went wrong with the Wunderwaffe? Why did a project that created so many fantastical weapons ultimately deliver so many duds, and completely fail to help the country win the war? For one thing, the scientists involved had to split their focus between so many projects that few got the opportunity to develop and be refined. Many were scrapped after one failed test. Torn between Hitler's mad ambition and Albert Speer's penny-pinching, the scientists were often between a rock and a hard place. While many did change the future of warfare, few were around long enough to deliver in combat, and those that were were often rolled out right before the close of the war. But one place is no doubt thankful for the Wunderwaffe, the Kubinka Tank Museum, which thanks them for many of their top exhibits. Ancient Warfare Generally an old-school affair where armies face off on the battlefield with weapons and armor, and occasionally something much larger, sometimes seaborne, and sometimes alive? Here are 10 of the most insane ancient super weapons you might never have heard of. Number 10. The Juga Crossbow in ancient times, projectiles were still an important part of warfare, but those using them were usually limited to simple weapons like slings and crossbows. While they could deliver a fatal blow, they weren't exactly efficient. The user had to wind up the weapon or align the crossbow, aim carefully, let loose, and then reload. If they were up against a single enemy or a key target, it could be effective. If they were up against an army, the weapon holder would likely be overrun sooner than later. And that was high on the minds of military strategists during the Warring States era of Chinese history, more than 2,000 years ago, so they created what might be the first semi-automatic weapon in history, the repeating crossbow, which could fire several shots in quick succession. Did it pack the power of its traditional counterparts? Not quite. While traditional crossbows rely heavily on tension to draw the arrow back and propel it forward, these weapons pack much less force. Their strength is that the action of spanning the bow, placing the bolt, and shooting is combined into one movement, making it easier to fire in quick succession. All that's needed is to move the sliding lever back and forth while holding the pistol grip. It fires from the hip as the lever is pumped forward and back. Its main strength was speed, but the early examples found in Chinese archaeological digs were lacking in precision or strength. They were likely only able to deliver puncture wounds rather than fatal arrow blows. This led many to believe it was more of a minor defense weapon than a true tool of war. But these weapons might have had a sinister secret. The key to this weapon was found in the Kuchin Tushu Ji Cheng, an encyclopedia of Chinese history written during the 1700s. It was described as a handy little weapon often used by elderly scholars or women who worked in the palace as a defensive weapon. But they weren't just shooting tacks. The arrows they shot were tipped with poison, called tiger-killing poison, which was said to kill a person or even a horse if it successfully drew blood. While the weapon evolved since and was revised several times through Chinese history, the core model remained largely the same, meaning this fast-firing weapon has lasted several thousand years, mostly unchanged. It was such an effective tool it was last used in warfare around the 19th century. This next weapon also made its debut in China, but it packs a bigger punch. Number 9. The Trebuchet the catapult is the ultimate weapon for delivering a large projectile, right? You load it up, you cut the rope, and it's flung hard enough to break down a rock wall. But that's nothing compared to the trebuchet, which was the most powerful projectile weapon before the invention of gunpowder. Designed to use a counterweight and a long arm, it can fire heavier projectiles much further than a traditional catapult. It all started with the traction trebuchet in ancient China around 2,500 years ago. 17 feet high with a throwing arm of at least 30 feet, it relied on manpower, lots of manpower. A large group of men would pull ropes attached to the end of the trebuchet beam, and when released this created a massive rotational force that would propel the projectile further than would be possible with any other machine. But soon a much better model would emerge. The biggest negative of the original traction trebuchet was how much manpower it took to fire each shot and how long it took to set it up. The model was used for over a thousand years, with the counterweight trebuchet only being created around the 12th century in the Mediterranean and later being adopted by China after they encountered it in battle with the Mongols. 
The counterweight trebuchet uses a powerful weight, a heavy box usually filled with rocks or sand. When attached to the shorter end of the beam and released on command, it does the work of several men and pulls the beam that creates the force needed to propel the projectile. This trebuchet is usually larger, stronger, and requires a lot more manpower to build and set up, but once it's ready, there were few weapons in ancient warfare who could match its power and there's a reason it stood the test of time. The trebuchet is useful because its basket can carry just about anything. Sure, the most popular ammo was rocks or other hard objects that could be used to knock down enemy defenses, but as weapons evolved, incendiary weapons that could set a city afire could also be loaded into the basket and fired. For those willing to fight dirty, they could even load up human waste or corpses of soldiers felled in battle and seek to contaminate the enemy city with a deadly disease. While the weapon declined in use once gunpowder was invented, who needs a giant machine to fling things when you can just light a fuse, right? It's one of the only weapons on this list that's still recreated frequently today. Recreations have been built around the world, and even in today's world of modern weapons, it packs a punch. But sometimes you need to have something a little more lively. Number 8. War Elephants for steeds in combat, you can't do much better than the horse. They can carry a lot, they can move fast, and they're easy to train. But they're not going to be knocking down any walls, and sometimes you need a bit more muscle. Enter the largest land mammal alive, the elephant. Massive, incredibly strong, and with a bonus limb and tough tusks, it's not hard to see how they'd make an amazing weapon. There's just one problem. They're strong enough to kill a human in seconds if they get mad, and before you can ride them into battle, you have to train them. That's why it took a special talent to train them. The elephant trainer, or the mahout, would slowly get the elephant used to being led by using chains and hooks, then guide them in how to avoid obstacles and follow formation patterns. And once they were trained, they were nearly unstoppable. Although the first elephants were trained for agricultural work in Asia, it's believed that elephant warfare started in ancient India. They show up repeatedly in ancient Indian epics like Ramayana, where kings are frequently depicted riding them into battle. After all, what more impressive way to indicate who's in charge than having them atop the king of beasts? But soon they were used in much larger numbers, being used to provide high ground for archers or to carry heavy equipment. Elephants are so strong it was common for small towers to be built on their backs for multiple soldiers to shoot from. And for those well-trained elephants who could be led into combat, some armies even attach specialized blades to the tusks to give them an even nastier edge in combat. But working with the giant beasts had its downside. Elephants were the first tanks, but most tanks don't get spooked easily. One elephant getting startled could easily cause a stampede, leading to a derailed charge or a trampled army. But they were effective for long-distance military marches, most famously Hannibal's crossing of the Alps in his war against the Roman Empire. Between the difficulty of training elephants and the increased rarity of the animals, many of whom are now hunted for their tusks and highly endangered, military elephants became increasingly rare as modern technology advanced. By the 20th century, they were a rarity, but they hadn't been retired completely. In the Second World War, elephants were used to tow airplanes and do other heavy-duty tasks in Asia, and they saw limited use as late as the Vietnam War. This next fiery weapon was way ahead of its time. Number 7. Greek Fire you're aboard a ship carrying soldiers and you're about to run into your dreaded enemy, the ships of the Eastern Roman Empire. They've got superior forces, but your men are well trained and you're ready to take on their conventional weapons. But this time they're not packing conventional weapons, they're packing Greek fire. And suddenly they pull out a cannon that fires what looks like a massive plume of flame at you, igniting the ship and sending you and your men leaping off the boat before it sinks to the bottom of the sea. Was this a strange case of time travel where someone from the future made sure they had a flamethrower to keep them from losing a key battle? Nope, it's just good old-fashioned chemistry. What actually is Greek fire? That's one of the biggest mysteries of the warfare around 672 CE. It was primarily used by the Byzantine Empire against Arab enemies, and it had two key parts. An incendiary compound, usually a powder, would be ignited, but it wouldn't be allowed to burn out of control. Instead, it would be fed through a nozzle and pointed outward at the enemy ship creating a concentrated burst of flame that would spew straight forward. With the necessary closeness and good aim, it could catch an enemy ship on fire and wipe out an entire army, or at least ignite its sails and leave them stranded. Of course, the bigger challenge was making sure it didn't catch your own ship on fire in the process. But there's one mystery remaining. Exactly what were the ingredients of this weapon? Greek fire was written about extensively in the books of the era, but they left one major detail out the chemical compounds. This controlled fire not only worked as a flamethrower, but there were rumors it could stay afire even on water, making it impossible to steer away easily. This led to modern speculation that it could have been made of components including naphtha, quicklime, and pine resin. While it was typically deployed through large carried projectors, there were also drawings with small handheld projectors. What could go wrong with giving each soldier on a boat their own personal flamethrower? 
It was also placed into flasks and thrown, just like an ancient grenade. While it's faded into antiquity now, Greek fire was no doubt an early forerunner of today's incendiary weapons. But one country did them one better in explosive weapons. Number 6. Holong Chushwe Ah, fireworks. There's nothing like watching them blow up in midair. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll get to watch a multi-stage one go off as it dazzles with one release of color after another. It's all fun and games until that rocket's coming straight for you. When packed with more gunpowder, a firework becomes a powerful weapon, as well as going down in history as the first form of ballistic missile. And they started in the world capital of ahead of their time weapons, China. It was the 14th century when the Huolong Chu Shui was first recorded, and it's well known that they had fireworks and gunpowder by then. What wasn't expected was sophisticated rockets that could deliver more than one stage. And they didn't just deliver a blow, they delivered some great aesthetics too. The Huolong Chu Shui looked a lot like modern rockets, about 5 feet long. It was made of a bamboo too, but they wanted to send a message, so the rocket was given an ornately carved dragon head and tail. Pour one out for the poor artist who had to design those features only to have them blow up after one use. And inside the body would be four rockets filled with gunpowder that could give the tube a powerful launch. Four fuses would be lit, and as they ignited the rocket would launch far faster than any other rocket of the era. After all, four rockets are better than one, and anyone seeing the rocket coming would run for cover. But you can run, but you can't hide. Because the Huolong Shushui had a big secret, inside the mouth were three smaller arrow rockets, and just as the fuses of the first rockets were about to burn out, they would light the smaller rockets, which would burst out of the main rocket and hit four different locations instead of just one. It was the most advanced rocket of its era, and the idea of a multi-stage rocket caught on. It's still used in warfare today, with such controversial munitions like cluster bombs dropping mini-bombs when they explode. While this rocket has faded into obscurity, it made an appearance in the Disney version of Mulan, and we're betting that if it was sold on the fireworks black market, it would be making a return to your neighborhood. Now let's get into a weapon that could serve more than one purpose. Number 5. Scythed Chariot the chariot was a game changer in combat. Unlike traditional horseback troops, you weren't fully at the mercy of a temperamental animal. You could carry more than one person per horse, and the speed boost was giving the armies that could afford them a massive advantage. Not only did the Romans make chariot warfare a staple of their military, but they had enough that they could make chariot races one of their many high-stakes sports. But eventually, the appeal of a horse-drawn chariot started to wear thin, and armies started to wonder, what if I could improve this? You know, what would make a horse-drawn chariot even better? if it had lots of sharp blades attached to it. So the scythe chariot entered the fray and everyone nearby ran. Weaponized chariots were nothing new. Those riding in the chariots usually had swords and crossbows at the ready. What was different here was that the chariot itself was weaponized. Every wheel had horizontal blades around one meter long sticking out from the sides as well as under the driver's seat. These would tear any enemy soldier who was unfortunate enough to encounter the chariot to shreds, and more importantly, it would cut the legs of enemy horses and bring them to the ground along with the enemy forces riding them. They were an effective way to cut through large infantry groups. A fast-moving scythe chariot could bring hundreds of men to the ground if it took them by surprise. So, why did it die out? The scythe chariot appeared to make its debut in the Persian military, reportedly in the mid-400s BC. It saw heavy use in the Persian Wars, cutting holes in the famous phalanx formations of the Greek and Macedonian armies. Armies would learn to avoid the scythe chariot, but that meant breaking formation and letting the Persians gain ground. However, they weren't much use on uneven ground or even against more loosely distributed troops, and they also stood the risk of injuring their own men or horses if they moved in the wrong direction. The scythe chariot saw more use in the era, but eventually faded from the battlefield, although it was briefly reinvented by Leonardo da Vinci who sketched it as one of his many, many inventions. And as warfare evolved, the need for new weapons increased. Number 4. The Corvus The First Punic War was one of the most critical wars of the Roman Empire's heyday, pitting them against the powerful Carthaginian army. They had powerful ships, and while the Roman army was no slouch, they were lacking in the naval warfare department. The biggest challenge was getting to the enemy and fighting them before they made landfall. Fortunately, the Romans had no shortage of engineers, and one device they created would have been lost to history if it wasn't for the writings of Polybius, a Greek historian responsible for much of the writings of the era. He made sure the Corvus survived its era, and even today many historians talk about this impressive and surprisingly controversial naval device, because in one move, it undid the Carthaginians' naval superiority. The Corvus was a bridge attached to a Roman ship with a small parapet on each side. 
The bridge was around 4 feet wide and 36 feet long, but what made it stand out was that it was attached to the boat by a system of pulleys. When the ship was on the move, it would be pulled up and out of the way. When an enemy ship approached, it would be lowered, and a spike at the base of the bridge would puncture the deck of the other ship. With the bridge fixed in place, suddenly dozens of Roman soldiers would board the ship and ambush them, ending the Carthaginian attack without a costly naval battle, and leaving the Roman ship intact and free to pull up the Corvus for their next attack. It was an ingenious invention. Or was it? While this could be challenging in rough seas, it was still easier than trying to place a boarding bridge manually. The only thing remaining of the Corvus are descriptions from Polybius's writings, so not too much is known about its actual construction. This has led to the spirited debates about how much it weighed, whether it was dangerous to use because it could unbalance both ships, and whether it was actually responsible for several major Roman naval disasters during the era. Modern architects have created their own designs for the Corvus, trying to recreate it and see just how Rome pulled off this impressive feat. Other architects, though, still insist the entire thing might have been an elaborate embellishment, might have never existed at all. But it's not out of the realm of possibility, considering they were up against some powerful enemies. Number 3. Hellenistic Warships The Carthaginian naval fleet put the Romans to the test, and they also taught them a thing or two. Once the Romans emerged victorious, they started developing their own powerful naval fleets. By the 4th century, these powerful wooden ships were among the largest ever to set sail, and must have looked more like massive cruise ships rather than standard warships. Without modern engines to power them, these warships used old-fashioned methods, oars, and lots of them. There were five levels, and each level had three very long oars sticking out of the side of the ship, with one oarsman breaking their back for each oar. These ships could carry large numbers of soldiers, but they were often hard to navigate and were subject to going off course easily. They looked impressive, but they weren't the most effective warships of the era. That honor went to the smaller warships that would come later. Often known as the Lembos, they required fewer oars and fewer soldiers to drive them and were more effective for stealth-based activities like espionage and piracy. While the massive earlier ships could be effective for storming a port, these smaller ships could sneak up behind their biggest counterparts, send agents on board, and sabotage the ship from within. And that might be the only way to get through some of those massive warships which were designed for ramming other ships. Backed by rows of rowers pushing themselves to the limit, they could simply crash into an inferior navy, crush the ships beneath their hulls, and train all their fire on the heart of the enemy fleet. But perhaps the most impressive innovations of ancient warfare were on the ground. Number 2. Siege Towers In ancient times, city-states had figured the best way to prevent attacks simply don't let anyone in. It was common for cities to have massive walls around them, and the only way in being through a drawn gate. Sure, the city of Troy tried that and fell the subterfuge, but giant wooden gift horse plans only work once, so usually the only way in was through combat. But the people behind the walled city usually had a major advantage over those out in the open, shooting at them from the outside. The main strategy was usually climbing the walls, but those who tried often got hot oil poured on them. So around the 11th century BCE, the Babylonians and Assyrians came up with a new strategy, build a fortress of your own. Enter the Siege Tower. Sometimes as high as 40 meters, siege towers were massive wooden formations built on site at battles outside walled cities. They would be built as high as the walls of the fortress, with several levels each manned by soldiers. Sometimes the tower would even have catapults or trebuchets built into it, and the concealed nature of the tower made it difficult for the city's defenders to know where to aim to take it down. The only option was overwhelming force, and then it became a one-on-one -on -one battle between the fortress and the tower. If the tower was brought close enough to the wall, moved by hundreds of soldiers, the team on top could then easily leap over the wall into the city and take the fight inside the fortress. But these massive weapons had their drawbacks. For one thing, they were massive. Not only did it take especially designed systems to move them as well as a lot of manpower, but one wrong move on the ground could crush people underneath. Then there was the fact that they were mostly made of wood, and one flaming arrow could undo them in a way that the walled cities weren't vulnerable to. They also took a long time to construct, during which the army might be vulnerable to attack, and building them off-site and then transporting them usually wasn't feasible. Not only were they extremely heavy, but they could easily get stuck in muddy ground. Despite these drawbacks, they were incredibly powerful and kept on being used by attackers well into the Middle Ages. But to find the most insane ancient weapons of all, we have to go back to one of the most iconic ancient empires. Number 1. The Mad Weapons of Archimedes Across ancient Greece, there were few names more renowned than Archimedes. A mathematician, physicist, engineer, and inventor, 
He was the da Vinci of his era, responsible for inventing many of the core concepts of advanced math, much to the dismay of many school children. He came up with countless bold concepts. Some of his inventions, like astronomical instruments, are still used today. Others were just crazy experiments that never really panned out. But amid his many inventions were two of the craziest weapons ever designed. But did they actually work? The first was the Claw of Archimedes. Looks like something out of science fiction. It was designed to defend the city wall of Syracuse against warships. While only descriptions remain, most historians believe it was a crane equipped with a grappling hook that would attach to the front of the ship. It would then be raised, raising the ship with it, and sending the crew and their weapons toppling into the ocean below. The Claw of Archimedes may have been key during the Second Punic War, when Rome sent powerful naval fleets against Syracuse only to be routed, courtesy of the weapon known as the Iron Hand. But was another invention even more deadly? The Mirror of Archimedes was not a vanity device the famous scientist used in his private quarters. Rather, his sketches and notes indicated that it was a massive glass that would be mounted to a ship. By absorbing the sun's rays, it would then focus them and reflect them back in the direction the mirror was pointed, right at the enemy ship. The wooden ship would then catch on fire and sink to the bottom of the sea, in a massive scale version of frying ants with a magnifying glass. But did either of these inventions actually work? With so little evidence of Archimedes' inventions left, it's come down to skeptical scientists and engineers to test them by recreating them to scale. MIT professor David Wallace assembled a team of students to test the mirror of Archimedes. They tried on both cloudy and sunny days, and the mirror was never able to light a model ship on fire, leading most to believe this was a colorful myth. On the other hand, the team behind the series Super Weapons of the Ancient World on the Discovery Channel built a model off of what they knew about the Claw of Archimedes and succeeded in toppling a model of a Roman ship. So at least one of Archimedes' mad inventions might have ruled the seas. Strange weapons didn't stop with ancient times. Check out weirdest World War II weapons you've never heard of to learn more, or watch this video instead.